Preface of the Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Molta. Preface. In preparing this book of short stories concerning the Doctor's daily life, the editor has availed himself of the counsel of his staff of editorial associates, and he trusts that this volume will prove equally acceptable as the other works in the Doctor's Recreation series. The stories themselves are offered without critical comment. Many of them are old favorites. Many of them are by well-known and standard authors. All relate some episode in the Doctor's life in a matter both striking and original. We believe this is the first volume of its kind ever offered to the public. For the courtesy of copyright privileges extended, we return thanks to S.S. McClure Company, The Century Company, Harper and Brothers, J.B. Lippincott Company, Little Brown and Company, Macmillan and Company, John Brisbane Walker, Joseph Kirkland, Dr. Connor Doyle, Lucy S. Furman, Ambrose Beers, Rev. John Watson, Ruth McEnery Stewart, Margaret Sutton Briscoe, Henry Sutton Merriman, and Maud Wilder Goodwin. C.W.M. Buffalo, March 18, 1904. End of preface. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 1 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. The Surgeon's Miracle by Joseph Kirkland. Poor Abe Dodge. That's what they called him, though he wasn't any poorer than any other folks. Not so poor as some. How could he be poor, work as he did and steady as he was? Worth a whole grist of such bait as his brother Effie Dodge, and yet they never called Effie poor, whatever worse names they might call him. When Effie was off at a show in the village, Abe was following the plow, driving a straight furrow, though you wouldn't have thought it to see the way his nose pointed. In winter, when Effie was taking the girls to sing in school, or spell and be, or some other foolishness, out till after nine o'clock at night, like as not, Abe was hanging over the fire, holding the book so the light would shine, first on one page, and then on the other, and he turning his head as he turned the book, and reading first with one eye, and then with the other. There, the murder's out. Abe couldn't read with both eyes at once. If Abe looked straight ahead, he couldn't see the furrow, nor anything else, for that matter. His best friend couldn't say, but what Abe Dodge was, the cross-eyedest cuss that ever was. Why, if you wanted to see Abe, you'd stand in front of him. But if you wanted Abe to see you, you got to stand behind him, or pretty near it. Homely? Well... If you mean downright humbly, that's what he was. When one eye was in use, the other was out of sight, all except the white of it. Humbly ain't no name for it. The girls used to say he had to wake up in the night to rest his face. It was so humbly. In school, you ought to have seen him look down at his copy book. He had to cant his head clear over and cock up his chin till it pointed out the window and down the road. You'd really ought to have seen him. You'd have died. Head of the class, too, right along. Just as near to the head as if he was to the foot. And that's saying a good deal. But to see him at his desk, he looked for all the world like a weak old chicken, peeking at a tumble bug. And him a grown man, too. For he stayed to school winter so long as there was anything more the teacher could teach him. You see, there wasn't anything to draw him away. No girl wouldn't look at him. Lucky, too, seeing the way he looked. Well, one term there was a new teacher come, regular high-up girl down from Chicago. 
as bad luck would have it, Abe wasn't at school the first week, hadn't got through his fall work. So she got to know all the scholars, and they was awful tickled with her. Everybody always was that knowed her. The first day she come in and saw Abe at his desk, she thought he was squinting for fun, and she upped and laughed right out. Some of the scholars laughed too, at first, but most of them, to do em justice, was a little took back, young as they was, and cruel by nature. Young folks is most usually always cruel, don't seem to know no better. Well, right in the middle of the hush, Abe gathered up his books and upped and walked outdoors, looking right ahead of him, and consequently seeing the handsome young teacher unbeknown to her. She was the worst cut up you ever did see, but what could she do or say? Go and tell him she thought he was making up a face for fun? The girls do say that come noon spell, when she found out about it, she cried, just fairly cried. Then she tried to be awful nice to Abe's ornery brother Effie, and Effie, he was tickled most to death, but that didn't do Abe any good. Effie was just ornery enough to take care that Abe shouldn't get any comfort out of it. They do say she sent messages to Abe, and Effie never delivered them, or else twisted them so as to make things worse and worse. Maybe so, maybe not. Effie was ornery enough for it. Of course, the school ma'am, she was boarding round, and pretty soon it come time to go to old man Dodge's, and she went. But no Abe could she ever see. He kept away, and as to meals, he never sat by, but took a bite off by himself when he could get a chance. Of course, his mother favored him, being he was so cussed unlucky. Then when the folks was all to bed, he'd come in and poke up the fire and peek into his book, but first one side, and then the other, same as ever. Now what does school ma'am do but come down one night when she thought he was abed and asleep and catch him unawares? Abe noted it was her, quick as he heard the rustle of her dress, for there wasn't no help for it. So he just turned his head away and covered his cross eyes with his hands, and she pitched in. What she said, I don't know. But Abe, he never said a word, only told her he didn't blame her, not a mite. He knew she couldn't help it no more than he could. Then she asked him to come back to school, and he answered to please excuse him. After a bit, she asked him if he wouldn't come to oblige her, and he said he calculated he was obliging her more by staying away. Well, come to that, she didn't know what to say or do, so, woman-like, she up and cried. And then she said he hurt her feelings, and the upshot of it was he said he'd come, and they shook hands on it. Well, Abe kept his word and took up schooling as if nothing had happened. And such schooling as there was that winter. I don't believe any regular academy had more learning and teaching that winter than what that district school did. Seemed as if all the scholars had turned over a new leaf. Even wild, ornery, no-account Effie Dodge couldn't help but get ahead some. But then he was crazy to get the school ma'am. And she never paid no attention to him. Just went with Abe. Abe was teaching her mathematics, seeing that was the one thing where he'd knowed more than she did outside of farming. Folks used to say that if Effie had Abe's head or Abe had Effie's face, that school ma'am would have half the Dodge farm whenever old man Dodge got through with it. But neither of them did have what the other had, and so there it was, you see. Well, you've heard of Squire Caton, of course. Judge Caton? They call him since he got to be judge of the Supreme Court and chief justice at that. Well, he had a farm down there not far from Fox River, and when he was there, he was just a plain farmer like the rest of us. Though up in Chicago, he was a high-up lawyer, leader of the bar. Now, it so happened that a young doctor named Brainerd, Daniel Brainerd, had just come to Chicago and was starting in, and Squire Caton was helping him, gave him desk room in his office, and made him known to the folks. Kinsey's, and Butterfield's, and Ogden's, and Hamilton's, and Arnold's, and all those folks. Uh, about all there was in Chicago in those days. Brainerd had been to Paris. Paris, France, 
not Paris, Illinois, you understand, and knew all the doctrine there was to know then. Well, come spring, Squire Caton had Doc Brainerd down to visit him, and they shot ducks and geese and prairie chickens and some wild turkeys and deer, too. Game was just swarming at that time. All the while, Caton was doing what law business there was to do, and Brainerd thought he ought to be doing some doctoring to keep his hand in. So he asked Caton if there wasn't any cases he could take up. Surgery cases especially he hankered after, seeing he had more carving tools than you could shake a stick at. He asked him particularly if there wasn't anybody he could treat for strabismus. The squire hadn't heard of anybody dying of that complaint, but when the doctor explained that strabismus was French for cross eyes, he naturally thought of poor Abe Dodge, and the young doctor was right up on his ear. He smelled the battle of far off. And most before you could say Jack Robinson, the squire and the doctor on horseback and down to the Dodge farm, tool chest and all. Well, it so happened that nobody was at home but Abe and Effie, and it didn't take but few words before Abe was ready to set right down then and there and let anybody do anything he was a mind to with his misfortunate eyes. No, he wouldn't wait till the old folks come home. He didn't want to ask no advice. He wasn't afraid of pain, nor of what anybody could do to his eyes. Couldn't be made any worse than they were, whatever you did to them. Take them out and boil them and put them back if you had a mind to, only go to work. He knew he was of age, and he guessed he was master of his own eyes, such as they were. Well, there wasn't nothing else to do but go ahead. The doctor opened up his killing tools and tried to keep Abe from seeing them, but Abe he just come right over and peeked at him, handled him, and called him splendid. And so they were, barn having them used on your own flesh and blood and bones. Then they got some cloths and a basin and one thing and another and set Abe right down in a chair. No such thing as chloroform in those days, you'll remember. And Squire Caton was to hold an instrument that spread the eyelid wide open, while Effie was to hold Abe's head steady. First touch of the lancet and first spurt of blood, and what do you think? That ornery Effie wilted and fell flat on the floor behind the chair. Squire, said Brainerd, step around and hold his head. I can hold my own head, says Abe, as steady as you please. But Squire Caton, he straddled over Effie and held his head between his arms and the two handles of the eye spreader with his hands. It was all over in half a minute. And then Abe, he leaned forward and shook the blood off his eyelashes and looked straight out of that eye for the first time since he was born. And the first words he said were, Thank the Lord, she's mine. About that time, Effie, he crawled outdoors sick as a dog, and Abe spoke up, says he, Now for the other eye, doctor. Oh, said the doctor, we'd better take another day for that. All right, says Abe. If your hands are tired of cutting, you can make another job of it. My face ain't tired of being cut, I can tell you. Well, if you're game, I am. So... If you believe me, they just set to work and operated on the other eye, Abe holding his own head, as he said he would, and the squire holding the spreader. And when it was all done, the doctor was for putting a bandage on to keep things quiet till the wounds all healed up. But Abe just begged for one side of himself, and he stood up and walked over to the clock and looked in the glass and says he, So that's the way I look, is it? Shouldn't have known my own face, never saw it before. How long must I keep the bandage on, doctor? Oh, if the eyes aren't very sore when you wake up in the morning, you can take it off, if you'll be careful. Wake up? Do you suppose I can sleep when such a blessing has fallen on me? I'll lay still, but if I forget it, or you, for one minute this night, I'll be so ashamed of myself that it'll wake me right up. Then the doctor bound up his eyes, and the poor boy said, Thank God, two or three times. 
and they could see the tears running down his cheeks from under the cloth. Lord, it was just as pitiful as a broken-winged bird. How about the girl? Well, it was all right for Abe and all wrong for Effie. All wrong for Effie. But that's all past and gone. Past and gone. Folks come for miles and miles to see cross-eyed Abe with his eyes as straight as a loon's leg. Dr. Brainerd was a great man forever after in those parts. Everywhere else, too, by what I heard. When the doctor and the squire come to go, Abe spoke up, blindfolded as he was, and says he, Doc, how much do you charge a fella for saving his life? Make it a man out of a poor wreck doing what he never thought could be done but by dying and going to kingdom come. Oh, says Doc Brainerd, says he, that ain't what we look at as pay practice. You didn't call me in, I come of myself, as though it was what we call a clinic. If all goes well, and if you happen to have a barrel of apples to spare, you just send them up to Squire Caton's house in Chicago, and I'll come over and help eat them. What did Abe say to that? Why, sir, he never said a word. But they do say the tears started out again, out from under the bandage and down his cheeks. But then Abe, he had a five-year-old pet mare he'd raised from a colt, pretty as a picture, kind as a kitten and fast as split lightning. And next time Doc come down, Abe, he just slipped out to the barn and brought the mare round and hitched her to the gate post. And when Doc come to be going, says Abe, Don't forget your nag, doctor. She's hitched at the gate. Well, sir, even then Abe had the hardest kind of a time to get Doc Brainer to take that mare. And when he did ride off leading her, it wasn't half an hour before back she came lickety-split. Doc said she broke away from him and put for home. But I always suspected he didn't have no use for a hoss he couldn't sell or hire out and couldn't afford to keep in the village. That was what Chicago was then. But come along towards fall, Abe, he took her right up to town. And then the doctor's practice had grown so much that he was pretty glad to have her. And Abe was glad to have him have her, seeing all that had come to him through having eyes like other folks. That's the school ma'am, I mean. How did the school ma'am take it? Well... It was this way. After the cutting, Abe didn't show up for a few days till the inflammation got down and he'd had some practice handling his eyes, so to speak. He just kept himself to himself, enjoying himself. He'd go round doing the chores, singing so you could hear him a mile. He was always great at singing, Abe was, though ashamed to go to singing school with the rest. Then, when the poor boy began to feel like other folks... He went right over to where school ma'am happened to be boarding round and walked right up to her and took her by both hands and looked her straight in the face and said, Do you know me? Well, she kind of smiled and blushed and then the corners of her mouth pulled down and she pulled one hand away and if you believe me, that was the third time that girl cried that season to my certain knowledge and all for nothing either time. What did she say? Why, she just said she'd have to begin all over again to get acquainted with Abe. But Effie's nose was out of joint, and Effie noted as well as anybody Effie did. It was Abe's eyes to Effie's nose. Married? Oh, yes, of course. And lived on the farm as long as the old folks lived, and afterwards, too. Effie stayed right along like the fool he had always been. That feller never did have as much sense as last year's bird's nest. Alive yet? Abe? Well, no. Might have been, if it hadn't been for Shiloh. When the war broke out, Abe thought he ought to go, old as he was. So he went into the sixth. Maybe you've seen a book written about the captain of Company K of the sixth. It was Company K he went into, him and Effie and he was killed at Shiloh, just as it always seems to happen. He got killed, and his worthless brother come home. Folks thought Effie 
would have liked to marry the widow, but, Lord, she never had no such an idea. Such bait as he was compared to his brother. She never chirped up to speak of, and now she's dead, too. And Effie, he just toddles around, taking care of the children. Kind of a he-dry nurse. That's about all he was ever good for, anyhow. My name? Oh, my name's Ephraim. Effie, they call me for short. Effie Dodge. Abe was my brother. End of section one. Read by Alexis Wilson, Atlanta, Georgia, March 2023. Section 2 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bruce Powell. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. The Doctors of Hoyland, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dr. James Ripley was always looked upon as an exceedingly lucky dog by all of the profession who knew him. His father had preceded him in a practice in the village of Hoyland, in the north of Hampshire, and all was ready for him on the very first day that the law allowed him to put his name at the foot of a prescription. In a few years the old gentleman retired and settled on the south coast, leaving his son in undisputed possession of the whole countryside. Save for Dr. Horton near Basingstoke, the young surgeon had a clear run of six miles in every direction, and took his fifteen hundred pounds a year, though, as is usual in country practices, the stable swallowed up most of what the consulting room earned. Dr. James Ripley was two and thirty years of age, reserved, learned, unmarried, with set, rather stern features, and a thinning of the dark hair upon the top of his head which was worth quite a hundred a year to him. He was particularly happy in his management of ladies. He had caught the tone of bland sternness and decisive suavity which dominates without offending. Ladies, however, were not equally happy in their management of him. Professionally, he was always at their service. Socially, he was a drop of quicksilver. In vain, the country mamas spread out their simple lures in front of him. Dances and picnics were not to his taste, and he preferred during his scanty leisure to shut himself up in his study, and to bury himself in Verkoff's archives and the professional journals. Study was a passion with him, and he would have none of the rust which often gathers round a country practitioner. It was his ambition to keep his knowledge as fresh and bright as at the moment when he had stepped out of the examination hall. He prided himself on being able, at a moment's notice, to rattle off the seven ramifications of some obscure artery, or to give the exact percentage of any physiological compound. After a long day's work, he would sit up half the night performing iridectomies and extractions upon the sheep size sent in by the village butcher, to the horror of his housekeeper, who had to remove the debris next morning. His love for his work was the one fanaticism which found a place in his dry, precise nature. It was the more to his credit that he should keep up to date in his knowledge, since he had no competition to force him to exertion. In the seven years during which he had practiced in Hoyland, three rivals had pitted themselves against him, two in the village itself and one in the neighboring hamlet of Lower Hoyland. Of these, one had sickened and wasted, being, as it was said, himself the only patient whom he had treated during his eighteen months of ruralizing. A second had bought a fourth share of a Basingstoke practice and had departed honorably, while a third had vanished one September night, leaving a gutted house and an unpaid drug bill behind him. Since then, the district had become a monopoly, and no one had dared to measure himself against the established fame of the Hoyland doctor. It was, then, with a feeling of some surprise and considerable curiosity that on driving through Lower Hoyland one morning he perceived that a new house at the end of the village was occupied, and that a virgin brass plate glistened upon the swinging gate which faced the high road. He pulled up his fifty-guinea chestnut mare and took a good look at it. Verinder Smith, M.D., was printed across it in very neat small lettering. 
The last man had had letters half a foot long, with a lamp like a fire station. Dr. James Ripley noted the difference, and deduced from it that the newcomer might possibly prove a more formidable opponent. He was convinced of it that evening when he came to consult the current medical directory. By it, he learned that Dr. Verinder Smith was the holder of superb degrees, that he had studied with distinction in Edinburgh, Paris, Berlin, and Vienna, and finally that he had been awarded a gold medal and the Lee Hopkins Scholarship for Original Research in recognition of an exhaustive inquiry into the functions of the anterior spinal nerve roots. Dr. Ripley passed his fingers through his thin hair in bewilderment as he read his rival's record. What on earth could so brilliant a man mean by putting up his plate in a little Hampshire hamlet? But Dr. Ripley furnished himself with an explanation to the riddle. No doubt Dr. Verinder Smith had simply come down there in order to pursue some scientific research in peace and quiet. The plate was up as an address rather than as an invitation to patients. Of course, that must be the true explanation. In that case, the present of this brilliant neighbor would be a splendid thing for his own studies. He had often longed for some kindred mind, some steel on which he might strike his flint. Chance had brought it to him, and he rejoiced exceedingly. And this joy it was which led him to take a step which was quite at variance with his usual habits. It is the custom for a newcomer among medical men to call first upon the older, and the etiquette upon the subject is strict. Dr. Ripley was pedantically exact on such points, and yet he deliberately drove over next day and called upon Dr. Verinder Smith. Such a waving of ceremony was, he felt, a gracious act upon his part and a fit prelude to the intimate relations which he hoped to establish with his neighbor. The house was neat and well-appointed, and Dr. Ripley was shown by a smart maid into a dapper little consulting room. As he passed in, he noticed two or three parasols and a lady's sunbonnet hanging in the hall. It was a pity that his colleague should be a married man. It would put them upon a different footing and interfere with those long evenings of high scientific talk which he had pictured to himself. On the other hand, there was much in the consulting room to please him. Elaborate instruments, seen more often in hospitals than in the houses of private practitioners, were scattered about. A sphygmograph stood upon the table and a gasometer-like engine, which was new to Dr. Ripley, in the corner. A bookcase full of ponderous volumes in French and German, paper covered for the most part and varying in tint from the shell to the yolk of a duck's egg, caught his wandering eyes, and he was deeply absorbed in their titles when the door opened suddenly behind him. Turning round, he found himself facing a little woman, whose plain, palish face was remarkable only for a pair of shrewd, humorous eyes of a blue which had two shades too much green in it. She held a pince-nez in her left hand and the doctor's card in her right. How do you do, Dr. Ripley? said she. How do you do, madam? returned the visitor. Your husband is perhaps out? I am not married, said she simply. Oh, I beg your pardon. I meant the doctor, Dr. Verinder Smith. I am Dr. Verinder Smith. Dr. Ripley was so surprised that he dropped his hat and forgot to pick it up again. What? he grasped. The Lee Hopkins Prizeman? You? He had never seen a woman doctor before, and his whole conservative soul rose up in revolt at the idea. He could not recall any biblical injunction that the man should remain ever the doctor and the woman the nurse, and yet he felt as if a blasphemy had been committed. His face betrayed his feelings only too clearly. I am sorry to disappoint you, said the lady dryly. You certainly have surprised me, he answered, picking up his hat. You are not among our champions, then. I cannot say that the movement has my approval. And why? I should much prefer not to discuss it. But I am sure you will answer a lady's question. Ladies are in danger of losing their privileges when they usurp the place of the other sex. They cannot claim both. Why should a woman not earn her bread by her brains? Dr. Ripley felt irritated by the quiet manner in which the lady cross-questioned him. I should much prefer not to be led into a discussion, Miss Smith. Dr. Smith? she interrupted. Well, Dr. Smith, but if you insist upon an answer, I must say that I do not think medicine an imitable profession for women, 
and that I have a personal objection to masculine ladies. It was an exceedingly rude speech, and he was ashamed of it the instant after he had made it. The lady, however, simply raised her eyebrows and smiled. It seems to me that you are begging the question, said she. Of course, if it makes women masculine, that would be a considerable deterioration. It was a neat little counter, and Dr. Ripley, like a picked fencer, bowed his acknowledgment. I must go, said he. I am sorry that we cannot come to some more friendly conclusion since we are to be neighbors, she remarked. He bowed again and took a step towards the door. It was a singular coincidence, she continued, that at the instant you called I was reading your paper on locomotor ataxia in the Lancet. Indeed, he said dryly. I thought it was a very able monograph. You are very good. But the views which you attribute to Professor Peters of Bordeaux have been repudiated by him. I have his pamphlet of 1890, said Dr. Ripley angrily. Here is his pamphlet of 1891. She picked it up from among a litter of periodicals. If you have time to glance your eye down this passage... Dr. Ripley took it from her and shot rapidly through the paragraph which she indicated. There was no denying that it completely knocked the bottom out of his own article. He threw it down, and with another frigid bow he made for the door. As he took the reins from the groom, he glanced round and saw that the lady was standing at her window, and it seemed to him that she was laughing heartily. All day the memory of this interview haunted him. He felt that he had come very badly out of it, she had showed herself to be his superior on his own pet subject. She had been courteous while he had been rude, self-possessed when he had been angry. And then, above all, there was her presence, her monstrous intrusion to rankle in his mind. A woman doctor had been an abstract thing before, repugnant but distant. Now she was there in actual practice, with a brass plate up just like his own, competing for the same patients. Not that he feared the competition, but he objected to this lowering of his ideal of womanhood. She could not be more than thirty, and had a bright, mobile face, too. He thought of her humorous eyes, and of her strong, well-turned chin. It revolted him the more to recall the details of her education. A man, of course, could come through such an ordeal with all his purity, but it was nothing short of shameless in a woman. But it was not long before he learned that even her competition was a thing to be feared. The novelty of her presence had brought a few curious invalids into her consulting rooms, and, once there, they had been so impressed by the firmness of her manner and by her singular new-fashioned instruments with which she tapped and peered and sounded that it formed the core of their conversation for weeks afterwards, and soon there were tangible proofs of her powers upon the countryside. Farmer Eaton, whose callous ulcer had been quietly spreading over his shin for years back under a gentle regime of zinc ointment, was painted round with blistering fluid, and found, after three blasphemous nights, that his sore was stimulated into healing. Mrs. Crowder, who had always regarded the birthmark upon her second daughter Eliza as a sign of the indignation of the Creator at a third helping of raspberry tart, which she had partaken of during a critical period, learned that, with the help of two galvanic needles, the mischief was not irreparable. In a month, Dr. Verinder Smith was known, and in two she was famous. Occasionally, Dr. Ripley met her as he drove upon his rounds. She had started a high dog cart, taking the reins herself, with a little tiger behind. When they met, he invariably raised his hat with punctilious politeness, but the grim severity of his face showed how formal was the courtesy. In fact, his dislike was rapidly deepening into absolute detestation. The unsexed woman was the description of her which he permitted himself to give to those of his patients who still remained staunch. But indeed, they were a rapidly decreasing body, and every day his pride was galled by the news of some fresh defection. The lady had somehow impressed the country folk with an almost superstitious belief in her power, and from far and near they flocked to her consulting room. But what galled him most of all was, when she did something which he had pronounced to be impracticable, 
For all his knowledge, he lacked nerve as an operator, and usually sent his worst cases up to London. The lady, however, had no weakness of the sort, and took everything that came in her way. It was agony to him to hear that she was about to straighten little Alec Turner's club foot, and right at the fringe of the rumour came a note from his mother, the rector's wife, asking him if he would be so good as to act as chloroformist. It would be inhumanity to refuse, as there was no other who could take the place, but it was gall and wormwood to his sensitive nature. Yet in spite of his vexation, he could not but admire the dexterity with which the thing was done. She handled the little wax-like foot so gently, and held the tiny tenotomy knife as an artist holds his pencil. One straight insertion, one snick of a tendon, and it was all over without a stain upon the white towel which lay beneath. He had never seen anything more masterly, and he had the honesty to say so, though her skill increased his dislike of her. The operation spread her fame still farther at his expense, and self-preservation was added to his other grounds for detesting her. And this very detestation it was which brought matters to a curious climax. One winter's night, just as he was rising from his lonely dinner, a groom came riding down from Squire Faircastle's, the richest man in the district, to say that his daughter had scalded her hand and that medical help was needed on the instant. The coachman had ridden for the lady doctor, for it mattered nothing to the squire who came as long as it were speedily. Dr. Ripley rushed from his surgery with the determination that she should not effect an entrance into this stronghold of his if hard driving on his part could prevent it. He did not even wait to light his lamps, but sprang into his gig and flew off as fast as hoof could rattle. He lived rather nearer to the squire's than she did, and was convinced that he could get there well before her. And so he would, but for that whimsical element of chance, which will forever muddle up the affairs of this world and dumbfound the prophets. Whether it came from the want of his lights or from his mind being full of the thoughts of his rival, he allowed too little by half a foot in taking the sharp turn upon the Basingstoke Road. The empty trap and the frightened horse clattered away into the darkness while the squire's groom crawled out of the ditch into which he had been shot. He struck a match, looked down at his groaning companion, and then, after the fashion of rough, strong men, when they see what they have not seen before, he was very sick. The doctor raised himself a little on his elbow in the glint of the match. He caught a glimpse of something white and sharp bristling through his trouser leg, halfway down the chin. Compound, he groaned, a three months job, and fainted. When he came to himself, the groom was gone, for he had scudded off to the squire's house for help. But a small page was holding a gig lamp in front of his injured leg, and a woman, with an open case of polished instruments gleaming in the yellow light, was deftly slitting up his trouser with a crooked pair of scissors. It's all right, doctor, she said soothingly. I am so sorry about it. You can have Dr. Horton tomorrow, but I am sure you will allow me to help you tonight. I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw you by the roadside. The groom has gone for help, groaned the sufferer. When it comes, we can move you into the gig. A little more light, John. So. Ah, oh, dear, dear, we shall have laceration unless we reduce this before we move you. Allow me to give you a whiff of chloroform, and I have no doubt that I can secure it sufficiently to... Dr. Ripley never heard the end of that sentence. He tried to raise a hand and to murmur something in protest. But a sweet smell was in his nostrils and a sense of rich peace and lethargy stole over his jangled nerves. Down he sank, through clear, cool water, ever down and down, into the green shadows beneath, gently, without effort, while the pleasant chiming of the great belfry rose and fell in his ears. Then he rose again, up and up and ever up, with a terrible tightness about his temples, until at last he shot out of those green shadows and was in the light once more. Two bright, shining, golden spots gleamed before his dazed eyes. He blinked and blinked before he could give a name to them. They were only the two brass balls at the end post of his bed, and he was lying in his own little room with a head like a cannonball and a leg like an iron bar. Turning his eyes, he saw the calm face of Dr. Verinder Smith looking down at him. Ah, at last, said she. 
I kept you under all the way home, for I knew how painful the jolting would be. It is in good position now with a strong side splint. I have ordered a morphia draft for you. Shall I tell your groom to ride for Dr. Horton in the morning? I should prefer that you should continue the case, said Dr. Ripley feebly, and then, with a half-hysterical laugh, you have all the rest of the parish as patients, you know, so you may as well make the thing complete by having me also. It was not a very gracious speech, but it was a look of pity and not of anger which shone in her eyes as she turned away from his bedside. Dr. Ripley had a brother, William, who was assistant surgeon at a London hospital, and who was down in Hampshire within a few hours of his hearing of the accident. He raised his brows when he heard the details. What? You are pestered with one of those? he cried. I don't know what I should have done without her. I've no doubt she's an excellent nurse. She knows her work as well as you or I. Speak for yourself, James, said the London man with a sniff. But apart from that, you know that the principle of the thing is all wrong. You think there is nothing to be said on the other side? Good heavens, do you? Well, I don't know. It struck me during the night that we may have been a little narrow in our views. Nonsense, James. It's all very fine for women to win prizes in the lecture room. But you know as well as I do that they are no use in an emergency. Now I warrant that this woman was all nerves when she was setting your leg. That reminds me that I had better just take a look at it and see that it is all right. I would rather that you did not undo it, said the patient. I have her assurance that it is all right. Brother William was deeply shocked. Of course, if a woman's assurance is of more value than the opinion of the assistant surgeon of a London hospital, there is nothing more to be said, he remarked. I should prefer that you did not touch it, said the patient firmly, and Dr. William went back to London that evening in a huff. The lady who had heard of his coming was much surprised on learning of his departure. We had a difference upon a point of professional etiquette, said Dr. James, and it was all the explanation he would vouchsafe. For two long months Dr. Ripley was brought in contact with his rival every day, and he learned many things which he had not known before. She was a charming companion, as well as a most assiduous doctor. Her short presence during the long, weary day was like a flower in a sand waste. What interested him was precisely what interested her, and she could meet him at every point upon equal terms. And yet, under all her learning and her firmness, ran a sweet, womanly nature, peeping out in her talk, shining in her greenish eyes, showing itself in a thousand subtle ways which the dullest of men could read. And he, though a bit of a prig and a pedant, was by no means dull, and had honesty enough to confess when he was in the wrong. I don't know how to apologize to you, he said in his shame-faced fashion one day, when he had progressed so far as to be able to sit in an armchair with his leg upon another one. I feel that I have been quite in the wrong. Why, then? Over this woman question, I used to think that a woman must inevitably lose something of her charm if she took up such studies. Oh, you don't think they are necessarily unsexed, then? She cried, with a mischievous smile. Please don't recall my idiotic expression. I feel so pleased that I should have helped in changing your views. I think that it is the most sincere compliment that I have ever had paid me. At any rate, it is the truth, said he, and was happy all night at the remembrance of the flush of pleasure which made her pale face look quite comely for an instant. For, indeed, he was already far past the stage when he would acknowledge her as an equal of any other woman. Already he could not disguise from himself that she had become the one woman. Her dainty skill, her gentle touch, her sweet presence, the community of their tastes, had all united to hopelessly upset his previous opinions. It was a dark day for him now when his convalescence allowed her to miss a visit, and darker still that other one which he saw approaching when all occasion for her visits would be at an end. It came round at last, however, and he felt that his whole life's fortune would hang upon the issue of that final interview. He was a direct man by nature, so he laid his hand upon hers as it felt for the pulse, and he asked her if she would be his wife. 
What, and unite the practices? said she. He started in pain and anger. Surely you do not attribute any such base motive to me, he cried. I love you as unselfishly as ever a woman was loved. No, I, I was wrong. It was a foolish speech, said she, moving her chair a little back and tapping her stethoscope upon her knee. Forget that I ever said it. I am so sorry to cause you any disappointment, and I appreciate most highly the honor which you do me. But what you ask is quite impossible. With another woman he might have urged the point, but his instincts told him that it was quite useless with this one. Her tone of voice was conclusive. He said nothing, but leaned back in his chair a stricken man. I am so sorry, she said again. If I had known what was passing in your mind, I should have told you earlier that I intended to devote my life entirely to science. There are many women with a capacity for marriage, but few with a taste for biology. I will remain true to my own line, then. I came down here while waiting for an opening in the Paris Physiological Laboratory. I have just heard that there is a vacancy for me there, and so you will be troubled no more by my intrusion upon your practice. I have done you an injustice, as you did me one. I thought you narrow and pedantic, with no good quality. I have learned during your illness to appreciate you better, and the recollection of our friendship will always be a very pleasant one to me. And so it came about that in a very few weeks there was only one doctor in Hoyland. But folks noticed that the one had aged many years in a few months, that a weary sadness lurked always in the depths of his blue eyes, and that he was less concerned than ever with the eligible young ladies whom chance or their careful country mamas placed in his way. End of section 2 Read by Bruce Powell Victoria, British Columbia, Canada Section 3 of The Doctor's Red Lamp This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton Dr. Santos, a character sketch from the Spanish of Gustavo Morales by Jean Raymond Bidwell. Everyone in Madrid knew Dr. Santos. He was a little bit of a man, with his beard and hair clamoring for the use of the scissors, and his clothes for benzene and a more fashionable cut. Nevertheless, he had a universal reputation for great wisdom, and his popularity in the district of Chambari, the principal scene of his work, was beyond everything. Possibly the peculiarities of the doctor did more than his true merit to attract the attention of the people. Perhaps some presentiment made everyone consider him physically of not much account, but mentally a diamond of the purest water. It was well known that in the exercise of his profession he was a true ministering angel, and without any pretense of being a specialist or a philanthropist. People said that he was half crazy over the subject of disease and followed the development of a fever with the same interest that others listened to or read a dramatic work, but with this exception, that it was not always necessary to be a mere spectator, that by discreetly intervening sometimes, he prepared cheerful and unexpected comedy, where otherwise there would have been the deepest tragedy. This might have been merely scientific curiosity, we will not discuss that point, but thanks to this keen interest, if a patient were very ill, and that happened frequently, he would remain to watch by the bedside, and again, and this happened yet more frequently, for Dr. Santos devoted himself almost exclusively to poor people, there would not be money enough to buy supper for the family, or broth or medicine for the sick one, then our doctor would pull out his purse and send for whatever was necessary. His patients never lacked for what was needed to restore them to health. The doctor's greatest pleasure, as he always declared, was to cure sick children. It seemed impossible that a man who had no family and who, according to all accounts, had never married, and who had been adopted himself by a barber who took him from an orphan asylum, should be able to feel such absolute tenderness of heart towards little ones. A woman, whose son the doctor had restored to health, 
aptly expressed the sentiments of every one. It seems as if Dr. Santos had been a mother himself. We will take it for granted that his life and good deeds are well known, for many a scientific work can testify to the merits of Dr. Santos, so we will not stop to give a detailed resume or minute account of the arduous labor of many years spent in true performance of his profession. I am now going to speak of an event in his life which, if it were not absolutely true, would seem to many people to be altogether improbable. Dr. Santos always said that the elixir of long life was a very easy and simple thing to obtain, that it was not necessary to knock one's head against the wall in order that the electric spark of an idea should spring out of the brain, and that even the most stupid could give a solution of the problem to those who discussed it learnedly, but that not even this elixir nor any other could be applied in every case, that it was just as difficult to unite a head to the body from which it had been severed as to repair the ravages of some illnesses. In eighty cases out of a hundred, however, he was sure that the elixir would give good results. The strangest thing was that these were not merely affirmations, but positive proofs, for in his practice he had tried the remedy, and not only eighty to a hundred, but an even greater proportion, had produced good results. He never could be made to specify the remedy, and he put an end to all questions on the subject by saying, Nothing, nothing. It is like, it is like Columbus's egg. Why prove it? It was long after twelve o'clock one night when Dr. Santos entered a miserable garret in the Salle de Fuencoral. The door was partly open. A middle-aged man was stretched out on a rude cot. The rest of the furniture consisted of some broken, rush-bottomed chairs and a pine table by the bedside. The sick man had no relatives in Madrid. He had arrived from Catalonia a little more than a month before and had fallen ill with pneumonia. He refused absolutely to go to the hospital, so a charitable neighbor, who had attended to his simple wants for some time, called in Dr. Santos. The disease had already made inroads upon the man's constitution. Although the pneumonia was helped, the doctor could not cure the quick consumption which followed, and which would soon end the man's life. When the sick man saw the doctor enter, an expression of joy passed over his features, as if now black death had no terror for him, for, in the last sad moments, a warm hand would clasp his, and a loving heart would be moved to sympathy. The doctor took the sick man's hand. "'How are you, Jaime?' he asked. "'I am dying, I feel sure of it, but I wish to ask one more favor of you who have already done so many for me. Tell me how much longer I have to live. I know there is nothing that will help me, and I am almost glad that it is so, for I have suffered so much in my life. At least I shall cease to suffer. It is true, is it not, that over there there is no more pain?' All is quiet, dark, cold. Accustomed as Dr. Santos was to such scenes, he could scarcely keep back the tears, much to his own disgust, when he looked at the poor fellow, and he growled to himself, A weeping doctor is a fool. But he answered the dying man very gently, What can I do for you, Jaime? To whom shall I write? Let me know just what you wish to be done and I promise you to do it as far as I am able, and before it slips my memory. I don't want to frighten you, but everyone takes things differently. Judging from the state you are in, I am not the one just now to do you the most good, and we must soon send for one who can give you the only true consolation. After all, although this life means a great deal to us, we ought to be glad rather than sorry at the thought of leaving it, because we are all sure that God is good and will pardon us, and that he loves us. For this reason we call him Father, for if he is not better than the best on earth, what other conception can we have of him? Now I will go myself to call a priest whom I know, and in the meantime 
I will see if a neighbor will stay with you. Oh, don't go, I beg of you. I must talk to you. The doctor dared not say no, but he knew that the hour of death was swiftly approaching. A moment later, he left the room, saying, I'll return directly. He sent a neighbor for the priest, then returned as he had promised and sat down by the head of the bed. Jaime asked the doctor to do him the favor to put his hand under the mattress and take out a packet which he would find there. After the doctor had pulled out the packet, Jaime began to speak. Doctor, I ask you not to open this packet until after I am dead, and after that, with the help of your own conscience, you will decide what you think had best be done. I want you, if any personal advantage can come to you from it, to use it all for yourself. I have no affection for anyone else, nor am I in debt to anyone. If this were not my last hour on earth, I should say that my soul held nothing but hatred for the evil received from those I most cherished. The sick man seemed fatigued, and the doctor told him to rest a few moments, but now the man began to make those motions of the hands so characteristic of those about to die, and to plate and unplate the bed clothing. He did not seem to know exactly what he was saying, and his eyes wandered restlessly about the room. She deceived me. How much I loved her, her beautiful black eyes, how pretty she was. And he, my best friend, it was infamous, shameful, I saw them. The truth is proof enough. Ah, how much blood flowed from the wound. He did not mind dying, because he knew she loved him. And I envied him after he was dead. Ah, how hard the punishment, how dark the cell, how heavy the shackles. It is shameful. I am an assassin, everyone has left me. How blue the sky is, how fresh and green the fields. I can't get out with these horrible irons on my wrists. The priest came in time to administer the extreme unction. Jaime died shortly after, and the doctor returned home with the packet under his arm. Once in his study, before going to bed, he decided to open the bundle which Jaime had given him with so much mystery. It was an easy task. He untied the paper, and out fell what seemed to be a magazine. There were hundreds of leaves, but each leaf was a banknote of four thousand reales. Daylight glimmered through the curtains. Dr. Santos had not closed his eyes. He was the owner, the rightful owner, of more than four thousand pesetas, one hundred thousand dollars, and the donation was absolutely legitimate. Jaime's mind, as no one knew better than he, was perfectly clear at the time he made the gift. What should he do with all that money? He would be happy. All his friends would be happy, in fact. Everyone would be happy. What a library. What a laboratory he would have. Hours passed, but the doctor tossed and turned restlessly on his bed, unable to sleep for a moment. The clock struck seven. He could not stay in bed any longer. He arose, made his accustomed tasty toilette, drank his coffee, and started off on his usual round of visits. He began with the very sick patients, but at ten o'clock he said to himself he would get a friend to accompany him to the bank that he might deposit the money. He had never kept any money in a bank. A little box in his office had always held all he could spare, and he did not know exactly what legal forms were necessary in order to have it placed so that he could draw out certain sums when he wished. His first patient lived several miles away, so he carried the precious package with him in order not to lose time in going and coming. He stopped at the patient's house. The sick man was a cabinet maker who had been trying to work with an injured hand, consequently, Blood poisoning had set in, and the symptoms were such that amputation seemed necessary. The poor man, strong as an oak, cried like a child. The maintenance of my wife and family lies in the skill of my five fingers, he said, and now you're going to cut them off. But Dr. Santos, more of an optimist than ever that day, brought the bright light of hope into the sad hearts of the afflicted family. 
they might rely upon him for support and help as long as they needed it. He then went to see a talented journalist who had not prospered since he began to have ideas and tastes of his own instead of praising those of other people. The journalist had lost his place because he had published, without first consulting the director, an article in which he said that what Morocco most needed was some powerful nation to civilize it, that our position in the matter was like that of a gardener's dog, keeping others from doing what we could not do ourselves, that it would be better to be annexed to a rich country than a poor one, to have a cultivated country instead of a semi-savage one, and a hundred other barbarities besides. As one might well imagine, the journalist had trouble with his head, he was worn out by fatigue, and had the beginning of softening of the brain. Dr. Santos had ordered rest, a quiet, regular life, early hours, and horseback riding. The journalist sent out to a store for a pasteboard horse, and when the doctor called to see him, the sick man said, This is the only horse I can afford. Of course, he plainly showed his insanity by this act, but Dr. Santos did not look upon it in that light. He begged the man's pardon for having advised him to buy what he could not afford. A little later, he visited a widow with three children. She was young and pretty. Her husband had been a sculptor of some talent. He was not rich, but he had earned enough to support his family decently. He died, and for the first year the wife managed to live fairly well by dint of great economy. The second year, the widow sold her husband's art treasures. The third year, she lived on the gifts of relatives and friends, which gave out before the fourth year, and the family went from the second floor to the garret, from wholesome food to scanty scraps, from warm clothing to rags. Last of all came sickness. Dr. Santos felt inspired. If this little woman goes to the bad, whose fault will it be? Her sewing brings in so little. Pulling out a banknote, he handed it to the widow, telling her to live where she could have fresh air and sunlight, to buy nourishing food and look after the little ones. The doctor left that poverty-stricken place, his plain face so radiant with happiness that it seemed almost beautiful. He thought to himself as he went along that if Jaime had used some of this money for himself and had lived properly, he would not have died of consumption. That devilish avarice, he muttered. A millionaire living and dying like a beggar in order not to spend his money. What is the good of money if it is not to spend? Suddenly, two ideas flashed into his head. Suppose this is stolen money. What if the bills are false? He stopped. The package fell from his hand. Sir, you have dropped something, said a poor woman who was passing. The doctor picked up the bundle and, turning around, went home. Stolen or false, he muttered grimly. There is no other solution. The words and the ideas sounded in his ears. They heard him, as if someone had struck him on the head with a hammer. He reached his home, told his old servant that he would see no one, then changed his mind, sent the woman off on an errand, and shut himself up in his office. The doctor had in his house two banknotes of a thousand pesetas, $250 each. We will begin with the hypothesis that I can prove them false, he said. He took out his own banknotes and laid them on the table, took another out of the package and placed it between the first two. They must have been stolen, he said, for all three are alike, the same block, the same print. He turned them over. They were exactly alike. Well, there was nothing to be done but to advertise and await the rightful owner, and he would have to word the advertisement so that every Spaniard in the country should not appear to claim the money. He took a magnifying glass and began to make methodical observations. First, the paper, its quality, its transparency, then the engravings, the letters, letter by letter, the signatures. But even with the help of the glass, 
which magnified the size six or eight times, he could detect no difference between the bills. From whom could Jaime have stolen them? Had blood been shed on account of those bits of paper? Had Jaime robbed the government or a bank? The doctor thought and thought. He studied with the aid of a glass every detail, even the smallest. Is it possible, he exclaimed, that each one can be so perfect? They have been stolen, undoubtedly stolen, he said, at the end of a quarter of an hour of close observation. Ten times already he had compared the numeration, but he turned again to look at it. They all look alike, he said again, but when he took away the crystal he doubted the certainty of his own vision. He brought out a delicate compass and measured the numbers of his old bills. He placed the compass on the new. There was absolutely no difference. He was not satisfied with the length alone, but he even measured the width of the lines. They have been stolen, he repeated mechanically. Then, as if answering himself, he spoke slowly. Where could he have stolen them? No, they are counterfeit. False, false. Ah, thou Catalone rogue, who art in the infernal regions. I hope that thou art making false notes with thy skin of Barabbas. I have learned the secret, thought the doctor. There is no doubt of it. He still looked exclusively at the numbers. The false ones looked larger. They really were not. But as the lines were more delicate, it made the ciphers look larger. Those poor people are now in prison, said Dr. Santos sorrowfully. They have denounced me and the police will shortly come to arrest me and no one will believe they were ever given to me. He raised the stove cover. No, that won't do. The embers and ashes will remain. They can smell the smoke and burnt paper. The doctor had a dove caught. A dove just then lighted on the window sill. A bright idea came to him. He took two tin boxes, such as are used for cut tobacco, and stuffed them both full with banknotes, climbed up to the dovecot, and looked through the garret window. No one could see him. He raised some tiles and hid the boxes, then covered them up, leaving all as it was before. Breathing heavily, his heart thumping furiously, he descended the staircase which led to the second floor, and dropping into a chair, opened a huge volume which he held before his face while he tried to recover his usual composure. If he had been surprised and arrested, the inspector would have noticed that the book was upside down. The two old bills with the magnifying glass and compass were still on the table, and that the lapels and sleeves of his coat were covered with earth and whitewash. After several hours had passed, the old servant had returned, and as no one else had appeared, the doctor began to think that perhaps the bills had not yet been changed, and by virtue of such a supposition, he hurried to the widow's house with the pious intention of substituting one of his old bank notes in place of the supposed false one. The bill had been changed. The widow and her children were having a little party in honor of their great good luck. They were not alone, as they generally were, but had asked several of their friends to share their joy. They were so profuse in their expressions of gratitude that the good old doctor did not know what to say, nor how to explain his sudden return. Now be sure you take a room where you can have sunlight and give the children a dose of castor oil, he said as he hurried away. Dr. Santos did not recover his usual composure for a long time. He seemed taciturn, although he continued in his accustomed mode of living. After a while, however, he became more like himself. The cabinet maker, for whom the doctor had obtained a lucrative position, wished to make a public manifestation of his gratitude, but the doctor forbade him to even mention that he had received help. Nevertheless, it was murmured continually that Dr. Santos, on account of his relations with persons of high rank, had given many a one a modest pension, while he had restored others to health by giving to them the money to procure a change of climate and a much-needed rest. Notwithstanding his friends of high rank, the doctor still lived in his modest apartment and had, moreover, 
dismissed his only servant. He now took his meals at a neighboring tavern. He still kept the dovecot, and he had bought an expensive therapeutical apparatus and costly instruments. He had a laboratory and a fine medical library. He earned enough, and he had innumerable friends who gave him money to help cases of true necessity, owing to his fame of discerning where help was really needed. Happily, society is not so completely decayed that it does not produce, with frequent spontaneity, the flower of Christian charity. When Dr. Santos changed his habits of living, his character also changed. Formerly, he had been cheerful and lively, fond of an occasional visit to the theater, and especially fond of a good table. But when he might have had all this, he became gloomy and moody, and reduced his personal expenses in spite of his large earnings to an extent almost miserly. The years rolled by, the doctor's hair was snowy white, and he scarcely spoke. As he was no longer young and paid so little attention to his own comfort, his health began to fail. The cold was intense that winter, and Dr. Santos, in spite of himself, had to keep his bed many a day. His medical confreres visited him, and one in particular, earnestly urged him to go to a warm climate. Must I go away, leave my work and occupations to die, not of sickness, but of ennui? But, argued his friend, no one likes better than you to send people off for a change of air during the winter. The doctor did not reply, but he remained in Madrid, passing sleepless nights and coughing ceaselessly. His friends, the only family he possessed, took turns for a long time in caring for him, but as the days lengthened into weeks, the weeks into months, and each one gradually began to find that his own cares absorbed his time, it was agreed upon that the best thing to do was to have a sister of charity come and nurse the doctor. Henceforth, his friends' visits grew less frequent, and there were days at a time when his doorbell did not ring once. Sor Luz, as the Sister of Charity was called, proved to be a perfect substitute for all his other attendants. Although the doctor had never cared for women's society, he found Sor Luz such a charming companion that he refused to receive other people if it were possible. Her white headdress and the undulations of her soft gown seemed to him like the motions of a dove's wings. Dr. Santos followed her with an affectionate and grateful glance, thus repaying the tender and solicitous care which only maternal and Christian love could give with such absolute abnegation and perseverance. About the last of November, that harvest time of death, when a few golden leaves still clung to the trees, when the mountain tops were covered with silver and the cold, northerly wind penetrated the crevices of doors and windows, Dr. Santos began to grow worse. He declared in his will, dated years before, that he had no property, and that whatever was found in the house belonged, by right, to the poor, that he wished to have a humble funeral and be buried in the public cemetery. In looking over his papers and effects, a tin box was found containing forty banknotes of one thousand pesetas each. His friends declared that he had died of avarice. Zorluz said that she had never known anyone who had passed away with more tranquil, resigned Christian spirit than Dr. Santos. Nevertheless, she often spoke of some phrases of the doctor's which were utterly incomprehensible to her and for which she could not account. When there is yet time, he said, I had the means to cure myself. It would have been so easy, that if it had been anyone else I should have done so. I did not do it, because I wished to preserve my own self-respect, and to have some merit when God called me to a better life. End of section 3「Section 4 of The Doctor's Red Lamp」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Val Roth. 
The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. The Curing of Kate Negley, by Lucy S. Furman. I told you once, said Mrs. Melissa Allgood, about the time Kate Negley took that leading on the lodge line and locked the doctor out of the house one night when he was meeting with the Masons and hollered at him scornful-like when he come home to get in with his lodge key and how the doctor smashed up her fine front door with an axe? Well, all the station thought that might be the end of Kate's foolishness and that maybe she would take her religion and sanctification comfortable after that, same as other folks. And everybody was glad when Dr. Negley broke that door in, because it ain't good for Kate Negley or any other human to have their own way all the time. So Kate went along quiet and peaceable for about two or three months, and never had no new leadings to tell about in meeting, and never did a thing to show her heartfelt religion except to wear her hair straight down her back, according to Paul. And Ma, she said to me one day she believed Kate had come to the end of her line and was going to act like sensible folks the rest of her days. But I told Ma not to waste her breath in vain babblings. That I bet Kate Negley was just setting on a new nest. And for Ma to wait for the hatching. I hadn't hardly spoke the words before it come. The very next Sunday, when Brother Cheatham got through preaching and called for experiences and testimonies, Kate, she rose up and said she was mightily moved to rebuke a faithless and perverse generation, puffed up in its fleshy mind, loving unrighteousness and abominable in wickedness. She said she had been wandering in the way of destruction like the rest, and putting her faith in lies to the last few weeks when light begun to dawn on her, and she commenced to search the scriptures more. She said she was fully persuaded now, hallelujah, and wanted all them that desired to be wholly sanctified to enter the straight and narrow path with her. She said the gospel she had to preach to them that morning was the gospel of healing by prayer and faith and not by medicines or doctors. And though she had lain among the pots like the rest of them, yet now was her soul like the wings of a dove and forever risen above all such works of the devil as... Ipecac and quinine and calomel, that only in the great physician did she place her trust, that as for earthly doctors, she could only say to them in the words of Job, ye are foragers of lies, ye are all physicians of no value. She said, yea, verily, all they was good for was to beguile unstable souls and bewitch the people with sorceries. And not only that, but like Jeremiah says, they help forward the affliction. She said she never meant to say anything against doctors as man, but as doctors they was vessels of wrath, corrupters of souls, firebrands of the devil, and the liveliest stumble stones in the path of righteousness. She said for them benighted folks that put their faith in physic to listen to Jeremiah's point-blank words, Thou hast no healing medicines. And again, in vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be healed. She said from lid to lid of the Bible there wasn't a single case of anybody being cured of anything by either doctors or medicine. And that ought to be enough for the earnest Christian without looking any further. But she said, knowing their hard-heartedness, she had studied every verse of the scriptures before she got up to speak. She said when the disciples was sent out, they was told to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out devils, and they did. She said she'd like to know how many that called themselves disciples nowadays so biggity and claimed the indwelling of holiness ever even tried to do any of them things except talk, let alone do them. She said it was because they were so poor-spirited they didn't have faith to lay hold of the promise, though there it was in plain words. Ask, and ye shall receive, according to your faith be it unto you, for I will restore health to thee, saith the Lord. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. She said, bless the Lord, her spiritual eyes were open now, and the only medicine she would ever take was prayer and faith. She said James's prescription was good enough for her. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And that she wanted every soul in station to get to the same point. But she said until they did, 
She wanted it known there was one righteous soul in Sodom that was going to start out on the warpath against the devil and all his doctors. She said she was going to lay hold of the promise of James. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. She said she wanted it published abroad that anybody that took sick was welcome to her services and prayers without money and without price. She said for all her hearers to put on the breastplate of faith and the armor of righteousness and enter into the straight and narrow path that opened into her front door and keep out the broad way that led to the doctor's office. She said she had a big bottle of sweet oil and faith to remove mountains. Well, all the congregation was thunderstruck at the idea of Kate Negley setting up in opposition to her own husband. Dr. Negley, being the only doctor in the station, Ma said that anybody could have knocked her down with a feather. And I know it made me right weak in the knees, though of course I felt like Kate was doing right to follow her leadings and thought she was mighty courageous. I never could have done it myself, especially if I had such a good husband as Kate. I have traveled about more than Kate, and I know that hen's teeth ain't scarcer than good man. Yeah, like Solomon says, one among a thousand have I found. But, of course, a woman never appreciates what she has. And Kate, she always took all the doctor's kindness and spoiling like it was her birthright. And ding-donged at him all the time about his not having any religion or sanctification. Now, I reckon you've lived long enough to know that there are three kinds of sanctified. Them that are sanctified and know it, humble-like, such as me. Them that are sanctified and don't know it or even suspicion it. And them that are sanctified and know it too well. And I have told Ma many a time that Dr. Negley is one of the kind that is sanctified and don't know it. And that Kate might pattern after the doctor in some ways to her edification. Somehow I've always felt like ten or eleven children might have took some of that foolishness out of Kate. But not having any, she was just on a high horse about something or other all the time. The evening after Kate did that talking in church, Ma saw the doctor riding by, and she called him to the fence and asked him if he had heard about Kate's talk and what he thought about it. And he said, yes, Brother Jones and them had told him about it down at the post office, and it had tickled him mightily that he thought it was very funny. Ma told him she should think it would make him mad for Kate to get up and talk that way about doctors and medicine. Mrs. Gary, he says, women are women, and one of their charms is that nobody knows what they're going to do next. And if my wife, he says, has an extra allowance of charm, I certainly ought to feel thankful for it. He said if Kate wanted to quarrel with her bread and butter and talk away his practice, he wasn't going to raise any objections. That he needed to take a rest anyhow having worked too hard all his life. He said another thing. A woman that took as many notions as Kate couldn't hold on to any one of them very long, but was bound to get cured of it before much harm was done. Ma, she told me what he said, and that in her opinion, Dr. Negley could give Job blessings and patience. Then we commenced to have times in the station. The first thing Kate did was to get up one night after the doctor had gone to sleep and go downstairs and across the yard to his office and hunt up his saddlebags and stamp on them and smash every bottle in them and then sling them over in Pa's cornfield. Pa, he found them out there in the morning after breakfast and took them to the doctor's office. And he said the doctor did some tall swearing when he saw them. But I believe that was a slander of Pa's because I know the way the doctor acted afterwards. At dinner time, he went up to the house mighty peaceful and eat his dinner. And then he says to Kate, very cheerful and polite, I see that my saddlebags have met with a little accident. It's an ill wind that blows nobody good, he says, and I don't know but what it's a fine thing that my patients, some of them medicines being powerful, stale. But it's mighty unfortunate for you, Kate, he says, for I will be obliged to use up all your missionary money for the next year and a half to replenish them saddlebags. Time's been so hard, he says. You know Kate always give more money to missions than any woman in the station. Doctor just couldn't deny her anything. And she prided herself in a heap on it. Righteous pride, of course. She was just speechless with wrath at what he said. 
and she saw she'd have to change her warfare and fall back on the outposts. So she started out and went to see the women in the station and prayed with them and strengthened their faith and tried to make them promise to send for her if anybody got sick and not for the doctor and worked on them till they got plumb unsettled in their minds. Some of them went to Brother Cheatham and asked him about it and he said it was a question everybody must decide for themselves but there certainly was scripture for it he couldn't deny. It's a funny thing what poor hands some preachers are in practicing. Brother Cheatham couldn't get so much as a crook in his little finger, but what Dr. Negley must come, double quick, day and night. I've always felt like getting their doctrine for nothing was a big drawback to preacher's faith. Kate didn't only go about in the station, but she would keep on the watch, and when the doctor got a call to the country, Kate would saddle her bay mare and follow after him, sometimes ten or fifteen miles. By the time she would get to the sick one's house, the doctor would be sitting by the bed, feeling the patient's pulse or some such, and Kate would sail across the room with never so much as a howdy to the doctor and go on her knees on the other side of the bed and dab a little sweet oil on the sick person and pray at the top of her voice and exhort the patient to throw away the vile concoctions of the devil and swing out on the promise of James. And the doctor wouldn't pay no more attention to her than she did to him, but would dose out the medicine, go on about his business as pleasant as could be. After he was gone, Kate would smash up all the bottles in sight, if the folks wasn't mighty careful. And then she would follow the doctor to the next place, never any more noticing him or speaking to him than if he was a fence post. She said when the doctor was at home, he was her husband, the one regenerate, and she was going to treat him according to scripture and as polite as she knew how. But when he was out dosing the sick, he was an angel of darkness, and not fit to be so much as looked at by the saved and sanctified. Mary Alice Weldon was one of the first to take up with Kate's notions. I've always believed it was because Dick Weldon scoffed at them. If Dick had been a quick man, he never would have done it, knowing well that the only way to get Mary Alice to do like he wanted her to was for him to come out strong on the opposite side. But it takes a hundred years to learn some men anything. And what did Dick do that Sunday but laugh at Kate's notions on healing? Ever since Mary Alice had shook the red rag at Satan by getting up and shouting in church one time when Dick had told her point blank she shouldn't, she had enjoyed a heap of liberty, and Dick... He had been diminished, like the Bible says. So when Dick laughed at Kate, Mary Alice fired right up and told Dick Weldon that never another doctor or bottle of medicine should ever step over her door sill, and that the next time any of her household got sick, prayer or nothing should cure them. So the next time her little fillery had spasms, Mary Alice sent over for Kate. And when Dick come home for dinner, he found all the doors locked and looked in at the window and there was Fillory and Fitz on the bed and Kate and Mary Alice praying loud and long on both sides. Dick was just crazy and he ran up the street for the doctor and they come back and broke in the window and there was Fillory laying quiet and peaceful and breathing regular and Kate and Mary Alice shouting and glorifying God for casting a devil out of Fillory. That gave Kate her big reputation and stirred the station to the dregs. And even the doctor said it was only by the grace of God that Fillory pulled through under the circumstances. Sister Sally Barnes had been laying up for nearly a year with a misery in her back, and the doctor had given her physic, and she had took all the patent medicines she could borrow or raise money to buy. But there she laid, and expected to lay the rest of her days. Kate went up there one day and expounded Bible to her and anointed her with that oil and prayed over her for about two hours and then told her to rise and cook dinner and that the Lord had healed her. And up Sister Sally got and has been up ever since. Of course, everybody was excited and talking about it. Ma asked Dr. Nagley one day what he thought about it. And he said it was a mighty fine thing for Sister Sally's family. And that Kate's medicine was certainly better for some folks than his. <laughs> that healing gave Kate a big name. And folks began to send for her right and left. Some would send for her. 
and the doctor both, thinking it just as well to be on the safe side and not neglect either faith or works. I reckon it did the sick good just to lay eyes on Kate. She was such a fine, healthy, rosy-cheeked woman, and never had had a day's sickness to pull her down. Then come along the time for Sister Nickens' shingles. For seven years, old Sister Nickens, Tommy T's ma, had took down regular every Washington's birthday at ten o'clock in the morning with the shingles. Everybody thought a duck could as soon get along without water as Sister Nickens without her shingles, and she never dreamt of such a thing as not having them. They never got to the breaking out stage with her but once, but she was scared to death every time for fear they would break out and run all around her and meet. And of course, that would kill anybody, Dad. So she used to make her will and give away her gray mule every year beforehand. This time, Kate sent Sister Nickens word not to make no will or give away the mule, that she was going to cast them shingles into the bottomless pit by prayer. So, at sunup on the 22nd, Kate went up to Sister Nickens' house and set into praying and anointing, and by ten o'clock she had Sister Nickens so full of grace and glory that the devil or the shingles couldn't get within a mile of her, and she never felt a single pain. And of all the hallelujah times, that was one. You could hear the shouting all over town, and nearly all the station went up there. I went myself, and I saw Sister Nickens with my own eyes up and about and full of rejoicings and not a shingle to her name. And I thought it was wonderful. It seemed just like Bible times over again, and Sister Nickens was so lifted up over it that she mounted her gray mule after dinner and started out on a three-month's visitation through the country to spread the news abroad amongst her kin and friends. That was the winter I felt the inward call to preach, but never got no outward invitations. So while I was having that trial of patience, I thought I might as well help Kate some, though I knew my call was to preach and not to heal. And I would go round a good deal with Kate, though I never was just as rampant as she was, or as Mary Alice Weldon, and always allowed the doctors might have their uses. One day, Kate came by for me to go up with her to pray over old Mrs. Gurton's rheumatism. So up we went. And Kate told old Miss Gurton what we come for, and Miss Gurton said she never had no objections, and that prayer certainly couldn't do no harm, and oil was good for the joints. So I poured on the oil, and Kate did the praying. In about an hour, Kate jumped up and told old Miss Gurton to get up and walk, that the prayer of faith had healed her. No such a thing, old Miss Gurton says. Them knees is worse than when you commenced. Kate got red in the face and said, of course, the grace was thrown away on them. What wouldn't they accept of it? Old Miss Gurton said she couldn't tell no lies, that she felt worse instead of better, that pain was pain and rheumatism was rheumatism, as well they knew that had it. She said she never meant no disrespect, but that in her opinion, prayer couldn't hold a candle to Dr. Hayhurst's wildcat liniment as a painkiller. Of course, Kate was horror-struck, and she wiped the dust of old Mrs. Gurton's house off her feet when we went out. Then what should Pa do about that time but take down with the yellow janders? You know, and everybody knows, that Pa never did have a bit of religion. I would hate to say such a thing about a known relation, but Pa being my stepfather and the second one of that, I feel like he's kind of far removed. Well... Ma would have been a mighty religious woman if she hadn't been unequally yoked together with unbelievers three times. That's enough to wear a woman's religion to a frazzle, goodness knows, and I have always made excuses for Ma. So when Pa got sick and told Ma to send for the doctor, Ma, being one of those women that is always trying to serve two masters, her husband and her religion, sent for the doctor and Kate both. And when I got there, a few minutes later, there sat the doctor by Pa's bed and Kate and Ma back in the kitchen. And every time, Kate would start over the door sill into Pa's room to pour the oil over him and pray over him. Pa would sit up in bed and shake his fist at her and swear a blue streak and tell her not to come another step. Ma and me, we nearly went through the earth for shame at Pa. And of course, he never would have done it if his liver had been right, but I will say this for Pa. He is a polite, mild-mannered man and slow to wrath, 
when he hasn't got the janders. Then Kate would flop down on the kitchen floor and thank the Lord she was being persecuted for righteousness' sake. And a good many people dropped in, hearing the noise, and everybody was plumb scandalized at Pa and said he was a downright infidel. And all their sympathies was roused for Kate. After that, she had a bigger business than ever. In spite of a setback or two, like old Miss Girton's rheumatism and Brother Gilly Jones' baby dying one night of the croup when him and Kate was praying over it and wouldn't send for the doctor. Kate said it was the Lord's will and the baby's appointed time to die, and Brother Gilly Jones being sanctified and having eight more children anyhow. He agreed with Kate and said he felt perfectly resigned, though Sister Jones, poor thing, never has got reconciled to this day. Of course, those things never faced Kate, and she was just on the top notch all the time, going day and night. And every Sunday there would be testimonials in church about healings, and fate begun to take hold on both sanctified and sinner, till it actually got to the point the folks' religion was doubted if they sent for a doctor. And when spring opened up, the doctor said his occupation was so near gone he felt justified in going on that camp hunt he'd been wanting to make for fourteen years. So he made up a party of men, masons and such, and went down on Green River for two weeks hunting. Well, you ought to have seen Kate that morning the doctor left. He wasn't out of sight before she turned loose a shouting over the triumph of righteousness and over having actually run the devil out of town. And, and she held a thanks meeting up at her house that night, and we had a full salvation time. Kate invited me to stay with her while the doctor was gone, so I shooed my chickens down to Ma's so I could have my mind free from worldly cares and shut up my house and went. We had a mighty joyful edifying time for two days. The third night, Kate woke me up sudden from a good sleep. About three o'clock in the morning, Melissa, she says, get up and light the lamp. I don't know what on earth's the matter with me, she says. I feel awful and have got all the aches there inside of me. For goodness sake, Kate, I says, rolling out of bed. I reckon you're getting the grip. She groaned. It's worse than the grip, Melissy, all good, she says. I feel like I'm going to die. I lit the lamp and brought it over by the bed. I do believe you have got some fever, Kate, I says. I meet up with it, she says, and with aches and have a terrible gone feeling all over. I tell you, Melissy, I'm an awful sick woman. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? <laughs> Do I, says, no little surprised. Why, pray, of course. Well, she says, kind of faint-like, you'd better be about it. I was a little outdone by her lukewarmness, but I got down on my knees and I went to praying. Kate kept up a considerable groaning. In about five minutes, she says, get up from there, Melissy, all good, and do something for me. I'm a terrible sick woman, she says. Gracious sakes alive, Kate, I says. There ain't nothing I can do but anoint you with the oil. I run and brought the sweet oil. Take it away, she says. The smell of it makes me sick. I won't have it. I was completely dazed, and it seemed to me like the world was turning upside down. But what can you expect of a woman that don't know what the feeling of pain is and never had a sick day since she was a young child and got through the catching age? I fell down on my knees and went to praying again, not knowing just what to do. Kate stopped me again. Melissa Olgood, she says, are you going to let me lay here and die and not stretch out even a finger to help me, she says. Why, Kate, I says, plumb petrified. You know I'm doing the very best that can be done, I says. You must have patience and faith and wait on the time of the Lord. Oh, she says, fairly crying. What on earth made the doctor go off and leave me? He might have known something would happen to me. He ought to have stayed here where he belongs. He'd know what to do for me if he was here, she says. He wouldn't let his own dear wife lay here and die. Kate, I says, you are wandering the worst kind. I'm going after Mary Alice Weldon. So I slipped on my shoes and dress and run down the street to Mary Alice's, and we hurried back as fast as we could. 
I told Mary Alice that Kate was sick, and out of her mind to that extent she was calling for the doctor. Mary Alice said she certainly must be mighty bad off, and that we must pray with a bound and fight and be firm. When we got back, Kate was still a-groaning and crying. Mary Alice told her to cease her complainants and put her trust in one who was mighty to save. Then Mary Alice snatched up the bottle of sweet oil that sat there on the table and started the cake with it. She won't have it on her, I says. It's no use to try. She's got to have it, Mary Alice says. Whether she wants it or not, it's part of James's directions. Kate began to holler and throw out her arms when she saw the oil coming. Take it away, she says. It makes me sick. You hold her hands, Mary Alice says. Well, I pour it on her. So I sat down and took a good grip on Kate's hands, and Mary Alice poured the oil on her. And it went all over her face and head and the pillow. She kept threshing around so lively and hollering till her mouth was full. Then, Kate, she cried and carried on and said we were treating her shameful and would be sorry for it when she was dead and gone. We never paid any attention to her, of course, but got down on both sides of the bed and went to praying as loud and earnest as we could so as to drown the groaning. Then Kate said she didn't want to be prayed for no how, and what she wanted was the doctor. Mary Alice told her she was plumb out of her senses and didn't know what she was talking about. And Kate said no such thing, that she was a mighty sick woman, but she was in her right mind and knew what she wanted, and that it was the doctor. She said the doctor was the only friend she had on earth. She said the doctor wouldn't stand by and see her die and never lift a hand, and she knew it. She said he would know of something to give her that would ease them aches and pains and let her die in peace. But she said, of course, if the doctor was there, she wouldn't need to die that he would save her. She sat up in bed. Melissy, all good, she says. Run over and tell your pa to mount his horse and ride for the doctor, she says, and never stop till he finds him. Land of the living, Kate, I says. You know the doctor is thirty mile or more away, and nobody knows where he's at by now. Tell Mr. Gary I say not to stop till he finds him, Kate says, and to keep life in me till he gets here, she says. I want old Dr. Pegram at Dixie sent for immediate. He ought to get here in three hours' time. You tell Tommy T. Nickens to take my mare and go for him quick, she says. And Mary Alice Weldon, you go down in the cellar and bring me one of those bottles of blackberry cordial to keep my strength till Dr. Pegram comes. Mary Alice and May were smitten dumb right there where we was at on our knees. Kate Negley, I got the voice to say. Are you sure them are your right-minded wishes and not the devil speaking through you? I'll tell you to do what I say and hurry up, Kate says. Do you reckon I want to die? Mary Alice rose and walked out with never a word. But if I ever saw complete disgust wrote on anybody's face, it was hers. I had to go down and get the blackberry cordial myself. And you ought to have seen Kate make away with it. Then I went out and started off Tommy T and Pa. Old Dr. Pegram was there inside of three hours, dosing out big pills for Kate to take every half hour and powders every fifteen minutes, and it looked like Kate couldn't swallow them fast enough to suit her. Dr. Pegram told Ma and me that Kate had a mild case of the grip, and there wasn't no earthly danger. When Dr. Negley and Paul came poking in after midnight that night, wore out and muddy, you never saw as happy a woman in your life as Kate. She laughed and she cried and she hugged the doctor and she kissed him and she said there never was anybody like him, that he was her sweet angel from heaven and the dearest darling on earth. And she knew she wouldn't have no chance to die now that he had come and would know just what to do for her. And I reckon the doctor was the worst astonished man that ever was, but he was a heap too polite and kind to let on, and went on dosing out physic for her just as if it wasn't anything out of the common. And never a word did he ever say to her either about having his camp hunt broke up. And that's the reason I know he's sanctified, for like I told Ma, what sainted martyr could do better? Of course, the station was shaken to the foundations over Kate acting that way, and there was a big time of rejoicing amongst the scoffers. 
and Mary Alice Weldon hasn't spoken to Kate since and says she never will. But I tell Mary Alice she ought to be ashamed of herself, that she's too ready in her judgments and needs to make allowances for humans being humans and for folks changing with circumstances. End of section four. Section five of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aaron Harkey. The Doctor's Red Lamp. Compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. A Doctor's Story by E. M. Davy. Croft House, at the end of the village, that had stood vacant so long, was let at last. A ladder leaned against the wall. A painter was painting the shutters. A gardener digging in the garden. Day by day the aspect of the place improved. Soft muslin shades shrouded the windows. Flowers bloomed where only weeds had grown. The garden paths were laid with gravel. One night a traveling carriage was driven rapidly through the village and in at the gate leading to Croft House. Whence came the vehicle? Who its occupants? No one knew, but everyone desired to know. Nothing that took place within that dwelling transpired outside. In passing by, one saw only that the standard roses flourished and that the grass grew greener. What comments were made on the mysterious and invisible inhabitants? What strange tales circulated? I, the village doctor, concerned myself little enough about the matter, the occupants of Croft House were no doubt human beings, and as such must suffer some of the ills that flesh is heir to. In that case, my services would be required. I waited patiently. A week went by, and one morning before I set off on my rounds, a messenger arrived requesting me to call on Mr. Wilton of Croft House. Dressing myself with more than ordinary care, I crossed the village green. I was young and felt important. I was shown into the drawing room, it was gay with summer flowers redolent of their perfume. On a couch lay a young girl, in appearance almost a child. She was pale, delicate-looking, and very lovely. In front of her knelt a young man of two or three and twenty, one of the handsomest young fellows I had ever seen. He held the hands of the beautiful girl, and they were looking into each other's eyes. As I approached, he rose, bowed, and welcomed me with an easy grace that won my heart. I confess I expected to find the village doctor an older man, he said with a frank smile as he offered me his hand. It is for my wife I desired your attendance. He continued, looking at her with the deepest affection. Una is not strong. Then, at a sign from him, I sat down beside the couch of my interesting patient. You are very young, Mrs. Wilton, I remarked. It was certainly rather a leading question. I am seventeen, doctor, she answered simply. We have been married only a few months. We are strangers here, and wish to be so. Oh, Charlie, please explain, she asked, turning to her husband with a faint blush. You can do it better far than I. He bent over, kissed her on the forehead, then straightening himself and looking at me, said, In attending my wife, Dr. Gray, I must ask you to undertake a double duty. We have decided to tell you our secret, in part, so that while we are your patients, I trust we may look upon you as our friend one who will assist us in keeping our secret and in living the entirely secluded life we desire to lead here. Wilton is an assumed name. My father refused to acknowledge my marriage with the girl I love. Her father withheld his consent to his daughter marrying into a family too proud to receive her. We would have waited any reasonable time, but when our parents sought to separate us entirely, we took our lives into our own hands. We married and hope, in time, to be forgiven." They had both spoken to me with the candor of youth, of love, and of inexperience. It takes very little sometimes to bring a doctor into close relations with his patients. I seemed to become the friend of this interesting young couple at once. I assured them they need not fear being intruded upon by the villagers, and the only gentlemen's residences within calling distance were tenantless at that season of the year, the owners either being up in London or traveling abroad. As to the vicar, he was a man whose advanced age and infirmities effectually precluded him from visiting more than was absolutely necessary among his parishioners. "'If you go to the church, a mile from here,' said I, 
he may or may not call upon you. If you do not go, I think I may safely say he will not consider it necessary. In that case, you will probably never meet. Mr. and Mrs. Wilton thanked me warmly, pressing me to come to see them frequently, which I did with ever-increasing pleasure as the beautiful romance of these two loving hearts unfolded itself. I soon discovered that Mr. Wilton had received a college education. I also gleaned that Una was somewhat his inferior in social position, and that since their runaway marriage they had been traveling abroad. It was no business of mine to know more than they chose to tell. I respected their secret and asked no questions. One morning, my visits had become almost daily now. I saw at once that there was something wrong with Mrs. Wilton, and she saw also that I perceived it. "'You need not feel my pulse, doctor. It is my heart,' she said in answer to my looks. "'You will think me foolishly weak, I know,' she added, forcing a smile. "'But I am miserable because my husband is going to leave me.' "'Leave you? For how long?' I inquired anxiously. She blushed, and, looking down, answered shyly, "'Till this evening.' "'Ah, don't laugh,' she implored. "'We have never been separated for so long since we were married. "'I am nervous and fanciful, I suppose, "'but I scarcely slept last night for thinking of it, "'and when I did, a dreadful dream kept repeating itself. "'Oh, you must not mind dreams,' I answered. "'I never did much before, but this, ah, Charlie!' "'She cried as Mr. Wilton came in, booted and spurred. "'I will come and see you mount.' "'I saw the parting from the drawing-room window where I stood.' saw her husband place his hands on either side of the sweet face and gaze down into it with a look of unutterable love, saw their lips meet together for a moment. After that he kissed her forehead and her beautiful fair hair, then sprang into the saddle and rode off swiftly as though he could not trust himself to linger longer. At the gate, turning, he waved a last farewell. She came into the drawing room presently. "'Doctor, excuse me. I think I will lie down,' she said." her large blue eyes looking peculiarly plaintive, brimming as they were with tears. My presence was not needed then. I bowed and took my leave. But the evening of that day I was sent for to Croft House. "'He has not returned,' were the first words spoken by Mrs. Wilton, as I entered the drawing-room. "'And, oh, what a day it has been!' she continued feverishly. "'So long, so sad. I seem to have lived a cruel lifetime in each hour. "'But it is not late.' "'You said Mr. Wilton would not return till evening,' I urged. "'It has been evening a long time now. See, the sun is setting. Then it will be night,' she shuddered. I sat with her an hour, perhaps, trying in vain to distract her thoughts, and I, too, knowing not how or why, became uneasy. She told me her husband had gone to D, the nearest town, for letters he expected to find at the post office. I knew that I could have ridden there and back easily in the time.' Still, a thousand simple causes might have delayed him. I begged her to take courage, suggesting she would probably laugh tomorrow at the fear she had entertained today. But she shook her head. I suffer too much ever to laugh at such feelings as these, she said in a half whisper. I do not wish to think it, but it is as though I knew something dreadful was. Oh, I cannot. I dare not clothe the terrible thought in words. That would make it seem so real, so almost certain. "'Dr. Gray, can this be the punishment for my disobedience? Come so soon?' she asked in awestruck tones. I could not answer her, but proposed that she should wrap a mantle round her and come with me into the garden to watch for her husband. She thanked me gratefully, and I carried a basket seat out for her and placed it on the lawn. Sitting with her hands clasped about her knees, paler, more fragile, more childish-looking than I had ever seen her, of a sudden I felt, rather than saw, that a change had come to her. She bent forward as though listening intently, and at the same moment a distant sound struck on my ear, the galloping of a horse on the high road. Was there ever before on human countenance such a beautified expression as that which dawned and deepened on Mrs. Wilton's as the sound approached? It was close to us now, but the trees in the garden hid the road from our view. Without slackening speed, the horse galloped in at the open gate. "'Oh, Charlie, Charlie, oh, thank God!' cried the girl, in what seemed a wild, ungovernable ecstasy of gratitude and joy. But I pulled her back, or the horse would have been upon her. Then I saw that the animal was riderless, covered with dust and foam, that the bridle hung loose, dragging on the gravel. A groom who had been on the watch came out. In another moment, all the household were assembled on the lawn. 
Mrs. Wilton had fallen back, as I thought fainting, in my arms. But no, her senses had not forsaken her. She raised herself and pointed in the direction the horse had come. "'He lies there, there!' she cried, and pushing me from her, ran forward towards the gate. I bade the servants bring lanterns and follow me. To Mrs. Wilton, who was out in the road by this time, I said all I could say to dissuade her from going with me, but my words fell on deaf ears. Feeling it was useless, in one sense cruel, to persist, I compelled her to take my arm. Endowed for the time, by excitement, with almost superhuman strength, she seemed to drag me forward rather than to lean on me. After proceeding about a mile, we came to a bit of level road which for some distance in front showed clear and distinct in the moonlight. Here, I felt certain we had lost all trace of the horse's shoe marks, which hitherto had been every now and again perceptible in the dusty highway. There is a shorter cut, if he knew of it, I said, and stopped. Then if there is, he would come by it. He would be sure to find out and come by it, she cried. And I led her back a little distance to a gate at the entrance of a wood, where sure enough were traces sufficient to show we were again on the right track. Servants with lanterns had overtaken us by this time. So, calling out at intervals and listening in vain for a response, we entered the dark wood. Through it was an almost unfrequented bridle path, considered somewhat unsafe by day, but particularly so at night, the gnarled roots of trees forming a raised network upon the ground. It was with considerable difficulty we made our way. Mrs. Wilton stumbled many times, would have fallen but for my support. At last she loosed my arm and ran forward, signing me not to follow her. In another moment the wood resounded with a wild and piercing cry. She had seen what the rest of us had failed to see, and when I came up to her she was kneeling beside her husband, her arms clasped about his neck, her face close pressed to his. One agonized look she gave me as I bent over them. My dream, she said. I understood. There was an ugly wound on the back of poor Charlie Wilton's head. The body was still warm, but the heart had ceased to beat. Though Mrs. Wilton did not speak again, she never completely lost her senses, but her mind seemed stunned. We put some hurdles together and carried him back thus to Croft House. An inquest was held, every particular of which was minutely reported in the county newspaper, to appear in condensed form in most of the journals of the day. But no friends of the dead man ever came forward, nor was it satisfactorily proved whether his death had been the result of violence or of an accidental fall from his horse in the dangerous pathway through the wood. The post office officials at D perfectly remembered the deceased calling for letters on the day in question, giving the name of Wilton, but there were none for him. In the bank was lodged to his credit some five or six thousand pounds. I took upon myself the arrangements for the funeral, as of everything else. Mrs. Wilton's mind had not sufficiently recovered from the shock it had received on that terrible night to understand or care for what went on around her. Only once, when I urged writing to her friends, did she even momentarily rouse herself to answer me. My father will never forgive me, she said. I acted in defiance of his commands. No, I cannot write to him. Then she added, he has married again, which is perhaps in part explained. A month later, a baby was born, a boy whom she called Charlie, and when she spoke the name, tears sprang to her eyes for the first time. It was not until I saw those tears that I had the slightest hope of her mind rallying from the shock, but then I knew that the living child would save her. She looked upon him as having been sent direct from heaven to solace her for her loss. She regarded him as an emanation from the departed spirit of her husband. There was certainly something uncommon about the child. He was pretty, but not engaging. He never cried. But it may also be said he never smiled. He did not suffer, but there was about him none of the joyousness of childhood. It seemed as though the thunder cloud that had burst over the mother's head had left its shadow on the child. Between two and three years after Mr. Wilton's death, a change seemed likely to occur in my own prospects. A rich relation, a physician of high standing, wrote urging me to come to London immediately on a matter, so he said, of the greatest importance to myself. There was nothing to prevent my complying with his request. The village was in a healthy state. My outside practice might be made to spare me. I wrote stating I would be with him on the following day. 
I went to Croft House to say goodbye. It was summer. Mrs. Wilton was sitting out on the lawn with Charlie on a rug close at her feet. She made room for me beside her, and we talked together for a short time of her affairs and of the child. It was not until I had risen to go that I broached the subject of my departure. She looked surprised, alarmed. But, Charlie, she said, if he should be ill? I would not go if he were ill. I will return at once if he should need me, I answered earnestly. But is he not the picture of health? Why, he seems exempt from every childish trouble. I told her my relative's address, knowing she only cared to have it in case she needed me for her boy. Then I lifted the child in my arms and kissed him. Goodbye, little man, I said cheerfully. He was a splendid little fellow, of whom his mother might well be proud. He resembled his father, too, and was growing more like him every day. I was about to set the child down, but something, some feeling I cannot define, impelled me to hold him closer, to look into his face, his eyes, more scrutinizingly than I had ever done, and so looking, I shuddered at the thought that then assailed me. Great powers! Could fate be so cruel? Had heaven no pity for this poor mother who, so young, had already surely borne enough of sorrow? I put the boy down quickly and turned away. Perhaps, perhaps after all, I may have been mistaken. I reached London and Dr. B.'s residence that evening, and my worthy relative quickly explained the object of his summons. He wished me to undertake, with his supervision, a case requiring the utmost care and consideration, one which rendered it necessary that a medical man should reside for a time beneath the same roof as his patient, and be with him night and day. This patient was Lord Welbury, a self-made man so far as his immense wealth was concerned, but he came of an ancient and honorable race. I accepted the munificent conditions offered, and within a couple of hours of my arrival in town was driven to Lord Welbury's house in Belgravia, and entered upon the duties of my post. For some days and nights my responsibilities absorbed all my attention. The life of a sick man hung on a thread. My medical capacity was taxed to its utmost. I knew not, nor cared I, for the time being, what went on outside that chamber. The crisis passed, my patient began rapidly to recover. The first day that he was able to sit up in his room, he asked me a startling question. He said, Doctor, am I sane? Your mind has never been affected, I answered unhesitatingly. Your lordship is as sane as I am. Good, therefore a will made by me now could not be invalid. Most certainly not on the ground of incompetency. Then my will must be made tomorrow, or next day at latest. This illness has warned me to delay no longer. My niece's child will be my heir. His words set me musing and turning over in my mind how this could be. Your lordship is childless, then? The remark slipped from me almost unawares, but they were fateful words, as the result proved. I beg your pardon, I added, seeing surprise and some annoyance written on his face. Not at all, he answered courteously. I suppose you were acquainted with my family affairs, for they are no secret. I have a son, though no communication has passed between us for nearly four years. He set me and my wishes at defiance by marrying beneath him, consequently will inherit little more than an empty title. I mean to leave my fortune to my niece's child. The boy was committed to my care when his parents went to India two years ago. He is a fine little fellow, and it shows how close an attendance you have been on me if you did not even know he was in the house. Was your son's name Charles, that of the girl he married Una? I asked, scarcely heeding his last words. My heart was beating faster than it should, my voice and my earnestness less steady than it ought to be. Yes, but why these questions? I knew he was well enough now to hear the truth, therefore I answered. Because it is my belief your lordship's son is dead. I will relate to you a sad story. When I have finished, you will be able to judge whether or not you are concerned in it. Then I told, as briefly as I could, the Croft House tragedy and as I did so, read in the ever-increasing interest with which he listened to my tale that my suspicions were correct. That the man I had to deal with was of a proud, egotistical, unsympathetic nature I was well aware. That the death of his only son would not vitally affect him I had rightly guessed. But I was scarcely prepared for the interest he displayed on learning of the existence of his grandchild. The better nature of the man seemed touched. 
I spoke of little Charles's beauty, his likeness to his father, even hinted at a resemblance to Lord Welbury himself. With the feverish impatience of an invalid, he demanded that the boy should be sent for at once. He cannot come without his mother. The two lives are bound together as one. Then write to the mother and bid her bring him, was the imperious reply, and the speaker turned his face away as though to intimate no more was to be said. The affair was settled. On quitting the room I encountered a nurse leading a smiling, rosy little urchin clad in velvet and rich lace. "'Speak prettily to the kind doctor, Georgie,' said the nurse. "'This is the little heir, sir,' she whispered to me. Three days later, Mrs. Wilton, I must still call her so, and her son arrived. I met them at the station and took them in one of his lordship's carriages to the house. The boy, exhausted apparently by the journey, was asleep when he entered it. He was still sleeping when his mother carried him across the threshold of Lord Welbury's door. His lordship's reception of her was not ungracious. Could he fail to feel touched at the sight of this gentle, beautiful young creature who had loved his son so well? But it was evident he resented the fact that his grandson, whom he had specially desired to welcome, could not be prevailed upon to notice him or enticed to leave his mother's arms. "'Excuse him. He is so tired,' pleaded the young mother, reading the disappointment on her father-in-law's face. "'Well, well. Off to bed with him, then.' Bring him to me bright and smiling in the morning. Bright and smiling? Somehow the words struck me, even haunted me. They were so totally inapplicable to Charlie. I tried to remember if I had ever seen a smile upon that grave baby face, but tried in vain. When I entered Lord Welbury's room next day, my presence there at nights was now dispensed with. The old man, in dressing gown and slippers, was reclining in an easy chair. In front of him stood Mrs. Wilton, with Charlie clinging to her long black draperies. "'Come here, Gray,' exclaimed his lordship irritably. "'I cannot get my grandson to notice me. What is to be done?' "'Charlie is shy. He has been used to no one but me,' murmured the mother, raising her eyes with an appealing look in them to mine. "'Madam, I fear you are spoiling him,' said Lord Welbury sharply. "'The other child took to me at once, but this—' "'Send for the other, sir.' I suggested, and presently, the little heir, with whom I had previously made acquaintance, was brought in by his nurse. The latter sat down in a far corner with some knitting. The child, as apparently he had been accustomed to do, ran to the old man and scrambled at his knee. "'I love oo, I love oo,' he cried. Lord Welbury's face was radiant. "'Now, Charlie, my man,' he said, as the other child, after his affectionate greeting, scampered off to play beside his nurse. Charlie was placed on his grandfather's knee. "'Say, I love you,' whispered Mrs. Milton, as she tried to clasp her own child's arms about Lord Welbury's neck. "'Say, I love you,' echoed the boy mechanically, then dropped his head and lay quite placidly as though he slept. "'Ha-ha, the young rascal! He's making himself at home at last,' observed Lord Welbury, well pleased." And now that I come to see him more closely, he's not unlike what his father was at the same age, only quieter. Do you know he almost strikes me as being a little dull? Have you found him so, madam? I have been too sad a companion for him, sir. I know. I feel it now, sighed the poor mother, her eyes wandering from her own boy to follow the antics of the other, who astride a stick was careering merrily about the room. That can soon be remedied said Lord Welbury, putting Charlie off his knee. Let the two youngsters romp together. I warrant they'll make friends if let alone. And in order to try the experiment, we three sat apart and kept up some desultory talk. This lasted but a short time, however. It was broken in upon by a startled cry from the younger boy, Georgie, who, apparently terror-stricken, rushed across the room. Naughty boy! Naughty boy! Send him away! He's making faces at me! cried the spoilt child in an outburst of passion, pointing with outstretched finger at his little companion. The nurse dropped her knitting and rose instantly. I have seen it from the first, she said, calmly confronting us. The child is half an idiot, my lord. All eyes were turned at poor Charlie, who stood among some broken toys, his features distorted into the ghastly semblance of a smile. Mrs. Wilton, running to her boy, shielded him with her arms. My darling, my darling! Has God no pity? She cried and bore him from the room. 
She had prayed day and night, this unhappy mother, to see either a smile on her baby's lips or a tear in his eye, and hitherto her prayer had been denied. It was granted now. The poor, dulled senses of the child, roused into something like activity by the antics of his little lively playfellow, had caused the lips to smile. But what a smile! Lord Welbury turned pale. A look of disgust, not unmixed with anger, settled on his face. "'There is no doubt the boy is imbecile,' he said, as I was about to follow Mrs. Wilton from the room. "'Dr. Gray, were you aware of this when you allowed him to be brought here?' "'I was not aware of it,' I replied readily. For the sad foreboding that first assailed me on the lawn at Croft House had received no confirmation hitherto. "'But even if the case is as we fear,' I added earnestly, "'it may be curable.' "'Excuse me, doctor,' he interrupted. "'No man who has seen that child as we have seen him "'can have the slightest doubt but that he is an idiot for life. "'On the contrary, my lord, we must regard the matter from another point. "'Remember the shadow that rested on his mother before his birth? "'Where there is no hereditary taint? "'What then? "'On the mere chance of the child being curable, "'do you suppose I am going to leave my money to him?' "'No!' he cried excitedly. My own life is too precarious for me to delay longer the settling of my affairs. My niece's child is still my heir. I regard the other as no eh. For heaven's sake, don't let me have my feelings harrowed by the sight of that poor idiot any more. The mother shall have a handsome annuity. I pity her. And that day Lord Welbury made his will, leaving his immense fortune as he had said. Once more I returned to my country practice, Mrs. Wilton and Charlie to Croft House. Never was grief grander in its simplicity, or more nobly born than that of Mrs. Wilton. She still prayed, prayed with the faith which we are told will move mountains. Her eyes, when not raised to heaven, were bent on her child, ever seeking for the dawning of that intelligence which she believed must come in answer to her prayers. She tried to teach him his childish lessons. She read, she talked to him, even chanted in a low, sad voice the nursery rhymes that happy mothers sing. At last, one day, exercising over herself a supreme control, she told her son the story of his father's death, told it in simple, childlike language, but with a pathos that might have moved a heart of stone. The boy was standing at her knee, she holding his unresponsive hand, but, as she proceeded with her narration, he pressed gradually closer to her side. With a thrill of rapture, she looked at the drooped eyelids, hoping, praying, to see a tear glisten on the dark curled lashes. Trembling, she reached the climax of her sad tale, and bending over him, Charlie, she whispered, Charlie, he was dead, you understand? Alas, she knew then, even ere she had done speaking, that the boy was incapable of understanding her. His eyes were closed. He slept and he seemed forever thus. Whether the beautiful but expressionless eyes were open or closed, his mental faculties were in that dull, dormant state. It might be said they slept. He is like that little statue of Jesus now, she once said to me, pointing to a marble figure of Christ. But some day God will awaken his soul. Ah, doctor, shall I live to see that day? I scarcely thought she could, but did not tell her so. From the day on which she related the story of her husband's death, she herself drooped visibly. But grief kills very slowly. Five years passed by. Lord Welbury was dead. His wealth, with the exception of the annuity to his son's widow, was left to his niece's child. His title now by right became his grandson's. The boy grew fast. He was eight years old, but his mind still slumbered. He knew the sound of his mother's voice would come to the side of her couch when called, would lie for hours folded in her arms, whispering back her loving words, repeating her gentle admonitions like an echo. The words apparently conveyed no meaning, but they touched some hidden chord. Weaker and weaker grew Mrs. Wilton. On one of my daily visits, the sick nurse, who was in constant attendance now, whispered to me that the end was near. I was startled, shocked, to perceive how near. Doctor, dear friend, she gasped very faintly as I pressed her poor transparent hand, but her whole attention was riveted on her son. She was gazing at him with eyes out of which the light of earth was fading fast. It was evident she desired to say something, but it was some time before the words would come. 
At last, gathering strength, she said in a low, penetrating voice that scarcely faltered, I am going to leave you, Charlie. Here I could not help you, but when in heaven I see our dear Lord face to face, when on my knees before the great white throne, for an instant an expression of rapture irradiated her features. The next, with a slight sigh, she sank back upon the pillow. I touched Charlie on the shoulder. He dropped upon his knees and, unprompted, joined his trembling hands in prayer. His gaze was directed upward. His countenance assumed a look of intensity I had never seen on it before. Quite suddenly he rose and flinging himself sobbing across the bed. Oh, mother, mother, do not leave me all alone, he cried. See, your son is saved, I whispered, bending over Mrs. Wilton. But I was speaking to the dead. And yet, even as I looked upon the still white face, the lips seemed parting into a smile of the most holy, calm, ineffable content. Could it be as she herself had said? Was she already kneeling before the great white throne? Had God listened to her prayer at last? A few more words, and this o'er true tale is ended. From the moment of his mother's death, the mists that had obscured poor Charlie's mind dispersed. I took him to live with me and watched his young intelligence grow day by day to healthy vigor. Not even a shadowy semblance of a cloud rests now upon his mind. He has succeeded to his grandfather's wealth as well as to the title, for the niece's child is dead. The present Lord Welbury ranks amongst England's noblest sons. He is one of the greatest philanthropists of the day. E. M. Davy. End of section five. Read by Aaron Harkey, Greenville, South Carolina, March 2023. Section six of the Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Section 6. John Bartine's Watch, The Doctor's Story, by Ambrose Bierce. The exact time? Good heavens, my friend, why do you insist? One would think, but what does it matter? It is easily bedtime. Isn't that near enough? But here, if you must set your watch, take mine and see for yourself. With that, he detached his watch, a tremendously heavy, old-fashioned one, from the chain and handed it to me, then turned away and, walking across the room to a shelf of books, began an examination of their backs. His agitation and evident distress surprised me. They appeared altogether reasonless. Having set my watch by his, I stepped over to where he stood and said, Thank you. As he took his watch and reattached it to the guard, I observed that his hands were unsteady. A slight pallor had come into his face. With a tact, upon which I greatly prided myself, I sauntered carelessly to the sideboard and took some brandy and water. Then, begging his pardon for my thoughtlessness, asked him to have some and went back to my seat by the fire, leaving him to help himself, as was our custom. He did so, and presently joined me at the hearth, as tranquil as if nothing unusual had happened. This l odd little incident occurred in my apartment, where John Bartin was passing an evening. We had dined together at the club, had come home in a hack, and, in short, everything had been done in the most prosaic way. And why John Bartin should break in upon the natural and established order of things to make himself spectacular with a display of emotion, apparently for his own entertainment, I could no wise understand. The more I thought of it, while his brilliant conversational gifts were commending themselves to my inattention, the more curious I grew, and, of course, had no difficulty in persuading myself that my curiosity was friendly solicitude. That is the disguise that curiosity commonly assumes to evade resentment. So I ruined one of the finest sentences of his monologue by cutting it short without ceremony. John Bartine, I said, 
you must try to forgive me, if I am wrong. But with the light that I have at present, I cannot concede your right to go all to pieces when asked the time of night. I cannot admit that it is proper to experience a mysterious reluctance to look your own watch in the face and to cherish in my presence, without explanation, painful emotions which are denied to me and which are none of my business. To this ridiculous speech, Martin made no immediate reply, but sat looking gravely into the fire. Fearing that I had offended, I was about to apologize and beg him to think no more about the matter. When, looking me calmly in the eyes, he said, My dear fellow, the levity of your manner does not at all disguise the hidden impudence of your demand. But happily, I had already decided to tell you what you wish to know, and no manifestation of your unworthiness to hear it shall alter my decision. Be good enough to persuade me to have a fresh cigar, and you shall hear all that I can tell you about the matter. This watch, he said, had been in my family for three generations before it fell to me. Its original owner, from whom it was made, was my great-grandfather, Bramwell Olcott Bartine, a wealthy planter of colonial Virginia, and a staunch a Tory, as every lay awake nights contriving new kinds of maledictions for the head of Mr. Washington, and new methods of aiding and embedding good King George. One day, this worthy gentleman had the deep misfortune to perform for his cause a service of capital importance which was not recognized by those who suffered its disadvantages as legitimate. It does not matter what it was, but among its minor consequences was my excellent ancestor's arrest one night in his own house by a party of Mr. Washington's rebels. He was permitted to say farewell to his weeping family, and was then marched away into the darkness, which swallowed him up forever. Not the slenderest clue to his fate was ever found. After the war, the most diligent inquiry and the offer of large rewards failed to turn up any of his captors or any fact concerning him. He had disappeared, and that was all. Something in John Bartine's manner that was not in his words. I hardly knew what it was or how it manifested itself, prompted me to ask, What is your view of the matter, Bartine, of the justice of it? My view of it, he flamed out, bringing his clenched hound down upon the table as if I had been in a public house dicing with blackguards. My view of it is that it was a characteristically dastardly assassination by that damned traitor, Washington, and his ragamuffin rebels. For some minutes, nothing was said. Bartine was recovering his temper, and I waited. Then I said, was that all? No, there was something else. A few weeks after my great-grandfather's arrest, his watch was found lying on the porch at the front door of his dwelling. It was wrapped in a sheet of letter paper, bearing the name of Elizabeth Bartine, his only daughter, my grandmother. I am wearing that watch. Bartine paused. His usually restless black eyes were staring fixedly into the grate, a point of red light in each reflecting from the glowing coals. He seemed to have forgotten my existence. A sudden threshing of the branches of a tree outside one of the windows, and almost at the same instant a rattle of rain against the glass, recalled him to a sense of his surroundings. A storm had risen, heralded by a single gust of wind, and in a few moments the steady splash of the water on the pavement was distinctly audible. I hardly know why I relate that incident. It seemed somehow to have a certain significance and relevancy which I am enabled now to discern. It at least added an element of seriousness, almost solemnity. Bartine resumed. I have a singular feeling towards this watch, a kind of affection for it. I like to have it about me, though partly from its weight and partly for a reason that I shall now explain. I seldom carry it. The reason is this. Every evening when I have it with me, I feel an unaccountable desire to open it and consult it, even if I can think of no reason for wishing to know the time. 
but if I yield to it, the moment my eyes rest upon the dial, I am filled with a mysterious apprehension, a sense of imminent calamity. And this is the more unsupportable the nearer it is to eleven o'clock. By this watch, no matter what the actual hour may be. After the hands have registered eleven, the desire to look is gone. I am entirely indifferent. But then I can consult the thing as often as I like, with no more emotion than you feel in looking at your own. Naturally, I have trained myself not to look at that watch in the evening before eleven. Nothing could induce me. Your insistence this evening upset me a trifle. I felt very much as I suppose an opium eater might feel if his yearning for his special and particular kind of hell were reinforced by opportunity and by advice. Now, that is my story, and I've told it in the interest of your trumpery science, but if on any evening hereafter you observe me wearing this damnable watch, and you have the thoughtfulness to ask me the hour, I shall beg leave to put you to the inconvenience of being knocked down. His humor did not amuse me. I could see that in relating his hallucination, he was again somewhat disturbed. His concluding smile was positively ghastly, and his eyes had resumed something more than their old restlessness. They shifted hither and thither about the room with apparent aimlessness, and I fancied had taken on a wild expression, such as is sometimes observed in cases of dementia. Perhaps this was my own imagination, but, at any rate, I was now persuaded that my friend was afflicted with a most singular monomania. Without, I trust, any abatement of my affectionate solicitude for him as a friend, I began to regard him as a patient rich in possibilities of profitable study. Why not? Had he not described his delusion in the interest of science? Ah, poor fellow, he was doing more for science than he knew. Not only his story, but himself was an evidence. I should cure him if I could, of course, but first I should make a little experiment in psychology. Nay, the experiment itself might be a step in his restoration. That is very frank and friendly of you, Bartine, I said cordially, and I am rather proud of your confidence. It is all very odd, certainly. Do you mind showing me the watch? He detached it from his waistcoat, chain and all, and passed it to me without a word. The case was of gold, very thick and strong, and curiously engraved. After examining the dial and observing that it was nearly twelve o'clock, I opened it at the back and was interested to observe an inner case of ivory, upon which was painted a miniature portrait in that exquisite and delicate manner which was in vogue during the eighteenth century. Why, bless my soul, I exclaimed, experiencing the keenest artistic delight. How under the sun did you get that done? I thought miniature painting on ivory was a lost art. That, he replied gravely, smiling, is not I. It is my excellent great-grandfather, the late Bramwell Olcott Bartine, Esquire of Virginia. He was younger than the latter, about my age, in fact, it is said to resemble me. Do you think so? Resemble you? I should say so, barring the costume, which I supposed you to have assumed out of compliment to the art, or for vraise melembans, so to say, and the no moustache. That face is yours in every feature, line, and expression. Nor more was said at that time. Bartine took a book from the table and began reading. I heard outside the incessant plash of the rain in the street. There was occasional hurried footfalls on the sidewalks, and once a slower, heavier tread seemed to cease at my door. A policeman, I thought, seeking shelter in a doorway. The boughs of the trees tapped significantly on the window panes, as if asking for admittance. I remember it all through these years and years of a wiser, graver life. Seeing myself unobserved, I took the old-fashioned watch key from the chain and t quickly turned back the hands of the watch the full hour. Then, closing the case, I handed Bartine his property and saw him replace it. 
I think you said, I began with assumed carelessness, that after eleven the sight of the dial no longer affects you, as it is now nearly twelve. Looking at my own timepiece, perhaps, if you don't resent my pursuit of proof, you will look at it now. He smiled good-humoredly, pulled out the watch again, and opened it, and instantly sprang to his feet with a cry that heaven has not had the mercy to permit me to forget. His eyes, their blackness strikingly intensified by the absolute pallor of his face, were fixed upon the watch, which he clutched in both hands. For some time he remained in that attitude, without uttering another sound. Then, in a voice that I should not have recognized as his, he said, Damn you, it is two minutes to eleven. I was not unprepared for some such outbreak, and, without rising, replied calmly enough, I beg your pardon. I must have misread your watch in setting my own by it. He shut the case with a sharp snap, and put the watch in his pocket. He looked at me and made an attempt to smile, but his lower lip quivered, and he seemed unable to close his mouth. His hands, also, were shaking and he thrust them clenched into his coat pockets. The courageous spirit was manifestly endeavoring to subdue the coward body. The effort was too great. He began to sway from side to side, as from vertigo, and before I could spring from my chair to support him, his knees gave way, and he pitched awkwardly forward and fell upon his face, dead. The post-mortem examination disclosed nothing. Every organ was normal and sound. But when the body had been prepared for burial, a faint dark circle, as if made by contusion, was seemed to have developed about the neck, at least. I was so assured by several persons who said they saw it. But of my own knowledge, I cannot say if that was true. Nor can I affirm my knowledge for the limitations of the principle of heredity. I do not know that in the spiritual, as in the temporal, world, natural laws have no post facto validity. Surely, if I were to guess at the fate of Bramwell Olcott Bartine, I should guess that he was hanged at eleven o'clock in the evening, and that he had been allowed several hours in which to prepare for the change. As to John Bartine, my friend, my patient for five minutes, and, heaven forgive me, my victim for eternity, there is no more to say. He is buried, and his watch with him. I saw, too, that. May God rest his soul in paradise, and the soul of his unfortunate Virginian ancestor, if, indeed, they are two souls. Ambrose Beers End of Section 6 Read by Elijah Fisher Section 7 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Section 7. Two Wills by Anonymous. Dr. Brown had returned home late from a visit to one of his patients. It was a serious case doubly so for Brown, for not only had his notoriously sure diagnosis failed him in this case, but the patient was one of a family with which he had been on an intimate footing for years, and consequently his personal interest was awakened. The doctor saw no hope whatever for the sick woman. Since early morning he had hourly expected her death. Weary and dispirited, after a light and hasty supper, he sat down at his writing-table, and once more passed in review the whole course of his patient's illness. Every circumstance was recalled. Unaccountable, perfectly unaccountable, he murmured over and over again, and, with each repetition, he shook his gray head. Doctor, Brown started, up in alarm. He had not dreamed that anyone beside himself was in the room. As he looked up, he saw a lady standing by the door dressed in a peculiar nightrobe, with only a light shawl thrown over it. My God, what is that? It was indeed the subject of his thoughts. Amazed beyond expression, Brown sprang from his armchair and hastened toward the intruder. My dear madam, Mrs. Morley, in heaven's name, 
Why are you here? Never mind, doctor. Sit down and write what I tell you. Brown mechanically obeyed the command. There was something in the look and bearing of his visitor which forbade contradiction. Strangely thrilled, Brown took up his pen and wrote at her dictation the following words. I hereby direct that, in case of my death, my body be opened, and the cause of my illness and final demise be officially and authoritatively stated by a competent physician, I am convinced that I am poisoned, and that by my own husband, and only through such a statement as the aforesaid, will it be put out of his power to get possession of the property coming to my only child, his stepdaughter. My will relating to this property is in the hands of my lawyer, Mr. Bat, in London. Mr. Bat is, as I have unfortunately only lately discovered, a man open to bribery, and my husband counts upon this characteristic for the attainment of his object. That is to say, he hopes to induce this lawyer, by pure falsification, to make the will read in his favor. I believe he has already succeeded in doing this, for, when yesterday, I desired to see a lawyer of this town, in order to have him take down my last wishes, my husband put every obstacle in the way of his coming. I have put a sealed copy of my will in the double bottom of the little box which stands always upon the table at my bedside. The ostensible contents of the box are my daughter's first cap and a lock of my father's hair. Dr. Brown had driven his pen as if under the domination of a higher power. He was not conscious of having once lifted it from the paper to the inkstand, and yet there stood the written characters, black and clear, upon the white paper, and reminded him that he was not alone. Furthermore, that the head and heart, whose wish and request these characters had recorded, belonged to an existence which held his own being, thought, and will in its power. He made an heroic effort to regain the mastery of himself, and with a powerful shake, as if to free himself from the grasp of this strange will, he arose. Madam, I... Yes, but, doctor, the master sent me to tell you to come right away. Mrs. Morley has been lying for two hours like dead, and the master thinks it must be nearly over with her. Brown staggered back in amazement, and stared so vacantly at the waiting coachman that the man was struck dumb. Jan, where did you come from? Mrs. Morley is not yet... dead? No, doctor, not yet, but the master says she can't last much longer. Very well. You see to the horses, and I'll come right away. Dr. Brown put his hands to his head. He had need to convince himself by some such means of his own mortal existence. Then he seized his hat and coat and hurried after the coachman. Drawing his coat tightly about him, he leaned back in the corner of the carriage and racked his brain over this strange occurrence, but to no purpose. The doctor was a hard-headed, practical man, and if any one had related to him the events of the past day, he would have laughed him to scorn. But, earnestly, as he tried to do so now, it was impossible for him to conjure up a smile. The carriage stopped, and Mr. Morley was at the door to receive him. "'I'm glad you have come, doctor. I was afraid you would be too late. As the clock struck twelve, there was absolutely no breath nor pulse, and not until half an hour ago— did she seem to come back a little to life? She has just asked for you. These words were spoken outside the sick room door. The doctor laid aside his coat and went in, followed by Mr. Morley. The physician felt something like horror at being in the near presence of this man, who, since half an hour ago, had figured in his mind as the murder of his wife. And here, in the sick room, while looking upon the dying woman, in whose features he again saw plainly his recent guest, even here did he feel again that compelling force which had put the pen in his hand at home. The sick woman seemed to have been anxiously awaiting his coming, for her great, earnest eyes fastened themselves upon him as he entered the room and as he bent over her, he heard distinctly the low whispered words, "Doctor." 
my child. And in the same low whisper, Dr. Brown replied, I will see that your will is executed. Then he raised his head and encountered a look from those eyes which spoke a world of gratitude. And this was the last conscious look which lighted them. For, as Mr. Morley now softly approached, she looked wanderingly at him. And then her eyelids closed and her muscles relaxed. And with a gentle sigh, her heart ceased to beat. All is over said the doctor, as he stepped back to give place to the mourning husband, who threw himself down beside his wife. When he arose and turned toward the doctor, a tear glittered on his lashes. His voice was hoarse and tremulous when he thanked the physician for all the pains which he had taken during the long illness of his wife, concluding with, I shall never forget it. Dr. Brown only shook his head. He was thinking of the dead woman's will, and answered evasively, I could not have helped your wife much, since I never discovered the real cause of her illness. No self-reproaches, doctor. You did what you could, and whether this disease can be exactly diagnosed seems to me, from what I know of it, altogether doubtful. Every disease, replied the doctor, must finally disclose its cause to the patient and thorough investigator. But in this case, there were so many accompanying phenomena that it was quite impossible to discover the exact cause of the predominant disorder, at least in the living body. The doctor, as he said this, looked sharply at his companion, over whose countenance a slight cloud seemed to pass. Yet there was scarcely any discernible change in his voice as he replied, No, no, doctor, we won't do that. The beloved body was sufficiently tormented in life. In death, at least, it shall be at rest. Yes, but it was the wish of the dead. And isn't there any direction as to that in the will? No. Yet, perhaps, I don't know. Anyway, the will is to be read tomorrow. And should any such direction be found there, well, I suppose I shall have to carry it out. I will send immediately an announcement of the death to our attorney, Mr. Bad of London. You will be present at the opening of the will, will you not? Most certainly. The doctor during this conversation had again approached the bed of death. He carefully scrutinized the surroundings and, as if by an absent-minded manner, picked up a little box from the table which stood beside the bed and carelessly pushed back the cover. At the sight of the contents he could hardly restrain an exclamation, for there, exactly, as had been described to him, were a baby's cap, yellow with time, and a lock of hair, tied with a ribbon. "'Probably some of your wife's keepsakes,' he remarked, turning inquiringly to Morley. "'Yes, and as such they must be given into the hands of her daughter. "'Will you allow me?' the pleasure of sending them to her by my sister who is going to Switzerland tomorrow. I suppose it would be more proper that she should receive them at my hands, and yet, as I shall have to remain here for some time yet, and a journey home in her delicate state of health would be hard for the child, I shall be very much obliged to you if you will send them to her. Give her my blessing with them, and tell her that from this time forth I shall be more a father to her than ever. Dr. Brown thrust the little box deep into his breast pocket, and took his leave with the assurance that he would faithfully execute Mr. Morley's commission. Once at home, under the light of the lamp, he was not long in searching for the further contents of the box, and he was filled with both horror and astonishment as his search brought to light from beneath a cunningly contrived double floor, the will, as it had been described to him, a clear, correct copy. After this discovery, the doctor awaited with feverish anxiety the hour of the announced opening of the will. At last it arrived, and Brown had to acknowledge to himself that its contents agreed exactly with the copy in his hands until it came to the names of the heirs. Here appeared clearly and plainly, my daughter, Mara Dix, and there, just as plainly, my husband, John Morley. No directions with regard to an inquest or autopsy appeared therein. I demand proof of the genuineness of that will. 
rang loud and clear through the room. No one could imagine from whom the words proceeded. The will had been drawn up and carefully preserved by a prominent attorney in London, and the family involved was one of the first in the country. And now came this demand, which, as everybody knew, was an unmitigated insult. Who had brought it forward? The chairman looked all about the room. There he stood, Dr. Brown. He had again, quite unconsciously, come under the spell of that mysterious power, and in obedience to its behest, had called out those words. Now that they were spoken, he would not recall them. Standing upright, the doctor repeated, I demand an examination of the will. As he spoke, he had the comfortable feeling of having kept a promise. By what authority? asked the attorney. As the guardian of the deceased's daughter, have you anything to offer in support of this request? Yes, a copy of the original will. Will? And this has reference to an entirely different party. Allow me to look at the document. Dr. Brown handed over the copy. A committee retired with it to another room. On their return, the chairman announced that, in accordance with Dr. Brown's request, a preliminary examination of the will having been made, the judge had decided to enter a complaint against Attorney Bat of London for having falsified the will, and, at the same time, to place the property of the Harris at law under legal protection. Dr. Brown, have you anything further to say in the matter? I beg you will order an autopsy. On what grounds? It was the wish of the deceased. Is that your only reason? No, but because I have a strong suspicion that the deceased came to her death through slow and protracted poisoning. All present were filled with horror. Again the court withdrew, and again the decision was a fulfillment of the doctor's request. And when the verdict at the ensuing inquest was brought in, it was expressed in one word. Poison. End of Section 7. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 8 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Doctor's Red Lamp. Compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. A Doctor of the Old School. A General Practitioner. By Ian McLaren. Tromtochti was accustomed to break every law of health except wholesome food and fresh air, and yet had reduced the psalmist furthest limit to an average life rate. Our men made no difference in their clothes for summer or winter. Drumshew and one or two of the larger farmers condescending to a top coat on Sabbath as a penalty of their position, and without regard to temperature. They bore their blacks at a funeral, refusing to cover them with anything, out of respect to the deceased, and standing longest in the kirchyard, when the north wind was blowing across a hundred miles of snow. But the rain was pouring at the junction, then Dramtochti stood two minutes longer through steer native dourness, till each man had a cascade from the tail of his coat, and hazarded the suggestion, halfway to kill Drummy, that it had been a bit scrowy, a scrowy being as far short of a shure as a shure fell below wheat. This sustained defiance of the elements, provoked occasional judgments in the shape of a hoost, cough, and the head of the house was then exhorted by his womenfolk to change his feet if he happened to walk through a barren on his way home, and was pestered generally with sanitary precautions. It is right to add that the good man treated such advice with contempt, regarding it as suitable for the effeminacy of towns, but not seriously intended for Dramtochti. Sandy Stewart napped stones on the road in his shirt sleeves, wet or fair summer and winter, till he was persuaded to retire from active duty at eighty-five, and he spent ten years more in regretting his hastiness and criticising his successor. The ordinary course of life, with fine air and contented minds, was to do a full share of work till seventy, and then to look after other jobs till well into the eighties, and to slip a while within sight of ninety. 
persons above 90 were understood to be acquitting themselves with credit and assumed airs of authority, brushing aside the opinions of 70 as immature and confirming their conclusions with illustrations drawn from the end of the last century. When Hillock's brother so far forgot himself to slip a wire at 60, that worthy man was scandalised and offered laboured explanations at the burial. It's an awful business, only way you look at it, and a sad trial to us all. I never heard a tell us such a thing in our family afore, and it's no easy accounting for it. The good wife was saying he was never the same since a wheat nicht he lost himself on the moor and slept below a bush, but that's neither here nor there. I'm thinking he sapped his constitution the twa years he was grieve about England. That was thirty years same, but you're near the same after the foreign climates. Drumtochty listened patiently to Hillock's apologia, but was not satisfied. It's clean hovers about the moor. Losh keeps. We've a sleep of doot and ne'er been ahead of the war. I admit that England may have done the job. It's no canny stravagant, yon we fray place to place. But Drums ne'er complained to me as if he'd been nipped in the sooth. The parish had, in fact, lost confidence in Drums after his wayward experiment with a potato-digging machine, which turned out a lamentable failure, and his premature departure confirmed our vague impression of his character. Is a war new, Drums Hook summed up, after opinion had time to form. And there were war folk than Drums, but there's nae doot he was if we flichty. When Illness had the audacity to attack a Drumtochty man, who was described as a whoop, and was treated by the men with a fine negligence. Hillox was sitting in the post office one afternoon when I looked in for my letters, and the right side of his face was blazing red. His subject of discourse was the prospects of the turn at Breer, but he casually explained that he was waiting for medical advice. The good wife is keeping up a ding-dong frae morning till nicht about my face, and I'm fair deaved, so I'm watching for McClure to get a bottle when he comes west. Yon's him no. The doctor made his diagnosis from horseback on sight, and stated the result with that admirable clearness which endeared him to Drumtochty. Confound ye, Helix! What are ye ploitering about here in the wheat we are faced like a boiled beet? Div ye have no ken that ye have a titch of the rose? And och te be in the hoose? Ye aim we are for ye leave the bit and send a halflin for some medicine. Ye darned idiot! Are ye ettling te follow drums afore ye time? And the medical attendant of Drumtochty continued his invective till Hillock started and still pursued his retreating figure with medical directions of a simple and practical character. I'm watching, and pity ye if ye pit off time. Keep your bed the morning, and dinner show your face in the fields till I see ye. I'll gi ye a cry on Monday. Sick an old fool. But there's no ain of them to mind a nither in the hale parish. Hillock's wife informed the kirkyard that Dr. Gied the good man an awful clearing and that Hillox was keeping the hoose, which meant that the patient had tea breakfast, and at that time was wandering about the farm buildings in an easy undress with his head in a plaid. It was impossible for a doctor to earn even the most modest competence from a people of such scandalous health, and so McClure had annexed neighbouring parishes. His house, little more than a cottage, stood on the roadside among the pines towards the head of our glen, and from this base of operations he dominated the wild glen that broke the wall of the Grampians above Dromtochty, where the snowdrifts were twelve feet deep in winter, and the only way of passage at times was the channel of the river. In the moorland district westwards till he came to the Dunley sphere of influence, where there were four doctors and a hydropathic. Dromtochty in its length, which was eight miles, and its breadth, which was four, lay in his hand. Besides a glen behind, unknown to the world, which in the night-time he visited at risk of life, for the way there too was across the big moor with its peat-holes and treacherous bogs. Then he held the land eastwards towards Moortown, as far as Giordi. The Romtochti post travelled every day, and could carry word that the doctor was wanted. He did his best for the need of every man, woman and child in this wild straggling district, year in and year out, in the snow and in the heat, in the dark and in the light, without rest and without holiday, 
for forty years. One horse could not do the work of this man, but we liked best to see him on his old white mare, who died the week after her master, and the passing of the two did our hearts good. It was not that he rode beautifully, for he broke every canon of art, flying with his arms, stooping till he seemed to be speaking in Jess's ears, and rising in the saddle above all necessity. But he could ride faster, stay longer in the saddle, and had a firmer grip with his knees than any one I ever met. And it was all for mercy's sake. When the reapers in harvest time saw a figure whirling past in a cloud of dust, or the family at the foot of Glen Urtach, gathered around the fire in a winter's night, heard the rattle of a horse's hoofs on the road, or the shepherds out after the sheep traced a black speck moving across the snow to the upper glen, they knew it was the doctor, and without being conscious of it, wished him Godspeed. Before and behind his saddle were strapped the instruments and medicines the doctor might want, for he never knew what was before him. There were no specialists in Dromtochti, so this man had to do everything as best he could, and as quickly. He was chest doctor and doctor for every other organ as well. He was a coucheur and surgeon. He was oculist and aurist. He was dentist and chloroformist, besides being chemist and druggist. He was often told how he was far up Glen Urtach when the feeders of the threshing mill caught young Burnbray, and how when he stopped to change horses at his house, galloped all the way to Burnbray, and flung himself off his horse and amputated the arm and saved the lad's life. You would have thought that every minute was an error, said Jamie Sultar, who had been at the threshing, and I'll never forget the poor lad lying as white as death on the floor of the loft, with his head on a sheaf, and Burnbray holding the bandage tight and praying all the while, and the wither greeting in the corner. Will he never come? she cries, and I heard the sound of the horse's feet on the road a mile away in the frosty air. The Lord be praised, said Bunbury, and a slip it down the ladder as the doctor came scalping into the close, the foam fleeing from his horse's mouth. Where is he? was all that passed his lips, and in five minutes he had him on the feeding board and was at his work. Sick work, neighbours, but he did it well. And I thing her thought rail thought all of him. He first sent off the lady's mirror to get a bed ready. No, that's finished, and his constitution the day the rest. He carried the lad down the ladder in his arms like a bairn. He laid him in his bed. He waits aside until he was sleeping. And then says he, Burnbury, you're a gay lad, ne'er to say. Golly, will you lick? For I have na tasted meat for sixteen hours. It was mighty to say him come into their yard that day, neighbours. The very look on him was victory. Jamie's cynicism slipped off in the enthusiasm of this reminiscence and he expressed the feeling of Dromtochti. No one sat for McClure saving great straits, and the sight of him put courage in sinking hearts. But this was not by the grace of his appearance, or the advantage of a good bedside manner. A tall, gaunt, loosely made man, without an ounce of superfluous flesh on his body, his face burned a dark brick colour by constant exposure to the weather, red hair and beard turning grey, honest blue eyes that looked you ever in the face, huge hands with wrist bones like the shank of a ham, and a voice that hurled his salutations across two fields. He suggested the moor rather than the drawing room. But what a clever hand it was in an operation, as delicate as a woman's, and what a kindly voice it was in the humble room where the shepherd's wife was weeping by her man's bedside. He was ill pitten together to begin with, but many of his physical defects were the penalties of his work and endeared him to the glen. That ugly scar that cut into his right eyebrow and gave him such a sinister expression was got one night Jess slipped on the ice and laid him insensible eight miles from home. His limp marked the big snowstorm in the fifties when his horse missed the road in Glen Urtach and they rolled together in a drift. Milkur escaped with a broken leg and the fracture of three ribs, but he never walked like another man again. He could not swing himself into the saddle without making two attempts and holding Jess's mane. Neither can you warsel through the peat bogs and snowy drifts for forty winters without a touch of rheumatism. But they were honourable scars, and for such risks of life men get the Victoria Cross in other fields. McClure got nothing but the secret affection of the Glen, which knew that none had ever done one-tenth as much for it as this ungainly, twisted, battered figure. And I have seen a drum face soften at the sight of McClure limping to his horse. 
Mr. Hobbs earned the ill will of the Glen for ever by criticising the doctor's dress, but indeed it would have filled any townsman with amazement. Black he wore once a year on Sacrament Sunday, and if possible at a funeral. Topcoat to waterproof never. His jacket and waistcoat were rough homespun of Glen Urtach wool, which threw off the wet like a duck's back, and below he was clad in shepherd's tartan trousers, which disappeared into unpolished riding boots. His shirt was grey flannel, and he was uncertain about a collar, but certain as to a tie, which he never had, his beard doing instead, and his hat was soft felt to four colours and seven different shapes. His point of distinction in dress was the trousers, and they were the subject of unending speculation. Some threep that he's worn the identical pair the last twenty year, and I mind myself is a getting a tear ant when he was crossing o'er palin and the men still visible. The others declare he's got a wab of cloth, and he's a new pair made of muretan ants in the twa year maybe, and keeps them in the garden till the new look wears off. For my own part, so ta used to declare, I canna make up my mind. But there's a thing sure, the Glen would not like to see him without him. It would be a shock to her confidence. There's no muckle o' the check left, but you can e'er tell it, and when you see their breaks coming in, you can that if human power can save your baron's life, it'll be done. The confidence of the Glen and tributary states was unbounded, and rested partly on long experience of the doctor's resources, and partly on his hereditary connection. His father was here before him, Mrs. McFadgen used to explain. Atween them, they've had the countryside for well on tear century. If McClure does not understand or a constitution, how does? I would like to ask. For Drum Tochty had its own constitution, and a special throat disease as became a parish which was quite self-contained between the woods and the hills, and not dependent on the lowlands either for its diseases or its doctors. He's a skilly man, Dr. McClure, continued my friend, Mrs. McFadgen, whose judgment on sermons or anything else was seldom at fault, and a kind heritage, though of course he is his foot like us all, and he does not trouble the kirk often. Ye yeah, I can tell what's wrong with your body, and maister you can put it to your right, and there's nae new fangled ways wi' him. A blister for the outside, and epsom salts for the inside is his work, and they say there's no an air upon the hills he does not ken. If we're to dee, we're to dee, and if we're to leave, we're to leave, concluded Elspeth with sound Calvinistic logic. But I'll say this for the doctor, that whether you're to leave or dee, he aye can keep up a sharp mixture on the skin. But he's no very civil gin you bring him where there's naething wrong, and Mrs. McFadgen's face reflected another of Mr. Hopp's misadventures in which Hillocks held the copyright. Hope's laddie et grossats, till they had to sit up a nicht wi' him, and nothing would do but the mon air the doctor, and he writes immediately on a sleepy paper. Well, McClure had been away the nicht wi' a shepherd's wife, Dunleithwe, and he comes here wi' a drawing bridle, moored up to ain. What's it eh here, Hillux? he cries. It's no an accident, is it? When he got off his horse, he could hardly stand with stiffness and tire. It's none of us, Doctor, it's Hop's laddie. He's been eating all money berries. If he didna turn on me like a tiger. Div ye mean to say? Wished, wished, and I tried to quiet him, for Hop's was gimmin out. Well, Doctor, begins he as brisk as a magpie, you're here at last. There's no hurry with you, Scotchman. My boy's been sick all night, and I've never had one wink of sleep. You might have come a little quicker, that's all I've got to say. We've mair to day and drum tochty than attend every baron that he's a sair stomach, and I saw Beclure was roused. I'm astonished to hear you speak. Our doctor at home always says to Mrs. Ops, Look on me as a family friend, Mrs. Ops, and send for me, though it only be a headache. Be mere spare an o'er his office if he had four and twenty mile to look after. There's nothing wrong with your laddie but greed. Give him a good dose of castor oil, and stop his meat for a day, and he'll be as right to the morn. He'll not take castor oil, doctor. We've given up those barbarous medicines. 
What in a kind of medicines have you known in the South? Well, you see, Dr. McClure, we're homeopathists, and I've my little chest here, and out hopes comes we as boxy. Let's see it. And McClure sits down and takes out the bit bottles, and he reads the name we lock every time. Belladonna, did you ever hear the like? Aconite, it calls all. Nox formica, what next? Well, my money, he says to Hopps, it's a fine ploy, and you'll better gang on with the Nox till it's done, and give him any other of the sweeties he fancies. No, he looks, I mun be off to say Drom Hugh's grief, for he's doing with a fever, and it's tae to be a toy fecht. I hae no time wi- to wait for dinner. Give me some cheese and cake in my hand, and Jess'll take a pail of meal and water. Fee, I'm no a wanting your fees, man. We are that box of your dinner, your doctor. Na, na, gi a sail to some poor body, Mr. Harps, and he was doing the road as hard as he could lick. His fees were pretty much what the folk chose to give him, and he collected them once a year at Kildrummy Fair. Weel, doctor, what am I owing ye for the wife and bairn? You'll need three notes for that night you stayed in the house and all the visits. Evis, McClure would answer. Price is a low, I'm hearing. Give us thirty shillings. No, I don't know, or the wife will take my ears off. And it was set up for two pounds. Lord Kilspindy gave him a free house and fields, and one way or other, Drumshuch told me, the doctor might get in about a hundred and fifty pounds a year, out of which he had to pay his old housekeeper's wages and a boy's and keep two horses, besides the cost of instruments and books, which he bought through a friend in Edinburgh with much judgment. There was only one man who ever complained of the doctor's charges, and that was the new farmer of Milton, who was so good that he was above both churches, and held a meeting in his barn. It was Milton, the Glen, supposed at first to be a Mormon, but I can't go into that now. He offered McClure a pound less than he asked, and two tracts, whereupon McClure expressed his opinion of Milton, both from a theological and social standpoint, with such vigour and frankness that an attentive audience of the Rontokti men could hardly contain himself. Jamie Sutar was selling his pig at the time and missed the meeting, but he hastened to condole with Milton, who was complaining everywhere of the doctor's language. He did right to resist him. It'll maybe roast the glen to make a stand. He fair odds them in bondage. Thirty shillings for twelve visits, and him no more than seven miles away, and I'm telt there were no more than four at night. Ye lay the sympathy o' the glen, for our body kens ye as free we a siller as ye tracts. Wist beware of good works, ye offered him. Man, ye chose it will. For he's been collecting same money thae forty years, I'm afeard for him. I've often thought our duct is little better than the good Samaritan, and the Pharisees didn't think muckle of his chance either in the world, or that which is to come. End of section 8「Section 9 of the Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Val Roth. The Doctor's Red Lamp. Compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. The Various Tempers of Grandmother Gregg. By Ruth McHenry Stewart. When the doctor drove by the Gregg farm about dusk and saw old Deacon Gregg perched cross-legged upon his own gatepost, he knew that something was wrong within, and he could not resist the temptation to drive up and speak to the old man. It was common talk in the neighborhood that when Grandmother Gregg made things too warm for him indoors, the good man, her spouse, was wont to stroll out to the front gate to take this exalted seat. Indeed, it was said by a certain Mrs. Frequent, a neighbor of prime proclivities and ungentle speech, that the deacon's wife sent him there as a punishment for misdemeanors. Furthermore, this same Mrs. Frequent did even go so far as to watch for the deacon, 
and when she would see him laboriously rise and resignedly poise himself upon the narrow area, she would remark, Well, I see Grandma Greg's got the old man punished again. Wonder what he's been up to now. Her constant repetition of the unkind charge finally gained for it such credence that the diminutive figure upon the gatepost became an object of mingled sympathy and mirth in the popular regard. The old doctor was the friend of a lifetime, and he was sincerely attached to the deacon, and when he turned his horse's head toward the gate this evening, he felt his heart go out in sympathy to the old man endurance vile upon his lonely perch. But he had barely started to the gate when he heard a voice which he recognized as the deacon's, whereupon he would have hurried away had not his horse committed to his first impulse by unequivocally facing the gate. "'I know three's a crowd,' he called out cheerfully as he presently drew rein. "'But I ain't a-going to stay. I just... Why, where's Grandma?' he added abruptly, seeing the old man alone. I'm sure I heard. You just heard me a talking to myself, Doctor. Or not to myself exactly, neither. That is to say, when you come up, I was addressing my remarks to this here Bill. Bill? I don't see no Bill. The doctor drew his buggy nearer. He was a little deaf. No, I said this pale doctor. I'm a holding of it, here in my palm of my hand, and studying it over it. What's she a-dosin' you for now, Enoch? The doctor always called the deacon by his first name when he approached him in sympathy. He did not know it, neither did the deacon, but he felt the sympathy and it unlocked the portals of his heart. Well, the old man's voice softened. She thinks I stand in need of him, of course. The fact is that yaller spotted steer run again or clothesline twice today, drug the whole week's washing in the ground, and then trumped on it. She's inside, a-wrenching and a-starching him over now. And right on top of that, I come in looking sort of puny and a peaked, and I happened to choke on a mosquito just as I come in. And she declared she wasn't going to have a consumpted man sick on her hands and a clothes-destroying steer at the same time. And with that, she up and wiped her hands on her apron and went and selected this here pill out of a bottle of assorted sizes and instructed me to take it. There never was a thing done so deliberate and kind. Never on earth. But, of course, you and she know how it plagues me to take physic. You could mold out ice cream and little pill shapes, and it would guide me, even if it was vanilla-flavored. And so, when I received it, why, I just came out here to meditate. You can see it from where you sit, Doctor. It's a pretty sizable one, and I'm mighty suspicious of it. The doctor cleared his throat. Yes, I can see it, Enoch, of course. Could you judge it, Doctor? That is, of its capabilities, I mean. Why, no, of course not. Not unless I'd taste it. And you can do that as well as I can. If it's quinine, it'll be bitter. And if it's soggy and... Don't explain no more, Doctor. Can't stand it. I suppose it's just as foolish to investigate the inwardness of a pill a person is bound to take as it would be to try and lift the veil of the future in any way. When I'm obligated to swallow one of them, I just take a swig of old good spring water and repeat a potion of the scripture and commit myself unto the Lord. I always seem foreordained to choke to death, but I notice that if I recover from the first spell of suffocation, I always come through. But I ain't never took one yet that I didn't in a manner prepare to die. Then I wouldn't take it, Enoch. Don't do it. The doctor cleared his throat again, but this time he had no trouble to keep the corners of his mouth down. His sympathy robbed him for the time of the humor in the situation. No, I wouldn't do it. D doggone if I would. The deacon looked into the palm of his hand and sighed. Oh, yeah, I reckon I better take it, he said mildly. If I don't stand in need of it now, maybe the good Lord'll stow it up in my system some way against a future attack. Well, the doctor reached for his whip. Well, I wouldn't do it. Steer or no steer. 
Oh, yes, I reckon you would, doctor, if you had a wife as worried over a wash tub as what mine is, and I had an extra shirt in wash this week, too. One little pill ain't much when you take into how she's been tantalized. The doctor laughed outright. Tell you what you do, we knock. Fling it away and don't let on. She don't question you, does she? No, she ain't never to say question me, but, well, I tried that once. Sampled a bitter white capsule she give me, put it down for quinine and flung it away. And then I chirped up and said I felt a heat better. And that wasn't no lie, which I suppose was on account of the relief to my mind, which it always did seem to me capsules was just constructed to lodge in a person's air passages. Well, I take a notice that she'd look at me, key now and again, and then glance at the clock, and checkly I see her fill the guard dipper and go to her medicine cabinet. And then she come to me, and she says, says she, open your mouth. And of course I opened it. You see, that first capsule, as well as the one she had just administered, was mostly morphine, which she had given me to ward off an attack of the neuralgia she see approaching. And here I'd been trying to live up to the requirements of quinine, and wrestling severe with a sleepy spell, which, if I'd only knew it, would have saved me. Of course, after the second dose, I just let nature take its course, and Trackly, I commenced to doze off, and seemed like I was a feather bed, and wife had hung me on the fence to sun, and I remember how she seemed to be a whooping of me, but it didn't hurt. That was on account of it being goose-picking time, and she was worried with windy weather, and she trying to fill the feather beds. No, I won't never try to deceive her again. It never has seemed to me that she could have the same respect for me after catching me at it, though she ain't never referred to it but once. And that was the time I was elected deacon, and even then she didn't do it outspoke. She seemed mighty tender over it, and didn't no more than remind me that an officer in the Christian church ought to examine himself mighty conscientious and be sure he was free of deceit which seemed to me showed a heap of consideration. She ain't got a deceitful bone in her body, doctor. Why, bless her soul, Enoch. You know that I think the world and all of Grandma Greg. She's the salt of the earth, and rock salt at that. She's saved too many of my patients by her good nursing, in spite of my poor doctrine for me not to appreciate her. But that don't reconcile me to the way she doses you for her worries. It took me a long time to see that myself, Doctor. But I've reasoned it out this way. I suppose when she feels her temper rising, she's feared that she might be so took with her troubles that she'd neglect my health, and so she wards off any attack that might be coming on. I take a notice that time her strawberry preserves all soured on her hands, and she painted my face with iodine. A man did die of the Erisabellus down here at Battle Creek, and likely as not she'd heard of it. Sir, no, I didn't mention it at the time for fear she'd think best to lay on another coat, and I felt sort of disfigured with it. Why, faint a scolding woman. I'm thankful for that. And some of the peppermints and things she keeps to dole out to me when she's fretted with little things. Maybe her yeast'll refuse to rise, or a thunderstorm'll kill a setting of eggs. Why, they're so disguised that septin' that I know they're medicine. Well, Kitty, I reckon we better be a-goin'. The doctor tapped his horse. Be sure to give my love to Grandma, Enoch. And if you're bound to take that pill... Of course, I can't no more and speculate about it at this distance, but I'd advise you to keep clear of sours and acids for a day or so. Don't think because your teeth are all adjustable that none of your other functions ain't open to salvation. Good night, Enoch. Oh, she always looks after that, Doctor. She's mighty attentive. Come to withholding harmful temptations. Goodbye, Doctor. It's did me good to open my mind to you a little. 
Yes, he added, looking steadily into his palm as the buggy rolled away. Yes, it's did me good to talk to him, but I ain't no more reconciled to you, you bare-faced, high-foreheaded little roly-poly you. Funny how a pill that ain't got a feature on earth can look me out of countenance the way it can and frustrate my speech. Talk about white sepulchres and ravening wolves. I don't know how come I to let on that I was feeling puny tonight, no how. I might a knew with all them clothes he buckled over, though I can't, as the doctor says, see how me a taking a pill is going to help matters. But of course I would let on to him, and he's a bachelor. He stopped talking and felt his rest. Maybe my pulse is obstropulous, not to be sedated down. Reckon I'll have to kill that steer, or sell him, one though I swore I wouldn't. But of course I swore that in a temper, and temperate vows ain't never made septin' to be repented of. Several times during the last few minutes while the deacon spoke, there had come to him across the garden from the kitchen the unmistakable odor of fried chicken. He had foreseen there would be a good supper tonight, and that the tiny globule within his palm would constitute for him a prohibition concerning it. Grandmother Gregg was one of those worthy, if difficult, women who never let anything interfere with her duty as she saw it, magnified by the lenses of pain or temper. It usually pleased her injured mood to make waffles on wash day, and the hen house owed many renovations, with a reckless upsetting of nests and roosts, to one of her splitting headaches. She would always wash her hair in view of impending company, although she averred that to wet her scalp never failed to bring on the neuralgia, and her neuralgia in turn meant medicine for the deacon. It was probably the doctor's timely advice, augmented possibly by the potencies of the frying pan, with a strong underlying sympathy with the worrying woman within. It was, no doubt, all these powers combined that suddenly surprised the hitherto complying husband into such unprecedented conduct that anyone knowing him in his old character and seeing him now would have thought that he had lost his mind. With a swift and brave fling, he threw the pill far into the night. Then, in an access of energy born of internal panic, he slid nimbly from his perch and started in a steady jog-trot into the road, wiping away the tears as he went and stammering between sobs as he stumbled over the ruts. No, I won't. Yes, I will, too. Doggone shame. And she's fretting her life out. Of course, I sell him for anything he'll fetch. And I'll be a better man. Yes, yes, I will. But I won't swallow another one of them blame, not if I die for it. This report, taken in longhand by an amused listener by the roadside, is no doubt incomplete in its ejaculatory form, but it has at least the value of accuracy, so far as it goes, which may be had only from a verbatim transcript. It was perhaps three-quarters of an hour later when Enoch entered the kitchen, wiping his face, nervous, weary, embarrassed. Supper was on the table, the blue border dish heaped with side bones and second joints done to a turn was moved to a side station, while in its accustomed place before Enoch's plate there sat an ominous bowl of gruel. The old man did not look at the table, but he saw it all. He would have realized it with his eyes shut. Domestic history as well as that of greater principalities and powers, often repeats itself. Enoch's fingers trembled as he came near his wife, and standing with his back to the table, he began to untie a broad, flat parcel that he had brought in under his arm. She paused in one of her trips between the table and stove and regarded him askance. Reckon I'll have to light the lantern before I set down to eat, wife, he said by way of introduction. Israel'll be along directly to rope that steer. I've done sold him. The good woman laid her dish upon the table and returned to the stove. 
Wish you'd have sold him a day before yesterday. I'd have had a heap less pain in my shoulder blade. She sniffed as she said it, and then she added, That gruel ought to be at warm. By this time, the parcel was open. There was a brief display of colored zephyrs and gleaming cardboard. Then Enoch began rewrapping them. Reckon you can look these over in the morning, wife. They are just a few new cross-stitch Bible texts, and I know you like scripture martyrs. Where'll I lay them, wife? Will I go out and tent to lighten that lantern? I told Israel I'd set it to the stable door so he could get that steer out of the way of Egypt. The proposal to lay the mottos aside was a master stroke. The aggrieved wife had already begun to wipe her hands on her apron. Still, she would not seem too easily appeased. I do hope you ain't gone and turned that whole steer into perforated paper, Enoch, even if tis Bible texted over. Thus she guarded her dignity. But even as she spoke, she took the parcel from his hands. This was encouragement enough. It presaged a thawing out. And after Enoch had gone out to light the lantern, it would have amused a sympathetic observer to watch her gradual melting as she looked over the mottoes. A virtuous wife is far above rubies. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Better a dinner of herbs where love is. She read them over and over. Then she laid them aside and looked at Enoch's plate. Then she looked at the chicken dish, and then at the bowl of gruel which she had carefully set on the back of the stove to keep warm. Don't know as it would hurt him any if I thickened that gruel up into mush. He's took such a distaste to soft food since he's got that new set. She rose as she spoke, poured the gruel back into the pot, sifted and mixed a spoonful of meal and stirred it in. This done, she hesitated, glanced at the pile of mottos and reflected. Then, with a sudden resolve, she seized the milk pitcher, filled a cup from it, poured the milk into the little pot of mush, hastily whipped up two eggs with some sugar, added the mixture to the pot, returned the whole to the yellow bowl and set it in the oven to brown. And just then Enoch came in and approached the water shelf. Don't care how you polish it. A brass lantern and coal lyle is like murder on a man's hands. It will out. He was thinking of the gruel and putting off the evil hour. It had been his intention to boldly announce that he hadn't taken his medicine that he never would again unless he needed it. And moreover, he was going to eat his supper tonight and always, as long as God should spare him, etc., etc., etc. But he had no sooner found himself in the presence of long-confessed superior powers than he knew he would never do any of these things. His wife was thinking of the gruel, too, when she encouraged delay by remarking that he would better rest up a bit before eating. And I reckon you better soak your hands good. Take a pinch of the bran out of the sight to him, she said. And if that don't do, the Florida water's in my bureau. When finally Enoch presented himself ready for his fate, she was able to set the mush pudding done to a fine brown before him, and her tone was really tender as she said, this ain't very hearty if you're hungry, but you can add it all. There ain't no interference in it with anything you've took. The pudding was one of Enoch's favorite dishes, but as he broke its brown surface with his spoon, he felt like a hypocrite. He took one long breath, and then he said, By the way, wife, this reminds me. I reckon you'll have to fetch me another of them pills. I dropped that one out in the grass, that is, if you think I still stand in need of it. I feel considerable better than I did when I come in this evening. The good woman eyed him suspiciously a minute. Then her eyes fell upon the words, Above rubies, lying on the table. Reaching over, she lifted the pudding bowl aside, took the dish of fried chicken from its substation, and set it before her lord. Better save that pudding for dessert, honey. 
and help yourself to some of the chicken and take a potato and a roll and eat a couple of them spring onions. They're the first we've had. Sounds you're a feeling better. Maybe it's just as well that you mislaid that pill. The wind blows sometimes from the east in Simpkinsville, as elsewhere, and there are still occasional days when the deacon betakes himself to the front gate and sits like a 19th century Simon Stillites on his pillar, contemplating the open palm of his own hand, while he enriches Mrs. Frequent's repertoire of gossip by a picturesque item. But the reverse of the picture has much of joy in it, for in spite of her various tempers, Grandmother Greg is a warm-hearted soul. And she loves her man. And he loves her. Listen to him tonight, for instance, as having finished his supper, he remarks, And I'm a-going to see to it from this on, that you ain't fretted with things as you've been, if I can help it, wife. Sometimes, the way I act... I seem like as if I forget you're all I got on earth. Of course I realize that, Enoch, she replies. We're each one all the other's got. And that's why I don't spare no pains to keep you in health. End of section nine. Section 10 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Barrer by Margaret Oliphant. Chapter 1. Dr. Barrer was a young man who was beginning to make his way. In the medical profession, as in most others, this is not a very easy thing to do, and no doubt he had made some mistakes. He had given offense in his first practice to the principal person in the little town where he had set up his surgery by explaining that certain symptoms which his patient believed to mean heart disease were due solely to indigestion. And he still more deeply offended that gentleman's wife by telling her that her children were overfed. These are follies which a more experienced medical man would never commit, but this one was young and fresh from those studies in which, more than in any other profession, things have to be called by their right names. In his next attempt, he had nearly got into more serious trouble still by his devotion to an interesting and difficult case in which, unfortunately, the patient was a woman. From this he came out clear, with no stain on his character, as magistrates say. But for a doctor, as often for a woman, it is enough that evil has been said. The slander, though without proof, has more or less a sting, and is recollected when all the circumstances, the disproval, the clearing up, even the facts of the case, have been forgotten. He was, therefore, not without experience when he came to settle in the great town of Poolborough, which might be supposed large enough and busy enough to take no note of those village lies and tempests in a teapot, and this proved to be the case. He was young, he was clever, he was au courant of all the medical discoveries, knew everything that had been discovered by other men, and was not without little discoveries and inventions of his own. He was still young, a few years over thirty, at the age which combines the advantages of youth and of maturity, strong in mind and in body, loving work, and fearing nothing. If his previous encounters with the foolish side of humanity had diminished in some degree his faith in it, and opened his eyes to the risks which those who think no evil are apt to run in their first conflict with the stupidities and base ideas of men, he had yet not suffered enough to make him bitter, or more than wary in his dealings with the narrow and uncomprehending. He no longer felt sure of being understood, or that a true estimate of his intentions and motives was certain. But he did not go to the opposite extreme, as some do, and take it for granted that his patients and their surroundings were incapable of doing him justice. He was sobered, but not embittered. He was wise enough neither to show too much interest, nor to betray too great an indifference. 
He listened seriously to the tale of symptoms which were nothing to anybody but their narrator, and he restrained his excitement when a matter of real importance, something delicate and critical, came under his view. Thus it was proved that he had learned his lesson. But he did not despise his fellow creatures in general, or think all alike guilty of affectation and self-regard, which showed that he had not learned that lesson with extravagance. He was kind, but not too kind. He was clever, but not so clever as to get the alarming character of an experimentalist. In short, he was in every way doing well and promising well when the untoward accident occurred, which cut short his career in Poolborough, where he was universally well thought of and looked upon as a rising man. It may be well before going further to indicate certain particulars in his antecedents which throw light upon Dr. Barrere's character and idiosyncrasies. He was of French origin, as may be perceived by his name. The name was not so distinctly French as held by his father and grandfather, who ignored the nationality and wrote it phonetically, Barrere. In their days, perhaps, a French origin was not an advantage. But in the days when Arnold Barrere was at college, this prejudice had disappeared, and he was himself delighted to resort to the old orthography, and liked his friends to remember the accent which it pleased him to employ. Perhaps the keen, logical tendency of his mind and disposition to carry everything out to its legitimate conclusion with a severity which the English love of compromise and accident prevents, were more important signs of his origin than even the accent over the E. Dr. Barrere, for his part, did not like to elude the right and logical ending either of an accent or a disease. It annoyed him even that his patient should recover in an irregular way. He liked the symptoms to follow each other in proper sequence, and the end which was foreseen and evident was that which he preferred to have occur, even when the avoidance of it and deliverance of the sufferer were due to his own powers. Like his nation, or rather like the nations of his forefathers, he was disposed to carry out everything to its logical end. His outward man, like his mind, bore evidence of his parentage. He was about the middle height of a light and spare figure, with a thickly growing but short and carefully cropped black beard, his complexion rather dark but very clear, his voice somewhat high-pitched for an Englishman, with an animated manner, and a certain sympathetic action of head and hand when he talked, scarcely enough to be called gesticulation, yet more than usually accompanies English speech. He seemed, in short, to have missed the influence of the two generations of English mothers and manners, which might have been supposed to subdue all peculiarities of race, and to have stepped back to the immediate succession of that Arnold Barrere, who was the first to bring the name to this island. These individual features gave a certain piquancy, many people thought, to the really quite English breeding of the doctor, who had never so much as crossed the channel, and knew little more French than was consistent with a just placing of the accents, especially upon the letter E. It would be unnecessary to enter into full detail of how he formed acquaintance with the Surtees, and came to the degree of intimacy which soon developed into other thoughts. It is a proper thing enough in a story, though not very true to real life, to describe a young doctor as falling in love by a sick bed with the angel daughter who is the best nurse and ministrant that a sick parent can have. Members of the medical profession are not more prone than other men to mingle their affections with the requirements of their profession, and probably a devoted nurse is no more the ideal of a young doctor than a good model is that of a painter. As a matter of fact, however, it was while attending Mrs. Surtees through a not very dangerous or interesting illness that Dr. Barrere made the acquaintance of Agnes. He might just as well have met her in the society which he frequented sparingly, for there was no particular difference in her sphere and his, but there were reasons why Miss Surtees went out little, less than most young women of her age. Her family was one of those which had ranked amongst the best in Poolborough in the time of their wealth, and no one could say, still, that their place was not with the best people of the town. 
But with a mercantile community more than any other, though also more or less in every other, wealth is necessary for the retaining of that position. Women who go afoot cannot keep up with those who have carriages and horses at their command. Neither can a girl in whose house no dances, no dinners, no entertainments are ever given associate long on easy terms with those who are in the full tide of everything, going everywhere, and exchanging hospitalities after the lavish fashion of wealthy commercial society. And this was not the only reason that kept Agnes Surtees out of the world. There was one more urgent which was told, and one which no one named but everyone understood. The first was the delicate health of her mother. Dr. Barrer was aware that there was not very much in this. He knew that had she been able to drive about as did the ladies who were so sorry for her, and clothe herself in furs and velvet, and take change of air whenever she felt disposed, there would have been little the matter with Mrs. Surtees. But he was too sensible to breathe a word on this subject. He held his tongue at first from discretion, and afterwards because he had found out for himself why it was that Mrs. Surtees' delicate health was kept before the public of Poolborough. It took him some time to make this discovery, but partly from hints of others, and partly from his own perceptions, he found it out at last. It was that these two ladies were involved in the life of a third member of their household, a son and brother whom the best people in Poolborough had ceased to invite, and whose name, when it was mentioned, was accompanied with shakings of the head and looks of disapproval. Dr. Barrere did not ever see Jim Surtees until he had been acquainted with his mother and sister for nearly a year. Not that he was absent, but only that his haunts and associates were not theirs. He was a young man who had never done well. He had been far more highly educated than was usual with the young men of Poolborough. Instead of being sent into the counting house in his youth, he had been sent to Cambridge, which was all his father's pride and folly, the critics said, exempting Mrs. Surtees from blame in a manner most unusual. It was supposed that she had disapproved. She had come of a Poolborough family, in business from father to son, and knew what was necessary. But Surtees was from the country, from a poor race of county people, and was disposed to think business beneath him, or at least consider it as a mere stepping stone to wealth. When he died so much less well off than was expected, leaving his family but poorly provided for, then was the moment when Jim Surtees might have proved what was in him, and stepped into the breach, replaced his mother and sister in their position, and restored the credit of his father's name. In that case, all the old friends would have rallied around him. They would have backed him up with their credit and given him every advantage. At such moments, and in such emergencies, mercantile men are at their best. No one would have refused the young man a helping hand. They would have hoisted him upon their shoulders into his father's place. They would have helped him largely, generously, manfully. Alas, Jim Surtees did then and there show what was in him. He had neither energy, nor spirit, nor ambition, nor any care for his father's name or his mother's comfort. He said at once that he knew nothing about business. What could he do? It was entirely out of his way. He scarcely knew what it was his father dealt in. Cotton? Yes. But what did he know about cotton, or bookkeeping, or anything? The young man was interviewed by all who knew him. He was sent for by the greatest merchants in Poolborough. What he ought to do was set before him by everybody who had any right to speak, and by a great many who had none. But nothing moved him. He knew nothing about business. He would do nothing in it. Why should he try what he could not do? And with these replies, he baffled all the anxious counselors who were so eager to convince him to the contrary. Then there were situations suggested, even provided for him, but these were all subject to the same objections. Finally, it came about that Jim Surtees did nothing. He had not been long enough at Cambridge to take his degree. He was modest about his own capacities, even when pupils were suggested to him. He did not know enough to teach, he declared, 
till his modesty drove the anxious advisers distracted. What was to be done? Jim Surtees eluded every expedient to make him do anything. At last he dropped altogether, and the best people in Poolborough were conscious of his existence no more. These were the circumstances of the Surtees family when Dr. Barrere made their acquaintance. He thought for some time that the two ladies lived alone, and that their withdrawal from society was somewhat absurd, based as it was on that delusion about Mrs. Surtees' health, but a little further information made him change his mind. He changed his mind about several things, modifying his first impressions as time went on. He had thought the mother one of those imaginary invalids who enjoy that gentle level of ill health which does not involve much suffering, and which furnishes a pretty and interesting role for many unoccupied women. And he had thought her daughter an angelic creature, whose faith in her mother's migraines was such that she cheerfully and sweetly gave up the pleasures of her youth in order to minister to them. But as Dr. Barrere changed from a doctor into a friend, as he began to ask admittance at times when he was not called for, and when, last seal of a growing intimacy, he began to venture to knock at the door in the evening after dinner, a privilege which he pleaded for as belonging to the habits of his French ancestry, of which he knew so little, his eyes were speedily opened to many things which a morning visitor would never have divined. The first time he did so, he perceived to his astonishment Agnes on the landing, half concealed by the turn of the staircase, eagerly looking down to see who it was, and her mother, though so little able to move about, was at the door of the little drawing-room looking flushed and wretched, far more ill than when he had been called in to prescribe for her. For whom was it that they were looking? It could not be for himself, whom nobody had expected, whom they received with a tremulous kindness, half relieved, half reluctant. After a few such visits, he began to see that the minds of these poor ladies were divided between pleasure in his society and fear to have him there. If he stayed a little longer than usual, he saw that they became anxious, the mother breathless, with a desire to have him go away, and that even Agnes would accompany him downstairs with an eager alacrity, as if she could not be comfortable till she had seen him out of the house. And yet they were always kind, liked him to come, looked for him, even would say a word which showed that they had noted his absence if for a week or so he did not appear. Although... While he was there, they were ever watchful, starting at every sound, hurrying him away if he stayed beyond his time. The sight of a tall figure lurching along the street, of someone fumbling with a latch key, of which he was sometimes conscious as he went away, was scarcely necessary at last to make him aware what it was that occasioned this anxiety. Mrs. Surtees saw love dawning in the doctor's eyes, she would not shut out from her patient girl the chances of a happier lot. But what if the doctor should meet Jim, see him coming home sodden and stupid, or noisy and gay? As Dr. Barrere became intimate, they had spoken to him of Jim. He was studying hard. He was writing. He was always busy. He was not fond of society. There were so many reasons why he should never appear, and by and by the doctor, with a great ache of pity, had learned all these excuses by heart, and penetrated their secret, and misconstrued their actions and habits no more. Finally, the doctor made the acquaintance of Jim, and to his great surprise not only liked him, but understood why the mother and sister were not always miserable how life varied with them from day to day, and how even Mrs. Surtees was often cheerful, though never unwatchful, never at ease. Dr. Barrere thought with justice that nothing could be more miserable, more inexcusable, than the life the young man was leading. In theory, fate should have put into every honest hand a whip to scourge such a good-for-nothing. And sometimes the doctor felt a righteous wrath, a desire to scourge till the blood came, but it was not so much out of moral indignation as out of an exasperated liking, an intolerable pity. What might happen in the house in those awful moments when all was silent 
and everybody at rest save the mother and sister watching for Jim's return at night. Neither the doctor nor anyone knew. But at other moments, Dr. Barrere found it impossible to resist, any more than the women did, the charm of a nature which had not lost its distinction, even in the haunts where he had lost everything else. He even tried to attract and draw to himself the prodigal, entertaining visions on the subject and fancying how, if there were a man closely connected with the family, himself, to wit, Arnold Barrere, and not merely women who wept and reproached and condoned and wept again, but never made a determined stand, nor struck a decisive blow, there might still be hope for Jim. It could not be said that this told as a motive in the fervor with which he offered himself to Agnes Surtees. The doctor was in love, warmly and honestly, and as he made his declaration thought, as a lover ought, of nothing but Agnes. Yet when she hesitated and faltered, and after a moment broke the long silence and spoke to him openly of her brother, there was the warmth of a personal desire in the eagerness with which he met her confessions halfway. "'Jim is no drawback,' he said eagerly. "'To me, none. I can help you with Jim. If you will have me, there shall be no question of depriving him of any love or care. He shall have me in addition to help him to better things.' Oh, Agnes had cried, giving him both her hands in the fervor of love and trust. God bless you, Arnold, for speaking of better things for Jim. And it was on this holy ground that their contract was made. Henceforward, there were no concealments from him. Dr. Barrere was not a man to let the grass grow under his feet. There was no reason why his marriage should be delayed. He wanted to have his wife a possession almost indispensable, he assured Mrs. Surtees, with a smile, to a medical man. And the mother, anxious to see one child's fate assured, and still more anxious, catching with feverish hope at the help so hopefully offered for the other, had no inclination to put obstacles in the way. The marriage day was settled, and all the preparations thereto begun, when the sudden horror, which still envelops the name of Surtees in Poolborough, arose in a moment, and the following incidents occurred to Dr. Barrere. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Barrere, by Margaret Oliphant. Chapter 2. He was going to visit a patient in a suburb one dark October night. But it could scarcely be called dark. There was a pallid moon somewhere among the clouds, whitening the heavy mist that lay over the half-built environs of the town. Dismal blank spaces, fields which were no longer fields, streets which were not yet streets. The atmosphere was charged with vapor, which in its turn was made into a dim, confusing whiteness by the hidden moon. Everybody knows how dismal are these outskirts of a great city. A house built here and there stood out with a sinister solidity against the blank around. New roads and streets laid out with indications of pavement cut across the ravaged fields. Here and there was a mass of bricks, and there a pool of water. A piece of ragged hedgerow, a remnant of its earlier state, still bordered the highway here and there. A forlorn tree, shedding its leaves at every breath of air, stood at the corner where two ways met. Dr. Barrere was no ways timid, but he felt a chill of isolation and something like danger as he pushed his way towards one of the furthest points of the uncompleted road where one house stood shivering in the vague damp and whiteness. He had to cross the other branching road, at the corner of which stood the shivering poplar, which shed its leaves as if with a perpetual shrinking of fear. There he was vaguely aware of something standing in the shade of the ragged hedgerow, a figure which moved as he passed, and seemed to make a step forward as if awaiting someone. 
To say that it was a figure he saw would be too distinct. He saw a movement, a something more solid than the mist, which detached itself as if with a suggestion of watchfulness, and immediately subsided again back into the shadows. Dr. Brer, though he was not timid, felt the thrill as of a possible danger, the suggestion having something in it more moving than a distincter peril. But if there was a man lurking there, waiting for some passer-by, it was not, at least for him, and he walked quickly on, and presently, in the interest of his patient, and in the many thoughts that hurry through every active brain, forgot the curious hint of mystery and danger, which had for a moment excited his imagination. When he approached the spot again, on his return, even the suggestion had died out of his mind. His eyesight and all his faculties were keen, as befits his profession, and he saw, without being aware that he was seeing, everything that came within his range of vision. Accordingly, he perceived without paying any attention the vague figure of a man crossing the opening of the road where the poplar marked the corner coming towards him. He saw the solid speck in the white mist approaching, then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this vague silhouette in the night became a sudden, swift scene of pantomimic tragedy, all done and over in a moment. A sudden movement took place in the scene. Another something, almost less than a shadow, suddenly came into it from behind the poplar. No, these words are too strong. What came into the night was the sound of a crashing blow and a fall, and another figure in a different position, standing over something prostrate, raining down as in a fit of frantic passion, blow on blow. Passion, murder, horror came in a second into the still confusion of the misty air. Then, swift as the sudden commotion, came a pause, a wild cry of consternation, as if for the first time the actor in this terrible momentary tragedy had become aware of what he was doing. The spectator's senses were so absorbed in the suddenness of the catastrophe that there was time enough for the whole drama to enact itself before he found voice. He had broken mechanically into a run and thought that he called out, but it was not it seemed to him, in the hurried progression of ideas, his cry, or the sound of his approach, but a sudden horror which had seized the man. Was he a murderer? Who had in a moment come to himself. When the doctor, at full speed, and calling out mechanically, automatically, for help, help, reached the spot where the prostrate figure was lying, the other had taken flight down the crossroad and was already invisible in the distance. The doctor's first care was for the victim. He was not an avenger of blood, but a healer of men. Presently there appeared around him two or three startled people, one from the nearest house carrying a small lamp, which made the strangest, weird appearance in the misty night, a passer-by on his way home, a vagrant from the deserted fields. They helped the doctor to turn over the murdered man, who was still living, but no more, and who, it was evident to Dr. Barrere's experienced eyes, was on the point of death and beyond all human help. The lamp had been placed on the ground close by, and sent up an odor of paraffin, along with the yellow rays that proceeded from its globe of light, and the figures kneeling and bending over the inanimate thing in the midst looked more like a group of murderers than people bringing help and succor. Some time had elapsed before the means of transporting him even to the nearest house had been procured, and by that time there was no longer any question of what could be done on his behalf, and all that was possible was to carry away the body. Dr. Barrere walked beside the melancholy convoy to the nearest police station where he made his deposition, and then he went home in all the tremor of excitement and mental commotion. He had fortunately no visits to pay that evening of any importance, but he was too much stirred and troubled to remain quietly at home, and after a while hurried out to Agnes, his natural confidant, to tell her all about the shock he had received. It struck him with surprise to see, when he entered the little drawing-room, that Jim was with his mother and sister. It was a thing that had very seldom happened before. 
He sat apart from them at the writing table where he was writing, or making believe to write, letters. The sight of him struck Dr. Barrere with a certain surprise, but he could not have told why. There was no reason why he should not be found in his mother's drawing-room. It was true that he was rarely to be seen there, but yet sometimes he would make his appearance. This evening he had dressed for dinner which was still more unusual. Perhaps he was going out to some late evening party. Perhaps someone had been expected to dinner. These thoughts flew vaguely through Dr. Barrere's mind. He could not have told why. There was no particular reason why he should thus desire to penetrate the motives of Jim Surtee's behavior, or to explain to himself why the young man was there. The speculation passed through his head without thought if such an expression may be used, without any volition of his, as half our thoughts do, like the chance flight of birds or butterflies across the air. They did not detain him a moment as he came forward with his greetings, and met the pleased surprise of the reception which the ladies gave him. "'I thought it was too late to look for you,' his Agnes said, with a brightening of all the soft lines of her face, as if the sun had risen upon a landscape. And then— as it was cold, a chair was drawn for him near the fire. "'You have been kept late on your round tonight,' said Mrs. Surtees. "'Have you any very anxious case?' "'It is no case that has kept me,' said the doctor. "'I have had a dreadful encounter in the road. "'You know that district up beyond St. George's in the fields, "'those half-built desolate villas and cottages? "'The roads are as lonely as if they were in the middle of a wood.' A new quarter by night is as bad as a bare moor. Agnes stood listening with her hand on the back of his chair, but still a smile upon her face, the smile of pleasure at his coming. Mrs. Surtees had let her knitting fall upon her lap, and was looking at him, listening with pleased interest. They had not perceived the agitation which, indeed, until he began to speak, he had managed to suppress. And what happened? Mrs. Surtees said. "'I have been,' he answered, his voice breaking in spite of himself, "'the witness of a murder. "'Good heavens!' "'The ladies were too much startled to put another question except with their eager eyes. "'They drew closer to him. "'The hand of Agnes glided to his shoulder from the back of his chair. "'What she thought first was that his emotion did honour to him. "'Then he described to them briefly what he had seen.' the lurking figure in the shadow which had alarmed himself as he passed first, but which he soon perceived had no hostile intentions towards him, the appearance of the man approaching from the opposite direction as he returned, the sudden assault, the rapid, breathless, horrible suddenness of the tragedy. The ladies hung upon his lips, making exclamations of horror. It was not till afterwards that Dr. Barrere became aware that the young man at the table behind made no sign, said not a word. He had told everything, and answered half a dozen hurried, faltering questions before Jim made any remark. Then he suddenly stirred behind backs, the group at the fireside having forgotten his presence, and asked, "'What are you talking about? What's happened?' in a deep, half-growling voice, as of a man disturbed in his occupation by some fuss of which he did not grasp the meaning. "'Oh!' said Mrs. Surtees, wiping her moist eyes. "'Did you not hear, Jim? The doctor has seen a murder committed. God preserve us! I feel as if I had seen it myself, a dreadful thing like that coming so near us. It is as if we were mixed up in it,' she said. "'A murder? Are you sure it was a murder? It might be nothing more than a quarrel. How could you tell in the dark?' said Jim, always in the same gruff, almost indignant voice. "'If you had seen it as I did, you would have been in no doubt,' said Dr. Barrere, turning half round and catching a side view of the tall figure slouching with hands in his pockets, his face clouded with a scowl of displeasure, his shoulders up to his ears. This silhouette against the light gave him a thrill. He scarcely knew why. He paused for a moment, and then added, "'After all, you may be right.' It was murder to all intents and purpose, but whether it was intended to be so, there may be a doubt. "'You are always so ready to come to tragical conclusions,' said Jim, in easier tones. "'I dare say it will turn out to have been a quarrel, and no more.' 
A quarrel in which one is killed is apt to look like murder. These words gave them all a shivering sensation. Even Jim's shoulders went up to his ears as if he shared the involuntary shudder, and Mrs. Surtees said again, drying her eyes, "'It is as if we were mixed up in it. Poor man! Poor man! Cut off in a moment, without a thought! "'It appears that he is a well-known and very bad character,' said Dr. Barrere. "'I feel almost more sorry for the poor wretch that did it. The cry he gave when he saw what he had done still rings in my ears. Then you think he did not mean it, Arnold? God knows. You would have said he meant everything that passion and rage could mean to see the blows, but that cry. He repented, perhaps, when it was too late. It was horror. It was consternation. It was the cry of a man who suddenly saw what he had done. There was a pause of sympathetic horror and pity, then Jim Surtees went back to the writing-table, and Dr. Brer continued his conversation with the ladies, which, however they tried to break into other and happier subjects, returned again and again to the terrible scene from which he had just come. They spoke in low tones together over the fire, the doctor recounting over and over again the feelings with which he had contemplated the extraordinary, sudden tragedy, the rapidity with which all its incidents followed each other, leaving him scarcely time to cry out before all was over. He was naturally full of it, and could speak of nothing else, and his betrothed and her mother, always sympathetic, threw themselves entirely into the excitement which still possessed him. It was late when he rose to go away, soothed and calmed, and with a sense of having at last exhausted the incident. It startled him as he turned round, after taking leave of Mrs. Surtees, to see that Jim was still there. And the aspect of the young man was sufficiently remarkable. The candles on the writing-table behind which he sat had burned low. They had escaped from the little red shades which had been placed over them, and were flaring low, like a level sun in the evening, upon the figure behind, which, with his head bowed in his hands and shoulders up to his ears, seemed unconscious of all that was passing. Jim neither saw nor heard the doctor move. He was absorbed in some all-important matter of his own. Next day, Dr. Barrer was still deeply occupied by the scene he had seen. He was summoned for the coroner's inquest, and he was, as was natural, questioned by everybody he met upon a subject which was in all men's mouths. It was equally natural that he should return next evening to bring the account of all the encounters he had gone through, and all that was news on the subject, to Agnes and her mother. Once more, he noted with surprise that Jim was in the drawing-room. Was he turning over a new leaf? Had he seen the folly of his ways at last? They were sitting as before, over the fire, Dr. Barrer telling his story, the ladies listening with absorbed attention, the interest of this terrible tragedy which had taken place almost within their kin, which they were seeing through his eyes, was absorbing to them. They wanted to know everything, the most minute details, what questions had been asked him, and what he had replied. Jim was still behind backs at the writing-table, with the two candles in their red shades, which did not betray his face, but threw a strange light upon his hands and the occupation in which he seemed to be absorbed. He was playing an old-fashioned game with small colored glass balls on a round board, called solitaire, in the days when it was in fashion. The little tinkle of the balls as he placed them in the necessary order came in during the pauses in the talk like a faint accompaniment. But no one looked at him. They were too much absorbed in Dr. Barrere's report. "'And are you the only witness, Arnold?' Agnes asked. "'The only one who saw the deed done,' he said. "'It is very rarely that there is even one witness to the actual fact of a murder. But there is other evidence than mine. The man is supposed to have been seen by various people, and there is a dumb witness of the first importance. The stick, which he must have thrown away, or which dropped from his hand in the horror, as I shall always believe, of his discovery of what he had done. At this point there was a ring, as of the glass balls all tinkling together on the board. 
The doctor turned round, slightly startled in the high tension of his nerves, and saw that Jim had upset his plaything and that the balls were rolling about the table. But this was far from being an unusual accident in the game, and neither Mrs. Surtees nor Agnes took any notice. Their nerves were not strained as Dr. Barrere's had been. The mother spoke low with a natural thrill of horror and pity. "'And is it known,' she said, "'is it known to whom the stick belongs?' Before Dr. Barrere could reply, there came a knock to the door, a knock not at the door of the room in which they sat, but below, at the street door. A thing unusual indeed at that hour, but not so startling in general as to excite or alarm them. But perhaps all their nerves were affected more or less. It was very sudden and sharp, and came into the calm domestic atmosphere with a scarcely comprehensible shock. They all turned round, and Jim, the doctor saw, had suddenly risen up and stood with his face turned towards the door. The summons rang through the silence with an effect altogether out of keeping with its simplicity. "'Who can that be so late?' said Mrs. Surtees. "'Jim, will you go and see?' "'It must be someone for me,' the doctor said. "'Poor Arnold! I hope it is someone near,' said Agnes, faltering, for neither of them believed what they said. "'It was something terrible, something novel.' some startling new event, whatever it was. Jim, instead of doing as his mother wished, sat down again behind the writing-table, within the shelter of the red shades on the candles, and they all waited, scarcely venturing to draw breath. Presently the neat parlour-maid, pale, too, and with a visible tremor, opened the door. She said, with a troubled look at her mistress, that, "'Please, there was someone downstairs who wanted to speak to Mr. Jim.' Mrs. Surtees was the last to be moved by the general agitation. She said, "'For Mr. Jim, but let him come up, Ellen. Jim, you had better ask your friend to come upstairs.' Once more there was a terrible, incomprehensible pause. Jim, who had fallen, rather than reseated himself on the sofa which stood behind the writing-table, said not a word. His face was not visible behind the shaded lights. Mrs. Surtees threw a glance round her, a troubled appeal, for she knew not what enlightenment. Then she said breathlessly, "'What has happened? What is the matter? Who is it? Ellen, you will show the gentleman upstairs.' Heavens, how they stood listening, panic-stricken, not knowing what they were afraid of, nor what there was to fear. Mrs. Surtees still kept her seat tremulously, and Jim— lost in the corner of the sofa, suddenly extinguished the candles, an act which they all seemed to approve and understand without knowing why. And then there came a heavy foot ascending the stairs. Mrs. Surtees did not know the man who came in, a tall, soldierly man with a clear and healthful countenance. It even gave her a momentary sensation of comfort to see that Jim's friend was no blear-eyed young rake, but a person so respectable. She rose to meet him with her old-fashioned courtesy. "'Though I have not the pleasure of knowing you,' she said with a smile, which was tremulous by reason of that causeless agitation, "'my son's friends are always welcome.' "'Oh, heaven above! Her son's friend!' Dr. Barrere was the only one among them who knew the man. The sight of him cleared the whole matter in a moment, and shed a horrible light over everything to the doctor's eyes. He made a sudden sign to the newcomer, imploring silence. "'I know this gentleman, too, Mrs. Surtees,' he said. "'He is one of my friends also. Would it be taking a great liberty if I were to ask you to leave us for a few minutes for the use of this room? Agnes, it is a great intrusion, but—' "'For God's sake, take her away,' he said in his betrothed's ear. Mrs. Surtees looked at him with some surprise, and an air of gentle dignity not entirely without offence. "'My dear,' she said to Agnes, "'Dr. Barrere would not ask such a thing without good reasons for it, so let us go.' She was not a woman who had been accustomed to take the lead even in her own family, and she was glad, glad beyond description, to believe that the business— Whatever it was, was Dr. Barrere's business, and not anything else. 
She accepted it with a trembling sense of relief, yet a feeling that the doctor was perhaps taking a little too much upon him, turning her out of her own room. The two men stood looking at each other as the ladies went away, with Jim still huddled in the corner of the sofa, in the shade, making no sign. Dr. Barrere saw, however, that the stranger, with a glance round of keen, much-practiced eyes, had at once seen him, and placed himself between Jim and the door. When the ladies had disappeared, the doctor spoke quickly. Well, he said, what is it, Morton? Some new information? Something I regret as much as any one can, Dr. Barrer. I have to ask Mr. Surtees to come with me. There need be no exposure for the moment, but I must take him without delay. Take him? The doctor made a last effort to appear not to perceive. He said, Have you too seen something, then? Had you further evidence to give, Jim? There was no reply. Neither did the superintendent say a word. They stood all three, silent. Jim had risen up. His limbs seemed unable to support him. He stood leaning on the table, looking out blankly over the two extinguished candles and their red shades. The officer went up and laid his hand lightly upon the young man's shoulder. Come, he said. You know what I'm here for. And I'm sorry, very sorry for you, Mr. Jim. But no doubt you'll be able to make it all clear. Barrer, said Jim struggling against the dryness in his throat. "'You can prove that I have not been out of the house, that I was at home all last night. I couldn't—I couldn't, you know, be in two places at one time, could I, Barrer? "'Mr. Jim, you must remember that whatever you say now will tell against you at the trial. I take you to witness, doctor, that I haven't even told him what it was for.' Jim ground out an oath from between his clenched teeth. "'Do I need to ask?' he said. Doesn't everybody know I hated him, and good reason to, hated him and threatened him. But God help me not to kill him, cried the young man with a voice of despair. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Barrere, by Margaret Oliphant. Chapter 3. Dr. Barrere was left to break the news to the mother and daughter. He never knew how he accomplished this dreadful office. They came back when they heard the door shut, evidently not expecting to find him, believing that he had withdrawn with his friend, and the anxious, searching eyes with which his Agnes looked around the room, the mingled terror and pleasure of her look on discovering him, never faded from his mind. Mrs. Surtees was more disappointed than pleased. She said, with an evident sudden awakening of anxiety, "'Where's Jim?' And then he had to tell them. How did he find words to do it? But the wonderful thing, the dreadful thing, was that after the shock of the first intimation there seemed little surprise in the looks of these poor ladies. The mother sank down in her chair and hid her face in her hands, and Agnes stood behind her mother, throwing her arms around her, pressing that bowed head against her breast. They did not cry out indignantly that it was not, could not be true. They were silent, like those upon whom something long looked for had come at last. The doctor left them after a while with a chill in his very soul. He could say nothing. He could not attempt to console them in the awful silence which seemed to have fallen upon them. Agnes tried to smile as he went away, tried with her trembling lips to say something, but she could not conceal from him that she wished him to go, that he could give no comfort that the best thing he could do for them in their misery was to leave them alone. He went home very miserable, in that consciousness of being put aside, and allowed no share in the anguish of the woman whom he loved. It was intolerable to him. It was unjust. He said to himself as he walked along that the tacit abandonment of Jim, the absence of all protest on their part that his guilt was impossible, a protest which surely a mother and sister in any circumstances ought to have made, was hard, was unjust. 
If all the world condemned him, yet they should not have condemned him. He took Jim's part hotly, feeling that he was a fellow sufferer. Even were he dissipated and reckless, poor fellow, there was a long, long way between that and murder. Murder. There was nothing in Jim which could make it possible that he could have to do with a murder. If he was hasty in temper, poor fellow, his nature was sweet, notwithstanding all his errors. Even he, Arnold Barrere, a man contemptuous of the manner of folly which had ruined Jim, a man with whom wrath and revenge might have awakened more sympathy, even he had come to have a tenderness for the erring young man. And to think that Jim could have lain in wait for any one, could have taken a man at a disadvantage, was, he declared to himself with indignation, impossible. It was impossible though the two women who were nearest to him, his mother and his sister, did not say so, did not stand up in vindication of the unhappy youth. When he had exhausted this natural indignation, Dr. Barrere began to contemplate the situation more calmly and to arrange its incidents in his mind. The horror of the thought that he was himself the chief witness affected him little at first, for it was to the fact only that he could speak, and the culprit, so far as he was concerned, was without identity, a shadow in the night, and no more. But a chill came over that flush of indignant partisanship with which he had made a mental stand for Jim when the other circumstances flashed upon him. He remembered his own surprise to find Jim in the drawing-room when he arrived at Mrs. Surtees' house, to see his dress so unusual, though scarcely more unusual than the fact of his being there. He remembered how the young man held aloof, how the candles had flared upon him, neglected. The little scene came before Dr. Barrere like a picture, the candle-shades standing up in a ludicrous neglect, the light flaring under them upon Jim's face. And then again, tonight, the senseless game with which he seemed to amuse himself, the tremble of his hands over the plaything, his absence of interest in the matter which was so exciting to the others. Why was Jim there at all? Why did he ask no question? Why keep behind, unexcited, unsurprised, while the doctor told his story? And then the reason thrust itself upon him in Jim's own words. I couldn't be in two places at once, could I? You can prove that I was here last night. Good God, what did it mean? Jim, Jim. And his mother and sister, who had sunk into despair without a word, who had never said as women ought, we know him better. It is not true. It is not true. Dr. Barrere went home more wretched than words can say, hard and terrible, is an unjust accusation, but oh, how easy, how sweet, how possible is even the shame which is undeserved. A century of that is as nothing in comparison with a day or hour of that which is merited, of the horror which is true. He tried to hope still that it was not true, but he felt coming over him like a pall the terror which he could now perceive had quenched the very hearts in the bosoms of the two women who were Jim's natural defenders. They had not been able to say a word, and neither could he. Dr. Barrere stood still, in the middle of the dark street, with the damp wind blowing in his face as all this came before him. A solitary passer-by looked round, surprised, and looked again, thinking the man was mad. He saw in a moment, as by a revelation, all that was before them, and himself. The horrible notoriety, the disgrace, the endless stigma. It would crush them and tear their lives asunder. But for him also, would not that be ruin too? Chapter 4 the trial took place after a considerable interval, for the assizes were just over when the man was killed. In that dreadful time of suspense and misery, proof after proof accumulated slowly with a gradual drawing together as of the very web of fate. The stick which was found by the body of the murdered man was Jim's stick, with his initials upon it, in a silver band, alas, his mother's gift. 
he was proved to have had a desperate quarrel with the man, who was one of those who had corrupted and misled him. Then the alibi which had seemed at first so strong disappeared into worse than nothing when examined, for Jim had been seen on his flight home. He had been seen to enter furtively and noiselessly into his mother's house, though the servants were ready to swear that he had not gone out that night. And all the precautions he had taken, instead of bringing him safety, only made his position worse, being shown to be precautions consciously taken against a danger foreseen. All these things grew into certainty before the trial, so that it was all a foregone conclusion in the minds of the townspeople, some of whom yielded to the conviction with heartfelt pity, and some with an eager improving of the situation, pointing out to what horrible conclusions vice was sure to come. Meanwhile, this strange and horrible event, which had held the town for more than nine days in wonder and perturbation, and which had given a moral to many a tale, and point to many a sermon, held one little circle of unhappy creatures as in a ring of iron. Unable to get away from it, unable to forget it, their hearts, their hopes, their life itself marked forever with its trace of blood. The two ladies had roused themselves from their first stupor into a half-fictitious adoption of their natural role as defenders of Jim. God knows through how many shocks and horrors of discovery Jim had led them, making something new, something worse, always the thing to be expected, before they had come to that pitch that their hearts had no power to make any protest at all. But when the morning rose upon their troubled souls, they began to say to each other that it could not be true. It could not be true. Jim had now and then an accès of sudden rage, but he was the kind of man of whom it is said that he would not hurt a fly. How could it be possible that he would do a murder? It was not possible. Any other kind of evil thing, but not that. Oh, not that. They said this to each other when they rose up from the uneasy bed in which mother and daughter had lain down together, not able to separate from each other, though those rules of use and want which are so strong on women made them lie down as if to sleep, where no sleep was. But when the light came, that awful light which brings back common life to us on the morning after a great calamity, they looked into each other's pale faces and with one voice said, Oh no! No, it cannot be. Mother, cried Agnes, he would not hurt a fly. Oh, how kind he was when I was ill, when you had your accident. Do you remember? Who does not know what these words are? Do you remember? All that he was who is dead. All that he might have been who is lost. All the hopes, the happy prospects, the cheerful days before trouble came. No words more poignant can be said. They did not need to ask each other what they remembered. That was enough. They clasped each other and kissed with trembling lips, and then Agnes rose, bidding her mother rest, and went to fetch her the woman's cordial, the cup of tea, which is so often all one poor female creature can offer to another by way of help. No, no, he could not have done it. They took a little comfort for the moment, and another strange comfort they took in a thing which was one of the most damning pieces of evidence against Jim, which was that he had quarreled violently with the murdered man and denounced him, and declared hatred and everlasting enmity against him. The story of the quarrel, as it was told to them, brought tears, which were almost tears of joy to Mrs. Surtees' eyes. The man who had been killed was one of those adventurers who haunt the outskirts of society wherever there are victims to be found. He had preyed upon the lives and souls of young men in Poolborough since the days when Jim Surtees was an innocent and credulous boy. It was not this man's fault that Jim had gone astray, for Jim, alas, was all ready for his fall and eager after everything that was forbidden, but in the fits of remorse and misery which sometimes came upon him, it was perhaps no wonder if he laid it at Langton's door, and that the mother should have held Langton responsible. Who could wonder? The facts of the quarrel were as so many nails in Jim's coffin. 
but God helped the poor woman. They gave consolation to his mother's heart. They meant repentance, she thought. They meant generosity and a pathetic indignation, and more, they meant succor. For the quarrel had arisen over an unfortunate youth whom the black leg was throwing his toils around as he had thrown them around Jim, and whom Mrs. Surtees believed Jim had saved by exposing the villain. The story was told reluctantly, delicately, to the poor ladies, as almost sealing Jim's fate, and to the consternation of the narrator, who was struck dumb and could only stare at them in a kind of stupor of astonishment, they looked at each other and broke forth into cries at first inarticulate, which were almost cries of joy. "'You do not see the bearing of it, I fear,' said the solicitor, who had the management of the case, as soon as out of his astonishment he had recovered his voice. "'Oh, sir,' cried Mrs. Surtees, "'what I see is this, that my boy has saved another poor woman's son. God bless him, and that will not be forgotten. That will not be forgotten.' This gentleman withdrew in a state of speechless consternation. No, it will not be forgotten, he said to Dr. Barrere. I think the poor lady has gone out of her senses, and little wonder. It is a piece of evidence which we can never get over. Dr. Barrere shook his head, not understanding the women much better than the lawyer did. This gave them consolation, and yet it was the seal of Jim's fate. Dr. Barrere himself, in the long period of waiting, was a most unhappy man. He stood by the Surtees nobly, everybody said. No son could have been more attentive than he was to the poor mother, who was entirely broken by this blow, and had suddenly become an old woman. And he never wavered in his faith and loyalty to Agnes, who, but for that noble fidelity, would, everybody said, have been the most of all to be pitied. For Agnes was young, and had all her life before her, with the stain of this crime upon her name, and if her lover had not stood by her, what would have become of her? The people who had been doubtful of Dr. Barrere as half a Frenchman, as too great a theorist, as a man who had not been quite successful in his outset, began now to look upon him with increased respect, and his firmness, his high honor, his disinterestedness, were commented upon on all sides. But in his heart the doctor was far from happy. His life, too, seemed in question as well as Jim's. If the worst came to the worst, he asked himself, would society, however sympathetic for the moment, receive the family of a man who had been hanged? Horrible words. Without prejudice. Would there not be a stigma upon the name of Surtees, and even upon the name of him who had given his own as a shield to the family of the murderer. He did his duty, no man more truly. He loved his Agnes with all the warmth of an honest heart, taking his share of all her trouble, supporting her through everything, making himself for her sake the brother of a criminal, and one of the objects of popular curiosity and pity. All this he did from day to day, and went on doing it, but still there were struggles and dreadful misgivings in Dr. Barrere's heart. He was a proud man, and except for what he made by his profession a poor one. If that failed him, he had nothing else to fall back upon, and he already knew the misery of unsuccess. He knew what it was to see his practice wasting away, to see his former patients pass by shamefacedly, conscious of having transferred their ailments and themselves to other hands, to be put aside for no expressed reason out of the tide of life. At Pulmoro he had begun to forget the experiences of his beginning, and to feel that at last he had got hold of the thread which would lead him, if not to fortune, at least to comfort, and the certainties of an established course of living. Would this last? he asked himself. Would it make no difference to him if he identified himself with ruin, ruin so hideous and complete? The question was a terrible one, and brought the sweat to his brow when in chance moments, between his visits and his cases, between the occupations and thoughts which absorbed him, now and then, suddenly, in spite of all the pains he took, it would start up and look him in the face. He had a brother who was hanged, was what people would say. 
they would not even, after a little lapse of time, pause to recollect that it was his wife's brother. The brand would go with them wherever he went. You remember the great murder case in Poolborough? Well, these were the people, and the brother was hanged. These words seemed to detach themselves and float in the air. He said them to himself sometimes, or rather they were said in his ear, without anything else to connect them. The phrase seemed already a common phrase which anyone might use. The brother was hanged. And then cold drops of moisture would come out upon his forehead, and all the possibilities of life, the success which is dear to a man, the advancement of which he knew himself capable— was it all to go? Was he to be driven back once more to that everlasting recommencement which makes the heart of a man sick? These thoughts accompanied Dr. Barrere as he went and came, a son and more than a son to Mrs. Surtees, and to Agnes the most faithful, the most sympathetic of lovers. At such a moment, and in face of the awful catastrophe which had come upon them, any talk of marriage would have been out of place. He had indeed suggested it at first in mingled alarm and desperation, and true desire to do his best, in the first impulse of overwhelming sympathy, and at the same time in the first glimpse of all that might follow, and sickening horror of self-distrust lest his resolution might give way. He would have fled from himself, from all risks of this nature, into the safety of a bond which he could not break. But Agnes had silently negatived the proposal with a shake of her head and a smile of pathetic tenderness. She, too, had thoughts of the future, of which she breathed no word to any one, not even to her mother. All that was in his mind as subject of alarm and misgiving was reflected, with that double clearness and vivification which is given to everything reflected in the clear flowing of a river, in the mind of Agnes." She saw all, with the distinctness of one to whom the sacrifice of herself was nothing when compared with the welfare of those she loved. He was afraid lest these alarms might bring him into temptation, and the temptation be above his strength, and his soul was disturbed and made miserable. But to Agnes the matter took another aspect. All that he foresaw, she foresaw." but the thought brought neither disturbance nor fear. It brought the exaltation of a great purpose, the solemn joy of approaching martyrdom. Arnold should never suffer for her. It was she who would have the better part and suffer for him. The dreadful fact that it was Dr. Barrere only who had witnessed the murder, and that he would have to speak and prove what he had seen, became more and more apparent to them all as the time drew on. His description of the blows that had been rained down wildly on the victim, and of the lurking figure in the shadow whom he had noted as he passed the first time, took away all hope that it might be supposed the act of a momentary madness without premeditation. The doctor had told his story with all the precision that was natural to him, before he knew who it was that would be convicted by it, and now it was no longer possible for him, even had his conscience permitted it, to soften the details which he had at first given so clearly, or to throw any mist upon his clear narrative. He had to repeat it all, knowing the fatal effect it must have standing up with Jim's pale face before him, with a knowledge that somewhere in a dim corner Agnes sat, with bowed head listening to what she already knew so well. The doctor's countenance was as pale as Jim's. His mouth grew dry as he bore his testimony. But not all the terrible consequences could make him alter a word. He could scarcely refrain a groan, a sob, when he had done and this involuntary evidence of what it cost him to tell the truth increased the effect in the highest degree, as the evidence of an unwilling witness always does. There was but one point in which he could help the prisoner, and fortunately that too had been a special point in his previous evidence. But it was not until Dr. Barrere got into the hands of Jim's advocate that this was brought out. I see, the counsel said, that in your previous examination you speak of a cry uttered by the assailant 
after the blows which you have described. You describe it as a cry of horror. In what sense do you mean this to be understood? I mean, said Dr. Barrer, very pointedly and clearly, and if there had been any divided attention in the crowded court where so many people had come to hear the fate of one whom they had known from his childhood, every mind was roused now, and every eye intent upon the speaker. I mean, he paused to give fuller force to what he said, I mean that the man who struck those blows for the first time realized what he was doing. The cry was one of consternation and dismay. It was the cry of a man horrified to see what he had done. The cry was so remarkable that it made a great impression on your mind? A very great impression. I do not think I have ever heard an utterance which affected me so much. You were hurrying forward at the time to interpose in the scuffle. Did you distinguish any words? Did you recognize the voice? It would give an erroneous impression to say that I meant to interpose in the scuffle. There was no scuffle. The man fell at once. He never had a chance of defending himself. I did not recognize the voice, nor can I say that any words were used. It was nothing but a cry. The cry, however, was of such a nature as to induce you to change your mind in respect to what had occurred. I had no time to form any theory. The impression it produced on my mind was that an assault was intended, but not murder, and that all at once it had become apparent to the unfortunate. Here the doctor paused, and there was a deep sobbing breath of intense attention drawn by the crowd. He stopped for a minute, and then resumed. It had become apparent to the assailant that he had gone too far, that the consequences were more terrible than he had intended. He threw down what he had in his hand and fled in horror. You were convinced, then, that there was no murderous intention in the act of the unfortunate, as you have well said, assailant. That was my conviction, said Dr. Barrere. The effect made upon the assembly was great and though it was no doubt diminished, more or less, by the cross-examination of the counsel for the prosecution, who protested vehemently against the epithet of unfortunate, applied to the man who had attacked, in the dark, another man who was proceeding quietly about his own business, who had lain in wait for him, and assaulted him murderously with every evidence of premeditation, it still remained the strongest point in the defense." "'You say that you had no time to form any theory,' said the prosecutor. "'Yet you have told us that you rushed forward calling out murder. "'Was this before or after you heard the cry so full of meaning which you have described?' "'It was probably almost at the same moment,' said Dr. Barrere. "'Yet even in the act of crying out murder, "'you were capable of noticing all the complicated sentiments "'which you now tell us were in the assailant's cry.' In great excitement one takes no notice of the passage of time. A minute contains as much as an hour. And you expect us to believe that in that minute, and without the help of words, you were enlightened as to the meaning of the act by a mere inarticulate cry. I tell you the impression produced on my mind, as I told it at the coroner's inquest, said Dr. Barrere steadily, as I have told it to my friends from the first. Yet this did not prevent you from shouting murder. No, it did not prevent me from calling for help in the usual way. This was all that could be made of the doctor. It remained the strongest point in poor Jim's favor, who was, as everybody saw to be inevitable, condemned, yet recommended to mercy because of what Dr. Barrere had said. Otherwise there were many features in the case that roused the popular pity. The bad character of the man who had been killed, the evil influence he was known to have exercised, the injury he had done to Jim himself and to so many others, and the very cause of the quarrel in which Jim had threatened and announced his intention of punishing him, all these things, had Jim been tried in France, would have produced a verdict modified by extenuating circumstances. In England it did not touch the decision, but it produced that vague recommendation to mercy with which pity satisfies itself when it can do no more. Dr. Barrere took the unfortunate mother and sister home. Mrs. Surtees, broken as she was, could not be absent from the court when her son's fate was to be determined. 
She was as one stricken dumb as they took her back. Now and then she would put her trembling hands to her eyes, as if expecting tears which did not come. Her very heart and soul were crushed by the awful doom which had been spoken. And the others did not even dare to exchange a look. The horror which enveloped them was too terrible for speech. It was only after an interval had passed, and life, indomitable life which always rises again, whatever may be the anguish that subdues it for a moment, had returned in pain and fear to its struggle with the intolerable, that words and the power of communication returned. Then Dr. Brer told the broken-hearted women that both he himself and others in the town who knew Jim, with all the influence that could be brought to bear, would work for a revision of the sentence. It was upon his own evidence that the hopes, which those who were not so deeply, tremendously interested, but who regarded the case with an impartial eye, began to entertain, were founded. "'I hope that the Home Secretary may send for me,' he said. "'They think he will. God grant it.' He, too, had worked himself into a kind of hope. "'Oh,' said Agnes, melting for the first time into tears at the touch of a possible deliverance, "'if we could go, as they used to do, to the Queen, his mother and his sister, on our knees.' Mrs. Surtees sat and listened to them with her immovable face of misery. "'Don't speak to me of hope, for I cannot bear it,' she said. "'Oh, don't speak of hope. There is none.' None. Nothing but death and shame. Yes, mother, said Dr. Barrere, and he added under his breath, whatever happens, whatever happens, there shall be no death of shame. End of section 12section 13 of the doctor's red lamp this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Barrere, by Margaret Oliphant. Chapter 5. The recommendation to mercy was very strong. Almost all the principal people in the town interested themselves, and the judge himself had been persuaded to add a potent word. But as he did so he shook his head, and told the petitioners that their arguments were all sentimental. "'What does your lordship say, then, to the doctor's testimony?' was asked him, upon which he shook his head more and more. "'The doctor's testimony above all,' he said." Mind you, I think that probably the doctor was right, but it is not a solid argument, it is all sentiment, and that is what the Home Office makes no account of. This was very discouraging. But still, there was a certain enthusiasm in the town in Jim's favor, as well as a natural horror that one who really belonged, if he had kept his position, to the best class, should come to such an end. And the chief people who got up this recommendation to mercy were warm supporters of the government. That, too, they felt convinced, must tell for something. And there reigned in Poolborough a certain hope, which Dr. Barrer sometimes shared. Sometimes. For on many occasions he took the darker view, the view so universal and generally received, that the more important it is for you that a certain thing should come to pass, the more you desire it, the less likely it is to happen. And then he would ask himself, was it so important that it should come to pass? At the best, it was still true that Jim had killed this man. If he were not hanged for it, he would be imprisoned for life. And whether it is worse to have a relative who has been hanged for a crime, or one who is lingering out a long term of imprisonment for it, it is hard to tell. There did not seem much to choose between them. Perhaps even the hanging would be forgotten soonest and it would be less of a burden. For to think of a brother in prison, who might emerge years hence with a ticket of leave, a disgraced and degraded man, was something terrible. Perhaps on the whole it would be best that he should die. And then Dr. Barrere shuddered. Die. Ah! If that might be, quietly, without demonstration, but as it was, and then he would begin again against his will, that 
painful circle of thought, the brother was hanged. That was what people would say. After the horror of it had died out, fantastic patients would cry, the brother of a man who was hanged. Oh no, don't let us call in such a person. The ladies would say this. They would shudder, yet perhaps even laugh, for the pity would be forgotten, even the horror would be forgotten, and there would remain only this suggestion of discomfort, just enough to make the women feel that they would not like to have him, the brother of a man who was hanged, for their doctor. Dr. Barrere tried all he could to escape from this circle of fatal thought, but however hard he worked, and however much he occupied himself, he could not do so, always and the thought went near sometimes to make him mad. He had, however, much to occupy him, to keep thought away. He was the only element of comfort in the life of the two miserable women who lived under the shadow of death, their minds entirely absorbed in the approaching catastrophe, living through it a hundred times in anticipation, in despair which was made more ghastly and sickening by a flicker of terrible hope. Mrs. Surtees said that she had no hope. She would not allow the possibility to be named, but secretly dwelt upon it with an intensity of suspense which was more unendurable than any calamity. And when Agnes and her lover were alone, this was the subject that occupied them to the exclusion of all others. Their own hopes and prospects were all blotted out as if they had never been. He brought her reports of what was said and what was thought on the subject among the people who had influence, those who were straining every nerve to obtain a reprieve, and she hung upon his words breathless with an all-absorbing interest. He never got beyond the awful shadow, or could forget it, and went about all day with that cloud hanging over him, and frightened his patients with his stern and serious looks. Dr. Barrere is not an encouraging doctor, they began to say. He makes you think you are going to die. For the sick people could not divest themselves of the idea that it was their complaints that were foremost in the doctor's mind, and produced that severity in his looks. But all this was light and easy to the last of the many occupations which filled Dr. Barrere's time and thoughts, and that was Jim. Jim alone, in his prison, he who never had been alone, who had been surrounded all day long with his companions, the companions who had led him astray. No, they had not led him astray. Langton, who was dead, whom he had killed, had not led him astray, though he now thought so, or said so, bemoaning himself. Such a thing would be too heavy a burden for any human spirit. A man cannot ruin any more than he can save his brother his own inclinations, his own will, his love for the forbidden, his idle wishes and follies, these were what had led him astray, and now he was left alone to think of all that, with the shadow before him of a hideous death at a fixed moment, a moment drawing nearer and nearer, which he could no more escape than he could forget it. Jim had many good qualities amid his evil ones. He was not a bad man. His sins were rather those of a foolish, self-indulgent boy. His character was that of a boy. A certain innocency, if that word may be used, lay under the surface of his vices, and long confinement away from all temptation had wrought a change in him like that that came over the leper in the scriptures, whose flesh came again as the flesh of a little child." This was what happened to Jim, both bodily and mentally. He languished in health from his confinement, but yet his eyes regained the clearness of his youth, and his mind all its ingenuousness, its power of affection. Lying under sentence of death, he became once more the lovable human creature, the winning and attractive youth he had been in the days before trouble came. All clouds, save the one cloud, rolled off his soul. In all likelihood, he himself forgot the course of degradation through which he had gone. Everything was obliterated to him by the impossibility of sinning more. Everything except the one thing which no self-delusion could obliterate, the unchangeable doom to which he was approaching day by day. Jim had none of the tremors of a murderer. 
He concealed nothing. He admitted freely that the verdict was just, that it was he who had lurked in the dark and awaited the villain, but only he had never meant no more than to punish him. It is all quite true what the doctor says. I knocked him down. I meant to beat him within an inch of his life. God knows if he deserved it at my hands, or any honest man's hands. And then it came over me in a moment that he never moved, that he never made a struggle. It was not because there were people coming up that I ran away. It was horror, as the doctor says. Nothing can ever happen to me again so dreadful as that, said Jim, putting up his handkerchief to wipe his damp forehead. And yet he could tell even that story with tolerable calm. He was not conscious of guilt. He had meant to do what he felt quite justifiable rather laudable than otherwise, to thrash a rascal within an inch of his life. He had expected the man to defend himself. He had been full of what he felt to be righteous rage, and he did not feel himself guilty now. He was haunted by no ghost. He had ceased even to shudder at the recollection of the horrible moment in which he became aware that instead of chastising he had killed. But when his momentary occupation with other thoughts died away and the recollection of what lay before him came back, the condition of poor Jim was a dreadful one. To die. For that. To die on Thursday, the 3rd of September, at a horrible moment fixed and unchangeable, to feel the days running past remorselessly, swift, without an event to break their monotonous flying pace, those days which were so endlessly long from dawn to twilight, which seemed as if they would never be done, which had so little night, yet which flew noiselessly, silently, bringing him ever nearer and nearer to the end. Poor Jim broke down entirely under the pressure of this intolerable certainty. Had it been done at once, the moment the sentence had been pronounced, but to sit and wait for it, Look for it. Anticipate it. Know that every hour was bringing it nearer, that through the dark and through the day and through all the endless circles of thoughts that surmounted and surrounded it, it was coming, always coming, not to be escaped. Jim's nerves broke down under this intolerable thing that had to be borne. He kept command of himself when he saw his mother and sister, but with Dr. Barrere he let himself go. It was a relief to him for the wretched moment. Save for the moment, nothing, alas, could be a relief. For whether he contrived to smile and subdue himself, or whether he dashed himself against the wall of impossibility that shut him in, whether he raved in anguish or madness, or slept, or tried to put a brave face upon it, it was coming all the time. It is sitting and waiting that is the horrible thing, he said. To think there is nothing you can do, that's true, you know, doctor. In Don Juan, about the people that plunged into the sea to get drowned a little sooner and be done with it. In the shipwreck, you know. It's waiting and seeing it coming that is horrible. It is just thirteen days today. Death isn't what I mind. It's waiting for it. Will it be... Will it be very horrible, do you think, at the moment, when it comes? No said Dr. Barrer. If it comes to that, not horrible at all. A moment, no more. A moment. But you can't tell until you try what may be in a moment. I don't mind, Doctor. Something sharp and soon would be a sort of relief. It is the sitting and waiting, counting the days, seeing it coming, always coming. Nobody has a right to torture a fellow like that. Let them take him and hang him as the lynchers do, straight off. Then Jim was seized with a slight convulsive shudder. And then the afterwards, doctor. For all your science, you can't tell anything about that. Perhaps you don't believe in it at all. I do. Dr. Barrere made no reply. He was not quite clear about what he believed, and he had nothing to say on such a subject to this young man standing upon the verge with all the uncertainties and possibilities of life still so warm in him, and yet so near the one unalterable certainty. After a minute, Jim resumed. I do, 
he said firmly. I've never been what you call a skeptic. I don't believe men are. They only pretend, or perhaps think so, till it comes upon them. I wonder what they'll say to a poor fellow up there, doctor. I've always been told they understand up there. There can't be injustice done like here. And I've always been a true believer. I've never been led away like that. It isn't a subject on which I can talk, said the doctor unsteadily. Your mother and Agnes, they know. But Jim, for the love of God, don't talk to them as you are doing now. Put on a good face for their sakes. Poor mother, said Jim. He turned all at once almost to crying, softened entirely out of his wild talk. What has she done to have a thing like this happen to her? She is a real good woman. And to have a son hanged, good Lord! Again he shivered convulsively. She won't live long, that's one thing. And perhaps it'll be explained to her satisfaction up there. But that's what I call unjust, Barrere to torture a poor soul like that, that has never done anything but good all her life. You'll take care of Agnes, but mother will not live long, poor dear. Poor dear, he repeated with a tremulous smile. I suppose she had a happy life till I grew up, till I... I wonder what I could be born for, a fellow like me, to be hanged, he cried with a sudden sharp anguish, in which there was the laughter of misery and the groan of despair. Dr. Barrere left the prison with his heart bleeding, but he did not abandon Jim. On the contrary, there was a terrible attraction which drew him to the presence of the unfortunate young man. The doctor of Poolborough Jail, though not so high in the profession as himself, was one of Dr. Barrere's acquaintances, and to him he went when he left the condemned cell. The doctor told his professional brother that Surtees was in a very bad state of health. His nerves have broken down entirely. His heart, haven't you remarked? His heart is in such a state that he might go at any moment. Dear me, said the other, he has never complained that I know of. And a very good thing, too, Barrere. You don't mean to say that you would regret it if anything did happen before... No, said the doctor, but the poor fellow may suffer. I wonder if you'd let me have the charge of him, Maxwell. I know you're a busy man, and it would please his mother to think that I was looking after him. What do you say? The one medical man looked at the other. Dr. Barrere was pale, but he did not shrink from the look turned upon him. I'll tell you what I'll do, Barrere, said the prison doctor at last. I'm getting all wrong for want of a little rest. Feel my hand. My nerves are as much shaken as Surtees. If you'll take the whole for a fortnight, so that I may take my holiday... Dr. Barrere thought for a moment. A fortnight? That will be till after. I don't know how I'm to do it with my practice, but I will do it for the sake of your health, Maxwell, for I see you are in a bad way. Hurrah, said the other. A breath of air will set me all right, and I shall be forever obliged to you, Barrere. Then he stopped for a moment and looked keenly in his face. You're a better man than I am. And no more. But for God's sake, Barrere, no tricks. No tricks. You know what I mean, he said. No, I don't know what you mean. I know you want a holiday, and I want to take care of a case in which I am interested. It suits us both. Let me have all the details you can, said Dr. Barrere. Chapter 6 The day had come, and almost the hour... The weary time had stolen, endless, yet flying on noiseless wings, an eternity of featureless, lingering hours, yet speeding, speeding towards that one fixed end, and there was no reprieve. The important people of Poolborough had retired sullenly from their endeavors to support a government faithfully, and yet not to have one poor favor granted. Their recommendation to mercy turned back upon themselves. They were indignant, and in that grievance they forgot the original cause of it. Still there were one or two still toiling on, but the morning of the fatal day had dawned and nothing had come. To tell how Mrs. Surtees and Agnes had lived through these days is beyond our power. 
They did not live. They dragged through a feverish dream from one time of seeing him to another, unconscious what passed in the meantime, except when some messenger would come to their door, and a wild blaze and frenzy of hope would light up in their miserable hearts. For it always seemed to them that it must be the reprieve which was coming, though each said to herself that it would not, could not, come. And when they saw Jim, that one actual recurring point in their lives was perhaps more miserable than the intervals, for to see him, and to know that the hour was coming ever nearer and nearer when he must die, to sit with him, never free from inspection, never out of hearing of some compulsory spectator, to see the tension of his nerves, the strain of intolerable expectation in him, was almost more than flesh and blood could bear. They had privileges which were not allowed in ordinary cases, for were not they still ranked among the best people of Poolborough? Though beaten down by a horrible calamity, what could they say to him? Not even the religious exhortations, the prayers which came from other lips less trembling, they were dumb. Dear Jim, and God bless you, was all they could say. Their misery was too great. There was no utterance in it. A word would have overthrown the enforced and awful calm, and neither could he speak. When he had said, Mother, and kissed her, and smiled, that was all. Then they sat silent, holding each other's hands. Through all this, Dr. Barrer was the only human supporter of the miserable family. He had promised to stand by Jim to the end, not to leave him till life had left him, till all was over, and now the supreme moment had nearly come. The doctor was as pale, almost paler, than he who was about to die. There was an air about him of sternness, almost of desperation, yet to Jim he was tender as his mother. He had warned the authorities what he feared— that agitation and excitement might even yet rob the law of its victim. He had been allowed to be with the condemned man from earliest dawn of the fatal morning, in consequence of the warning he had given, but it appeared to the attendants that Jim himself bore a less alarming air than the doctor, whose colorless face and haggard eyes looked as if he had not slept for a week. Jim, poor Jim had summoned all his courage for this supreme moment. There was a sweetness in his look that added to its youthfulness. He looked like a boy. His long imprisonment and the enforced self-denial there was in it had chased from his face all stains of evil. He was pale and worn with his confinement and with the interval of awful waiting, but his eyes were clear as a child's, pathetic, tender, with a wistful smile in them, as though the arrival of the fatal hour had brought relief. The old clergyman who had baptized him had come, too, to stand by him to the last, and he could scarcely speak for tears. But Jim was calm, and smiled. If any bit of blue sky was in that cell of the condemned, with all its grim and melancholy memories, it was in Jim's face. The doctor moved about him, not able to keep still, with that look of desperation, listening for every sound, but all was still, except the broken voice of the old clergyman, who had knelt down and was praying. One of the attendants, too, had gone down on his knees. The other stood watching, yet distracted by a pity which even his hardened faculties could not resist. Jim sat with his hands clasped, his eyes for a moment closed, the smile still quivering about his mouth. In this stillness of intense feeling, all observation, save that of the ever-watchful doctor, was momentarily subdued. Suddenly Jim's head seemed to droop forward on his breast. The doctor came in front of him with one swift step, and through the sound of the praying called imperatively, sharply, for wine, wine. The warder who was standing rushed to fill it out while Dr. Barrere bent over the fainting youth. It all passed in a moment, before the half-said sentence of the prayer was completed. The clergyman's voice wavered, stopped, 
and then resumed again, finishing the phrase, notwithstanding the stir and hurried movement, the momentary breathless scuffle which a sudden attack of illness, a fit or faint, always occasions. Then a sharp sound broke the stillness, the crash of the wine-glass which the doctor let fall from his hand after forcing the contents, as it seemed, down the patient's throat. The old clergyman, on his knees still, paused and, opening his eyes, gazed at the strange scene, not awakening to the seriousness of it, or perceiving any new element introduced into the solemnity of the situation for some minutes, yet gazing with tragic eyes, since nothing in the first place could well be more tragic. The little stir, the scuffle of the moving feet, the two men in motion about the still figure in the chair lasted for a little longer. Then the warder uttered a stifled cry. The clergyman on his knees, his heart still in his prayer for the dying, felt it half profane to break off into words to men in the midst of those he was addressing to God. But forced by this strange break, cried, What is it? What has happened? In spite of himself. There was no immediate answer. The doctor gave some brief, quick directions, and with the help of the warder lifted the helpless figure, all fallen upon itself like a ruined house, with difficulty to the bed. The limp, long, helpless limbs, the entire immobility and deadness of the form struck with a strange chill to the heart of the man who had been interceding, wrapped in another atmosphere than that of earth. The clergyman got up from his knees, coming back with a keen and awful sense of his humanity. "'Has he fainted?' he asked with a gasp. Once more a dead pause, a stillness in which the four men heard their hearts beating. Then the doctor said, with a strange brevity and solemnity, "'Better than that, he is dead.' Dead. They gathered round and gazed in a consternation beyond words, the young face scarcely paler than it had been a moment since, the eyes half shut, the lips fallen apart with that awful opening which is made by the exit of the last breath, lay back upon the wretched pillow in all that abstraction and incalculable distance which comes with the first touch of death. No one could look at that and be in any doubt." The warders stood by, dazed with horror and dismay, as if they had let their prisoner escape. Was it their fault? Would they be blamed for it? They had seen men go to the scaffold before with little feeling, but they had never seen one die of the horror of it, as Jim had died. While they were thus standing, a sound of measured steps was heard without— the door was opened with that harsh turning of the key which in other circumstances would have sounded like the trumpet of doom, but which now woke no tremor, scarcely any concern. It was the sheriff, and his grim procession coming for the prisoner. They streamed in and gathered, astonished, about the bed. Dr. Barrere turned from where he stood at the head with a face which was like ashes, pallid, stern, the nostrils dilating, the throat held high. He made a solemn gesture with his hand towards the bed. "'You come too late,' he said. The men had come in almost silently, in the excitement of the moment swelling the somber circle to a little crowd. They thronged upon each other and looked at him, lying there on the miserable prison bed, in the light of the horrible grated windows, all awe-stricken, in a kind of grey consternation, not knowing how to believe it. For it was a thing unparalleled, that one who was condemned should thus give his executioner the slip. The whisper of the sheriff's low voice inquiring into the catastrophe broke the impression a little. How did it happen? How was it? Dead? But it seems impossible. Are you sure, doctor? It is not a faint." The doctor waved his hand almost scornfully towards the still and rigid form. I foresaw it always. It is as I thought it would be, he said. His poor mother, said the clergyman, with a sort of habitual, conventional lamentation, as if it could matter to that poor mother. Dr. Barrere turned upon him quickly. Go to them. 
Tell them. It will save them something, he said with sudden eagerness. You can do no more here. It seems impossible, the sheriff repeated, turning again to the bed. Is there a glass to be had? Anything. Hold it to his lips. Do something, doctor. Have you tried all means? Are you sure? He had no doubt. But astonishment and the novelty of the situation suggested questions which really required no answer. He touched the dead hand and shuddered. It is extraordinary, most extraordinary, he said. I warned you of the possibility from the beginning, said Dr. Barrere. His heart was very weak. It is astonishing, rather, that he bore the strain so long. Then he added with that stern look, It is better that it should be so. The words were scarcely out of his lips when a sudden commotion was heard, as of someone hurrying along the stony passages, a sound of voices and hasty steps, the door which, in view of the fatal ceremonial about to take place, had been left open, was pushed quickly, loudly to the wall, and an important personage, the mayor of Poolborough, flushed and full of excitement, hurried in. "'Thank God!' he cried, wiping his forehead. "'Thank God it's come in time! I knew they could not refuse us! Here is the reprieve come at last!' A cry a murmur rose into the air from all the watchers. Who could help it? The reprieve, at such a moment. This solemn mockery was more than human nerves could bear. The warder who had been poor Jim's chief guardian broke forth into a sudden loud outburst, like a child's, of crying. The sheriff could not speak. He pointed silently to the bed. But of all the bystanders, none was moved like Dr. Breuer. He fell backward, as if he had received a blow, and gazed at the mayor speechless, his under lip dropping, his face livid, heavy drops coming out upon his brow. It was not till he was appealed to in the sudden explanations that followed that the doctor came to himself. When he was addressed, he seemed to wake as from a dream, and answered with difficulty. His lips parched, his throat dry, making convulsive efforts to moisten his tongue and enunciate the necessary words. Heart disease. Feared all the time, he said, as if he had partly lost that faculty of speech. The mayor looked sharply at him, as if suspecting something. What was it? Intoxication? So early and at such a time? But Dr. Barrere seemed to have lost all interest in what was proceeding. He cared nothing for their looks. He cared for nothing in the world. I'm of no further use here, he said huskily, and went toward the door as if he were blind, pushing against one and another. When he had reached the door, however, he turned back. The poor fellow, he said. The poor victim was to be given to his family after. It was a favor granted them. The removal was to be seen to tonight. There is no reason for departing from that arrangement, I suppose. The officials looked at each other, not knowing what to say, feeling that in the unexpected catastrophe there was something which demanded a change, yet unable on the spur of the moment to think what it was. Then the mayor replied, faltering, I suppose so. It need not make any change, do you think? The poor family have enough to bear without vexing them with alterations, since there can be no doubt. He paused and looked and shuddered. No doubt. Oh, no doubt. The execution would have been conducted with far less sensation. It was strange that such a shivering of horror should overwhelm them to see him lying so still upon that bed. Now I must go to my rounds, the doctor said. He went out, buttoning up his coat to his throat, as if he were shivering too, though it was a genial September morning, soft and warm. He went out from the dark prison walls into the sunshine like a man dazed, passing the horrible preparations on his way, the coffin, from which he shrank, as if it had been a monster. Dr. Barrere's countenance was like that of a dead man. He walked straight before him, as if he were going somewhere, but he went upon no rounds. His patience waited for him vainly. He walked 
and walked till fatigue of the body produced a general stupor aiding and completing the strange collapse of the mind and then mechanically but not till it was evening he went home his housekeeper full of anxious questions was silenced by the look of his face and had his dinner placed hastily and silently upon the table thinking the agitation of the day had been too much for him dr Barrere neither ate nor drank but he fell into a heavy and troubled sleep at the table where he had seated himself mechanically it was late when he woke and dark and for a moment there was a pause of bewilderment and confusion in his mind then he rose went to his desk and took some money out of it and his checkbook he took up an overcoat as he went through the hall he did not so much as hear the servant's timid question as to when he should return when he should return after the body of poor jim had been brought back to his mother's house and all was silent there in that profound hush after an expected calamity which is almost a relief agnes not able to rest wondering in her misery why all that day her lover had not come near them had not sent any communication but for the first time had abandoned them in their sorrow stood for a moment by the window in the hall to look if by any possibility he might still be coming he might have been detained by some pressing call he had neglected everything for jim he might now be compelled to make up for it who could tell some reason there must be for his desertion as she went to the window which was on a level with the street it gave her a shock beyond expression to see a pallid face close to it looking in a miserable face haggard with eyes that were bloodshot and red while everything else was the color of clay the color of death it was with difficulty she restrained a scream she opened the window softly and said arnold you have come at last the figure outside shrank and withdrew then said do not touch me don't look at me i did it to save him the shame arnold come in for god's sake don't speak so arnold never never more i thought the reprieve would not come i did it oh never never more arnold she cried stretching out her hands but he was gone opening the door as quickly as her trembling would let her the poor girl looked out into the dark street into the night but there was no one there was it a dream a vision an illusion of exhausted nature unable to discern reality from imagination no one ever knew but from that night dr barrera was never seen more in pulborough nor did any of those who had known him hear of him again he disappeared as if he had never been and if that was the terrible explanation of it or if the sudden shock had maddened him or if it was really he that agnes saw no one can tell but it was the last that was ever heard or seen of dr barrere end of section thirteen Section 14 of The Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. A Will and a Way by Margaret Sutton Briscoe. It was in that pleasant season of the year when there is a ladder at every apple tree and every man met on the road is driving with his left hand and eating a red apple from his right at this season as regularly as the year rolled round old karshina hubblestone nearly died of cramps caused by gorging himself with apples that fell almost into his mouth from the spreading boughs of fruit trees that fairly roofed his low-built house this was as it were Karshina's one dissipation. The apples cost him nothing, and his medical attention after his bouts cost him nothing either, for he was the son of a physician, and though his father was long since dead, the village doctor would not render a bill. 
Crow don't eat crow, Dr. Michel answered roughly when Karshina weakly asked him what he owed. The chance of thus roistering so cheaply is not presented to every man, and reluctance to let such a bargain pass was perhaps what helped to lend periodicity to the old man's attacks. Dr. Michel always held that this was his chief incentive, and be this as it might, it was very certain that apples and bargains were the only two things on earth for which Karshina was ever known to show a weakness, creditable or discreditable. Most small communities have their rich men and their mean men, but in the village of Leonard, the two were one. As the years passed on and Karshina's head whitened, it naturally grew to be a less and less easy task for Dr. Michel to bring his patient back to the place where he had been before apples ripened. If the situation had not tickled a spice of humor that lay under the physician's grim exterior, he would have refused these autumnal attentions. As it was, he confined himself to futile warnings and threats of non-attendance, but he always did obey the summons when it came. The townsfolk of Leonard would all have taken the same humorous view of this weakness of Karshina's, but for the trouble which it gave his too good sister Adelia, liked and pitied by every one. Adelia nursed her brother in each attack with a tenderness and anxiety that aggravated all the community. Nobody but his sister Adelia was ever anxious over Karshina. It was therefore like a bolt from a clear sky when in this chronicled autumn the following conversation took place at the Hubblestone's gate. Dr. Michel's buggy was wheeling out to the main road as Mr. Gowen, the town butcher, was about to drive through the gateway. "'Well, doctor,' called the genial man of blood, a broad grin on his round face, "'how's the patient?' "'He's gone, sir,' said Dr. Michel, drawing rein. The butcher drew up his horse sharply, his ruddy face changing so suddenly that the doctor laughed outright. "'Gone,' echoed Mr. Gowen. "'Not gone?' "'Yes, sir.' As I warned him, time and again he would go. The butcher shook his head and pursed his lips, the news slowly penetrating his mind. Well, I certainly would hate to die of eating apples, he said at last. I guess you'll find you hate to die of anything when the time comes, said the more experienced physician. Karshina, he added, got nothing he didn't bring on himself, if that's any comfort to him. Don't speak hard of the dead, doctor, he urged. We've all got to follow him some day. He wasn't a nice man in some ways, Karshina wasn't, but he was a nasty old man in most ways, snapped the doctor. Don't say such things now, doctor, don't, urged his companion. Ain't he paid in his full price, whatever his sins was? Poor soul. He can't be worse than dead. Oh, yes, he can. And for one, I believe he is, interrupted the doctor. His crisp white hair seemed to Mr. Gowen to curl tighter over his head as he frowned with some thought he was nursing. "'You haven't seen the will I had to witness this morning,' he burst out. "'Just you wait a little. Upon my soul, the more I think of it, the matter I get. It's out of my bailiwick. But if I were a lawyer, I'd walk right up now under those old apple trees yonder, and before that man was cold on his bed, I'd have his sister's promise to break his old will into a thousand splinters. Wait till you hear it. Good morning. When the will was read and its contents announced, the town of Leonard, including its butcher, took the doctor's view to a man. A brute said Dr. Michel hotly, who has let his old sister work her hands to the bone for him, and then turned her off like some old worn-out horse, has, in my opinion, no right to a will at all. How about setting this will aside, in his sister's interests, judge? A little convocation of the leading spirits of Leonard were met together in Dr. Michel's office to discuss the matter of Karshina's will, and what should be done with Adelia, cast on the charity of the village. Judge Bowles, when appealed to, raised his mild blue eyes and looked around the company. Adelia, he said, is the best sister I ever knew. Had the man no shame. Shame, said the town's barber, with a reminiscent chuckle. 
Why, he came into my parlors one day and asked me if I'd cut the back of his hair for twelve cents and let him cut the front himself. And I did it, for the joke of the thing. He saved thirteen cents that way. Gentlemen, gentlemen, demurred the judge, but amid the general laughter the tax-gatherer's voice rose. There isn't a tax he didn't fight. This town got nothing out of Karshina Hobblestone that he could help paying, and now he leaves us his relatives to support. Judge Bowles rose to his feet. Gentlemen, he said, in mild but earnest rebuke, the man is dead. We all know what his character was without these distressing particulars. It is entirely true that we owe him nothing, but a dead man is defenseless, and his will is his will and law is law. Did you ever think what a solemn title a man's last will is? It means just what it says, gentlemen, his last will, his last wish and power of disposition writ down on paper concerning his own property. It's a solemn thing to break that. A man's no business having such a will and a disposition to write it down on paper, said the doctor. What were the exact terms of the will, judge? Very simple, said Judge Bowles dryly. The whole estate is to be sold, and the entire proceeds, every cent realized, except what is kept back for repairs and care, is to be applied to the purchase of a suitable lot and the raising of a great monument over the mortal remains of Karshina Hubblestone. While his sister starves, added Dr. Michel. Gee! exclaimed the kindly butcher. He had heard all this before, but thus repeated, it seemed to strike him anew, as somehow it did all the rest of the company. They sat looking at each other in silence, with indrawings of the breath and compression of lips. There is this extenuating circumstance, said the doctor, with dangerous smoothness. Our lamented brother was aware that unless he erected a monument to himself, he might never enjoy one. We, the judge, Mr. Gowen, and myself, are made sole executors under the will, without pay. In Karshina's life, Adelia was his white slave. In his death, doubtless, he felt he could trust her to make no protest. I wish you could have seen her with him as I have, gentlemen. I shall call it a shame upon us if we let her eat the bitter bread of our charity. She's been put upon and trodden down, but she's still a proud woman in her way, and we've got to save her from a bitter old age. We've got to do it. It's the kind of thing that discourages one's belief in humanity, said the judge, in a lowered tone. This affair might be only absurd if it weren't for the sister's share in it. As it is, it's a revelation of human selfishness that makes one heart sick. Dr. Michel's laugh rang out irreverently. It's perfectly absurd, sister or no sister, he said. Nobody, not one of us, loved Karshina in life, though I think now we didn't hate him half enough. And here in death, he's fixed it so the town's got to pay for his responsibilities, while his money builds him a grand monument. I call that about as absurd as you'll get anywhere. I'll grant you it makes me downright sick at my stomach, judge, but it don't touch my heart. No, sir. Keep your organs separate, as I do, gentlemen. There's one thing certain. He drew the eyes of his audience with uplifted finger. If we can't outwit this will somehow, we'll be the laughing stock of this whole county. I don't care a snap of my finger if Karshina has a monument as high as Haymane's gallows, if only his sister is protected at the same time. Well... Short of breaking the will, what would you suggest, doctor? asked Judge Bowles, with a little stiffness. He had not liked the familiar discourse on his organs, but the doctor did not care. The judge was ruffled at last, which was exactly what he desired. Suggest, he cried, laughing. I don't know, but I know there never was a will written that couldn't be driven through with a coach and six if the right man sits on the box. You're the lawyer, judge. The judge was a lawyer, as he then and there proceeded to prove. He rose to his feet and spoke in his old-fashioned style. Gentlemen, I think I speak for this company when I say that we strongly object to the breaking of this will as a bad precedent in the community. We wish it carried out to the very letter. 
Our fellow townsmen knew his sister's needs better than we, and he chose to leave her needy. There are many, many things this town sorely wants, as he also knew, but he chose to use his money otherwise. What a monument to him it would have been had he built us the new schoolhouse our town requires. The wet south lot down by the old mill is an eyesore to the village had he used that land and drained it and set up a schoolhouse there, or indeed any public building, what a different meeting this would have been. He was our only man of wealth, and he leaves not so much as a town clock to thank him for. No, a monument to himself is what his will calls for, and a monument he shall have. If we failed him here, which of us would feel sure that our own wills would be carried out? In the confidence of these four walls we can say that the difficulties of the inscription and the style of monument seem insuperable. I know but one man to whom I would entrust this delicate commission. I feel confident that he would not render us too absurd by too conspicuous a monument or too florid an inscription. Need I name Dr. Michel? Out of my bailiwick, cried the doctor, way out of my bailiwick. But his voice was drowned in the confusion of the popular acclaim that was forming him into a committee of one. The kindly butcher made his way to the doctor's side under cover of the noise. "'Take it, doctor, now do take it,' he whispered in his ear. "'There ain't a man in the town that can shave this pig if you can't. I was saying just yesterday you're lost in this little place of ourn. You've got more sense than's often called for here. Here's the chance for you to show em what you can do. Do take it. The physician looked at the wheedling little butcher with a glance from his blue eye that was half kindly, half irritated. Well, I'll take it, he cried. I'll take it, and I thank you for your confidence, gentlemen. It was a full month before the little company met again in the doctor's office, but during that period they knew Dr. Michel had not been idle in the matter entrusted to his care. He was seen in close conversation with the town's first masons, the best carpenters, the local architect, and these worthies, under close and eager examination, gave answers that dashed the unspoken hopes of those who questioned. Here were bona fide bids asked for on so much masonry, so much carpentering, and the architect had been ordered to send in designs of monuments, how high he deemed it unprofessional to state. But arguing inversely, they judged by the length of his countenance that the measurements were not short. He had particularly hated Karshina. It was, for all these reasons, a rather anxious-looking company that met in Dr. Michel's office at his summons, and the doctor's own face was not reassuring as he opened the meeting. "'Well, gentlemen,' he said slowly, "'it's a thankless task you've given me, but such as it is I hope you will find I have performed it to your satisfaction. Here are various plans for the monument to be erected to our late fellow-citizen, and here is a plan of the ground that it has seemed to me most suitable to purchase.' It has been a task peculiarly uncongenial to me, because I, I suppose, know more than any of you here how this money is needed where it ought to have gone. I saw Adelia yesterday, and lonely and ghost-ridden, as that old house would be to any of us, it's a home to her that's to be sold over her head to build this. He laid his hand on the papers he had thrown down on the table before him. A little company looked silently at each other, with faces as downcast as if they were to blame. It was Judge Bowles who spoke first. Gentlemen, he said, we must not let ourselves feel too responsible in this matter. We are only following our plain duty. Show us the monument which you consider best, doctor. The doctor was silently turning over the papers. Family feeling is a queer thing, he said meditatively. I saw Adelia the other day, and I asked her if she wanted a neighbor to sleep in the house at night. There's nothing here for robbers to take, Dr. Michel, she said, and if it's ghosts you think I'm afraid of, I only wish from my heart ghosts would come back to visit me. Everybody of my blood is dead. It's very pitiful, said Judge Bowles slowly. 
The doctor turned on him instantly. Do you seem to feel now that you could countenance breaking the will, Judge? No, said the judge, shortly, as one who whistles to keep his courage up. The doctor's fingers drummed on the table as he paused thoughtfully. Karshina, he said, if you can believe me, measured out the kerosene oil he allowed for each week on Monday. And when it gave out, they went to bed at dusk, if it gave out on Friday night. But one thing Adelia did manage to do... So long as a drop of oil was in the measure, a light stood in a window that lit up the ugly turn in the county road round the corner of their house. I know her light saved me from a bad collision once. Some of you also, perhaps. She's kept that little lamp so clean it always shone like a jewel up there. The window pane it shone through had never a speck on it either. That's what I call public spirit, and it's public spirit, too, that makes her keep sweet-smelling flowers growing on the top of the old road wall. In summer, I always drive past there slowly to enjoy them. When she comes on the charity of the town, she may console herself by remembering these things. She did what she could, in spite of Karshina, and nobody can do more. Here are the plans for his monument, gentlemen. I would like to have your vote on them. The little company, as if glad to move, drew about the table as the doctor opened out the plans in a row. The butcher, whose ruddy face looked dim in his disappointment, and whose despondent chin hung down on his white shirt bosom, picked up one of the designs gingerly and examined it. "'Are they all alike, doctor?' he asked. Judge Bowles looked over Mr. Gowan's shoulder. Each design seems to be a hollow shaft of some kind, with a round opening at the top, he said, and looked inquiringly over his glasses at the doctor, who nodded assent. They are all hollow. You seem to get more for your money, so. The round opening at the top of the shaft can be filled with anything we choose later. I might suggest a crystal with the virtues of the deceased inscribed on it. Then if we keep a light burning behind the glass at night, those virtues will shine before us, by night and by day. Judge Bowles lifted his eyes quickly. The doctor's face was unpleasantly satiric, and his blue eyes looked out angrily from under his curling white hair. Judge Bowles sat down, leaning back heavily in his chair, his perplexed eyes still on Dr. Michel's frowning brow. Mr. Gowan, with a look as near anger as he could achieve, moved to a seat behind the stove. His idol was failing him utterly. He felt he himself could have done better than this. Dr. Michel's roving eyes glanced round the circle of dissatisfied and dismayed faces, and then, for the first time, he seemed to break from his indifference. This is all very well, gentlemen, very well indeed. The facts are, you gave me a commission, and bound me to fulfill it strictly and to the letter. And now you are dissatisfied because I have followed your wishes. What did you expect? If you had left the matter to me without restrictions, I should certainly have tried to break the will, as I told you. Briefly, here is my report. We shall have about $20,000, all told, to invest in a monument over our lamented brother. Any one of these hollow masonry structures here will cost about $10,000. As to the purchase of a suitable lot, which the will directs, I think even Karshina would declare it a good bargain to pay nothing whatever for the land, and that I can arrange, I believe. I have good reason to suppose, he began to speak very slowly, that the town would, without price, allow us to erect this monument on that unsightly bit of wet land to the south, near the old mill, if we, in turn, will agree to drain the grounds, keep them in good order, plant flowers and shrubbery, and further promise to keep a light burning all night in an opening at the top of the monument. I spoke of a crystal set in that opening, with the virtues of the deceased inscribed upon it, but we can, if we choose, carve those same virtues in the more imperishable stone below, and print something else, a clock face, perhaps, on the crystal above. That's a mere minor detail. 
Judge Bowles, whose gaze had been growing more and more bewildered, now started in his chair and sat suddenly upright. He stared at the doctor uncertainly. The doctor cast a quick look at him and went on rapidly. If you will allow me, I'll make my report quickly and leave it with you. I have a great deal to do this morning in other directions. It has occurred to me that as the base of the monument is to be square and hollow, it would be easy to fit it into a comfortable living room, with one or perhaps two small rooms built about it. I have not mentioned this to the architect, but I know it can be done. The will especially directs that repairs and care be allowed for. The doctor was talking rapidly now. The monument will not cost more than 10000 The clock about two. 12000 from 20000 leaves 8000 The yearly interest on 8000 and the fact that we could offer free residence in the monument should let us engage a reliable resident keeper who would give the time and attention that such a monument and such a park would need. The doctor paused and again looked about him. The whole circle of faces looked back at him curiously, some with a puzzled gaze, but several, including Judge Bowles, with a half-fascinated, half-dismayed air. Mr. Gowen alone preserved his look of utter hopelessness. "'Who'd take a job like that?' he said gloomily. "'I wouldn't, for one, live in a vault with Karshina, dead or alive.' "'Oh, the grave could be outside, and the monument as a kind of monster headstone,' said the doctor pleasantly. "'My idea was to have the grave well outside. Four or five hundred and a home isn't much to offer a man, gentlemen, but I happen to know a very respectable elderly woman who would, it seems to me, suit us exactly as well as a man. In fact, I think it would considerably add to the picturesque features of our little town park to have a resident female keeper. I think I see her now, sitting in the summer sunshine at the door of this unique headstone monument, or in winter independently luxuriating in its warm and hospitable shelter. I see her winding the clock, affectionately keeping the grave like a gorgeous flower bed, caring for the shrubbery, burnishing the clock lamp till it shines like a jewel as she well knows how to do, and best of all in her case, gentlemen, I happen to know from her own lips that she has no fear of ghosts. Why, gentlemen, what's the matter? I protest, gentlemen. At that moment, Mr. Gowan might be said to be the doctor's only audience. The rest of the company were engaged in whispering to each other, or speechlessly giving themselves over to suppressed and unholy glee. Judge Bowles was openly wiping his eyes and shaking in his chair. Dr. Michel looked around the circle with resentful surprise. "'You seem amused, gentlemen,' he said with dignity, and then addressing himself to Mr. Gowan exclusively, as if that gentleman alone were worthy to be his listener. "'Would you object to a woman as keeper, Mr. Gowan?' "'What's her name?' asked the butcher." A roar of laughter, not to be long suppressed, drowned his words. Mr. Gowan looked about the shaken circle, stared for a moment, then suddenly, as comprehension like a breaking dawn spread over his round face, he brought his hand down hard on his fat knee. "'Well, doctor,' he roared, in admiration too deep for laughter, "'if you ain't the doggornest. The doctor's wiry hair seemed to rise and spread as wings. His eyes snapped and twinkled. His mouth puckered. "'Will someone embody this in the form of a motion?' he asked gravely. The judge dried his eyes and with difficulty rose to his feet. "'Gentlemen,' he said, "'I move that we build this monument with a base large enough for a suite of rooms inside, "'that we set this structure on the lot which our good doctor has chosen, "'that we ornament it with an illuminated clock at the top, "'and further that, that this female keeper be appointed.' "'Seconded by Harry,' roared Mr. Gowan. "'The doctor, with his hands on his hips, his body thrown far back, "'looked with the eye of a conqueror over the assembly.' Those in favor of the motion will please say aye. Those opposed, no. It seems to be carried. It is carried, he recited in one rapid breath. Amen. 
endorsed Mr. Gowan fervently. And this warm approval of their butcher was in the end echoed as cordially by the most pious citizens of Leonard. After the first shock of their surprise was over, natural misgivings were lost in enjoyment of the grim humor of this very practical jest of their good doctors, that visitors now actually stop over a train to see. Many a village has its park, and many a one its illuminated clock. It was left for Leonard to have in its park a grave kept like a gorgeous flower-bed, and at the grave's head a towering monument that is at once a tombstone, an illuminated clock, and a residence. Who the next keeper may be, it is one of the amusements of Leonard to imagine the present keeper is a happy old woman, whose fellow citizens like nothing better than to see her winding the clock, caring for the flowers, burnishing the town lamp. In summer, sitting in the sunshine at the door of the headstone monument, in winter, luxuriating in that warm and independent shelter. "'I feel as if Karshina knew just what was best for me, after all, doctor,' she said to her physician, in his first call upon her in her new home, and that worthy, with a nod of his white head, assented in the readiest manner. "'Doubtless, madam, doubtless,' he said. "'Karshina had all this in mind when he made me his executor. Didn't you, Karshina?' He winked his eye genially at the grave as he passed out, and with no shade of uncertainty or repentance in his mind, climbed into his buggy and went on his satisfied way. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Doctor's Red Lamp This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Armstrong, by D. L. B. S. 1. Colvin Armstrong tried to take up his pen with an air of happiness and relief, for it was the last chapter of his great work which he was about to commence. But the effort failed, and he leaned back in his chair, thoroughly tired out, too jaded to be brisk or energetic. It was not his professional work that tired him. A London surgeon with a magnificent reputation, he had more than enough to do. But he was only forty, and his constitution was of iron. Work agreed with him. It was thought that utterly prostrated him at times. No sooner was his last engagement fulfilled, or his last patient dispatched, that he retired to his library and gave himself up to the great psychological problem that racked his brains. Night brought a short relief. He slept from twelve till six. But morning renewed his wrestlings and it was only the necessity of attending to his surgery that freed him from the incessant train of thought. Would that his head were as cool as his strong, firm hands. It was the mystery of human pain that was haunting him. Until two years back he had never given such questions a thought, but then the problem began to force itself upon him. How was it that so many suffered a living martyrdom, whilst he himself never knew a moment's pain? How was it that, having no personal knowledge of pain, he nevertheless felt such an overpowering sympathy with those who suffered, and had such an instinctive inborn gift of giving relief? And then the larger, less personal questions. Was there any guiding hand allotting pain to innocent mortals? Were they really innocent? If there was a design in it at all, from whom came the design, and what was its purpose? Was it for good, or evil, or both? If no providence guided humanity, what was the origin of pain? Why was it allowed to be? And so on, in an endless train of thought, one problem suggesting ten others, till the subject broadened out to the doors of eternity itself, 
and the mind reeled before its own imaginings. Armstrong flew to his books for assistance and primed himself with the ideas of the metaphysicians, but he was not satisfied, and a strong impulse led him to try his own hand at solving the mystery. Gradually, after much hard reading and thinking, he evolved a theory which, though far from satisfactory, seemed ampler and better than the ideas of the old philosophers, and then slowly and laboriously he committed it to paper. As the work grew, he became more convinced of the truth which seemed to lurk in his views, the foundation of real discovery on which these theses were based. Something of his marvelous insight into disease and distortion seemed to have entered into the book, and he was eager to give it to the world. So this was the last chapter. By Jove, how hot and close the room was! It was annoying to feel so dull and listless, but there was some excuse. Nine o'clock at night is not a time when a man is at his freshest, and there was nothing so wearing as this closely woven intellectual work, where every thread had to be followed to its end, every detail thought out, every possible ramification explored, and the mind kept at its highest tension throughout, straining to cover the whole ground and to order in logical sequence its myriad elusive thoughts. Difficult? Why, there was nothing to compare to it. But what was the good of magnifying troubles? Here was the final chapter, the conclusion which was to be so masterly, already mapped out in his mind, only waiting to be transferred to paper. Armstrong wiped his damp forehead and seized the pen. The room was lit as he liked it, with only a lamp casting a subdued light on his desk, the rest in deepest gloom. Now was the time to begin. But he was terribly tired. Crack! Armstrong leaned back in his chair and pressed his hand to his head. Something inside seemed to have broken with a snap, for a tiny shutter had fallen away, as in a camera, revealing a hidden lens in his brain. His head was clearer and freer, as if some clogging veil had suddenly been removed, and before his eyes there burned a new light, steady and cold, but brilliant. A cooler, purer air filled the room. The present melted away from his vision. Far away, so far that everything was dwarfed, but yet as distinct in every detail as though it had been close at hand, Armstrong saw a vision, a dark underground dungeon, with damp standing in beads on its bare stone walls, a man bound, gagged, and helpless, another black-masked and sullen of movement, a third seated on a small platform with his face in shadow. A feeble hanging lamp swaying to and fro in the draughts of the cell was the only illumination. The vision came nearer and nearer and grew larger as it came until it reached Armstrong and filled his room, and he felt the dank breath of the dungeon stir his hair. He looked again. The masked man was at his elbow. The man on the dais was above him, unrecognizable in the shadow, but smiling gently. That much he could see. Then he looked at the third man, the prisoner, and a thrill of dread went through him, for he recognized himself. In old world, long forgotten garb, but still himself. And then the whole grew real with a deadly reality. He was no more a mere spectator, but a part of the vision. And the vision was a part of his own existence. The chill of the room fell on his spirit, filling him with vague, horrible forebodings. The present mingled with the past, and his spirit passed into the limp, helpless figure on the rack. He, he himself and none other, 
was the victim in the torture chamber, and the world was black around him. There was a clank of steel on the floor, as though little instruments had been dropped, and then suddenly sharp pangs struck him from an unseen source. Another, another, and yet another, a very multitude of keen, stabbing pangs. In uncontrollable agony, he raised his voice to shout with pain, but the gag stopped him, choked him, throttled his curses, and the dark figure smiled from above. Then came hot, burning, throbbing pains that shot through him, turning the blood in his veins to fire and gnawing his vitals till they consumed away. He tried to turn, to roll, to ease himself in any way, but he was bound and rigid and helpless, and his efforts only increased the torture. And still the figure sat motionless above him. He turned his streaming eyes upwards in mute appeal, and his answer was a smile. Then the sharp pains and the burning misery ceased for a while, and his aching limbs rested, and all seemed over. But the presiding fiend waved a silent signal, and worse came, stretching, straining torture, that nearly pulled the wretched frame asunder, well if it had, and dull grinding agonies worse than the sharper pains, more cruel and relentless than the stabs or blows or thrusts. And then the worst of all, the whole in combination. Crushing, grinding, distorting, straining, breaking, bending, blinding, burning, flaying, racking, stabbing, more than the mind can picture or words can describe, in turn and together, and all the more horrible, coming unseen and sudden and unaware. Crush and rack and burn and grind, till the brain was on fire, and the body groaning under its burdens, till the face was furrowed with tears of agony, the whole frame shapeless and broken, limbs useless, muscles tortured, twisted and crushed, nerves shattered, and the spirit within flaming with miserable, hopeless hate. Madness? No, that had come in the first silent moments of fear and pain, but the cruel hand had driven it away, and now there was only pain, deep, unfathomable pain. Then came a low whisper, the cool breath of death waiting softly outside the chamber, and the wounded soul fluttered for a moment in joyous answer. But the human fiend above knew it, and the torture stopped. Sore, blistered, broken, and useless, he was flung aside to endure still longer in his misery, and death turned, sighing away. Armstrong sprang from his chair with curses on his tongue and fury in his heart, and grasped convulsively at the retreating vision, but it was far, far off and melting slowly into air. Then a great calm fell upon him, and he knew what he had seen. It was a scene from a former life, his last existence, and it was vouchsafed to him as a lesson, a glimpse of the everlasting order of life. The inspiration of a great message glowed on his brow and in his soul, and this was the message which he read, clear as the words of a seer. For inasmuch as thou hast suffered pain and bitterness of spirit in the past, so shall thou now know freedom from such, and to thee it shall be given by thy past sufferings to discern and make lighter the grievous burdens of thy fellow men. And the pain that thou hast felt in thine veins shall give thee understanding above all others, that thou mayst cure us man's infirmities and heal the sick of his house. 2. The light of a great revelation dazzled Armstrong for a while, 
but he rose from it with renewed strength and hope and courage, resolved to devote himself more than ever to the healing art. And first he destroyed his manuscript, for his theories were shattered and forgotten. The mystery of human pain was still unsolved. But was it for him to solve it? Providence had given him another mission, to heal and cure. And Providence had given him the clue to one mystery, at all events, his own great sympathy with sufferers and insight into suffering. Sometimes he wondered whether another revelation would follow, but none came, and he pursued his usual career, doing good and working hard. The idle speculations, the restless quest of secret things, which had haunted him and weird him before, were now of the past, and he lived for work alone. But more was to come, unexpectedly and without warning. It was an ordinary case he was treating, brain surgery. The man, a wretched creature, suffered severely and was in a broken state of health. Armstrong had traced it to brain pressure, and saw his way easily to put things right by cerebral operation. He was just concluding an examination, and the patient lay quietly in the great chair, soothed by a slight injection of morphia. Armstrong turned away to get a light. It was five o'clock in the autumn day, just beginning to grow dark, when suddenly there came that strange grating, crack, in his head and he felt the room whirl around him. He clutched hard at a table near him, but it receded from his grasp, and he felt himself falling down, down, down in giddy helplessness. Then the movement stopped, and he felt as before that some weight had been lifted from his brain, and a new, unused sense developed in him. But this time there was no clear light, no pure air, no vision. What was coming? Something, he felt, was in store, some strange new revelation, and he waited eagerly. As the prophets of old were inspired, so light had come to him, and now perhaps he would learn one more secret of the troubled world. But nothing came. All was blank darkness around him, and an uneasy sense of foreboding stole slowly over him, till his hand shook and his face grew damp with cold sweat. What was that, a far-off mocking laugh? And, oh, God in heaven, not that, again, not that. He tried to call again, for pangs worse than that of death were racking him. But something cold was thrust into his mouth and choked him, and then his eyes shut tight in the clenched agony of pain, opened again and he saw the streaming dungeon walls, the swaying lamp, the masked torturer, and the grim shadow figure seated motionless on the dais above him. And his heart sank within him, and he turned sick and faint. For one brief moment the masked man turned away, to heat his irons, perhaps, or rest his arms, weary of their heavy work. And all Armstrong's spirit went up in one short, agonized, burning prayer, in one deep, strenuous remonstrance. I have felt it before, he cried. I have endured it before. I know its meaning. Must I go through all again? Have I failed in my duty? Save me from pain and madness before it is too late. O oh, God of cruelty! Pain-giver, merciless, wicked, infernal, save me, save me, preserve me. His words, stifled by the gag, reached no human ear. But in the cell a new presence was lurking, and on his face fell a hot, quick breath. A voice spoke in his ear, very soft and gentle and low. You blaspheme in vain, it said. God has not sent you this vision, <laughs> but I. 3. The torture was over, and Armstrong waited quietly for the moment of restoration to the world. But it did not come, and a new fear seized him. 
what if he never recovered from this state as the powers of good had vouchsafed him the first vision so the powers of evil had mocked him with the second the same as the first but infinitely more terrible for through the former a subtle strength of will had sustained him and he had emerged from it wiser happier and stronger whilst now he felt himself deserted and unaided and heavens above what would come next the physical torture was over but now his mind was on the rack and it was worse far worse the two grim figures remained in the cell motionless as statues a strange detachment of mind a mystic duality of self was torturing armstrong here he felt the pangs and achings of the most terrible pain yet at the same time he knew that it was all unreal and his thoughts turned to the world above his work his house his friends the very patient in his chair waiting and wondering somewhere between the two lay madness and his spirit cried for peace a world all vision or a world all reality anything but this perplexing torturing union of the two quick as thought came the answer look around before you go it was the soft voice he had heard before gentle but insistent but he had seen too much of that hateful cell and closed his eyes in tight resistance look around said the voice even more gently than before a shuddering fear seized armstrong the spirit read his thoughts you are afraid you dare not look at me but you shall not see me look he put his hands to his head and covered his eyes with a convulsive movement listen said the voice you have not even seen your enemy would you not know him a cold sickness fell on armstrong's spirit and he shuddered why see the monster who had tortured him the human fiend who could be nothing other than repulsive then the voice spoke again more gently than before listen i am the god of evil but i befriend you i pass my hand along your frame and the pain leaves you i touch your eyes with my fingers and they open look around armstrong rose sound and strong the dungeon was dark but in its recesses he could see two cowering figures striving to hide themselves from his eyes one was the masked man one was the director the inquisitor the author of all his misery see how he hides from you whispered the voice but you shall not be denied turn the sudden thunder of that last word echoed through the vault and then there came a short sharp double flash of blinding light the first flash showed a crouching cowering figure in the background with pale set face and cruel eyes the second struck armstrong full in the face and felled him to the ground dazed and frightened as after a hideous nightmare he pulled himself together the match he had taken up was still in his hand and he turned back mastering himself with a great effort to his patient he lighted the big burner and turned it full on the chair the man roused from the lethargy of morphia slowly opened his eyes armstrong staggered back stifling the cry of horror that rose to his lips for in that one glance he saw clear and unmistakable the face of his torturer reincarnated but still the same four armstrong turned aside to hide his excitement after all then the vision had not been in vain 
it was the complement of the first and now all was clear the mystery of human pain his own great book on the subject he laughed out loud all that thought and time and labor had been wasted and here was the truth shown to him in a dream the truth that all the world should know a strange exaltation filled his spirit i suffered pain and now i reap my reward strong happy a healer of wounds myself knowing no suffering he inflicted pain and torture and now he suffers for it the patient in the chair moved uneasily and groaned armstrong went on a righteous judge rewards me for what I have undergone, and scourges him for the evil he has wrought. The Lord have mercy on his soul. It was a deep voice that spoke, the words booming and reverberating like the notes of heavy bells. It touched a new chord in Armstrong's mind, and sent the blood throbbing and pulsing through his head. The Lord have mercy on his soul. Why, what mercy had he had for others? And with that, the fury of hate returned to him and surged through his veins till he felt himself more demon than man. Every pang, every pain, every racking agony that he had suffered in those two terrible visions returned to him threefold, burned into his soul, branded on every limb and sinew. Curse him with the curse of the martyr, and blast him with the breath of his iniquities. And then a cold, unnatural calm fell upon Armstrong, and his quivering hands grew steady and cunning as before. It was all so easy. The man lay there, half conscious, with enough sensation left to feel every torture inflicted on him but yet unable to speak or groan. It was a carefully managed anesthetic, administered just sufficiently to glaze the eyes and paralyze the tongue, but no more, and the brain lay so near at hand. The mad fury of revenge had left Armstrong, and he was cold, scientific, and deliberate. No movement hurried, no torment left untried, and all done with the mechanical, even touch of a skilled workman. A pang for pang, a stab for stab, a scald for scald. Armstrong remembered each pain he had endured and paid it back threefold. On the subtle mechanism of the head, he played as on a keyed instrument, sending hot, shooting pains and dull numbing clutches to the remotest parts of the wretched frame all the poor worn nerves centered within his grasp and to his eyes they were visible throughout their hidden course coming to one common end where he grasped them as with a handle and turned and ground and twisted and crushed till they stretched strained groaned and quivered under his racking touch he hissed taunting words in his ears words that he knew could not be answered he mocked at the helpless agony and all the while he watched the blue lips striving to curse and moan but bound by the hellish drug as with a gag and the bloodshot straining eyes too fixed even to appeal and the dumb agony of the whole wretched form, and a grim, silent laughter shook him. But it could not last forever. His hand wearied and his head reeled. He fell to the ground in a swoon. Bells were ringing, light, airy, joyous bells, and he roused himself. The bells grew slower, fainter, died out altogether and in their place a voice was in his ears very soft and low what was it saying it was so faint so indistinct on your soul may the lord have mercy armstrong rose as from a dream 
in the chair lay a shape not mangled indeed but pale-faced shrunken distorted horrible he bent his head down and listened to the heart there were two feeble beats a faint flicker and then it stopped there was a strange catch in the surgeon's breath the room was hot and close he pushed the curtains back and looked out it was night now a deep blue sky studded with a myriad stars and one star shot upwards in a blaze of silver light armstrong turned away breathing heavily there was the body still and there were the little instruments he had used the present did not stir him gave him no thought but the knowledge of the future was upon him and he groaned aloud in the newborn agony of his soul for he knew what he had done. It was his chance, and he had missed it. It was his trial, his ordeal, and he had failed. And in the next life on earth, his torture would be longer and harder to bear. The Lord would have no mercy on his soul. End of section 15「Section sixteen of the Doctor's Red Lamp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by James Escarino. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Doctor Wygram's Son, Part One, by G. M. McCree. Doctor Wygram's Son. Chapter 1. When I met Dr. Clarence Wygram a few weeks ago, I had not seen him for nearly fifteen years. We were boys at school together, and fast friends at that time, but our intercourse since then has been very intermittent. Since he lost his wife in southern Italy many years ago, much of his life has been spent abroad, and though he is to be seen in London at intervals, I seldom catch a glimpse of him. We do not belong to the same set in town, and, as being possessed of an ample fortune, he is never engaged in practice as a physician. His wandering and unoccupied life is little akin to my own. We do, however, meet occasionally by accident, when we talk over old times, vow to see more of each other in the future, and then part for perhaps other ten years. Such acquaintanceships as this of Wygram and myself are the most unsatisfactory of all, they can scarcely be called friendships. Life, in my opinion, is too brief for such unfrequent greetings. It is important, however, that I recall for a moment this penultimate meeting with my old friend. It happened long ago, but the circumstances are still fresh in my memory. As I have said, this was our last meeting but one, and the date some fifteen years ago. I was about to travel to the north by the night mail, and accidentally stumbled against Dr. Wygram on the crowded platform at Euston. He is always pleased to be facetious when we do chance to see each other, in regard to our mutually altered appearance since our last meeting, and predicts in jocular fashion that ere long we shall certainly pass without recognition on either side. There is some truth in what he says, yet to judge by my friend's careworn and haggard appearance on this occasion, I should say he was aging somewhat faster than myself. It seemed that we were to be fellow travellers. He also was going north, though not so far as myself, and I willingly shared a compartment which he had already secured for himself and his son, a stripling youth, apparently about fourteen. The latter was returning to school after the Easter holidays, and his father, who, by the way, is not above the cockney weakness of calling every big school a college, was accompanying him on the journey. I remember that for the first hour or two we had enough of conversation to beguile the time. Wygram had, of course, been abroad. I forget where or for how long, but we were quite agreed. We always are on this point to view the simple fact of his absence as being a perfectly sufficient and satisfactory explanation of the time that has elapsed since our last meeting, however long that interval may be. 
After that, our conversation began to languish. Our old friendship notwithstanding, we have really very little in common. Having spent a somewhat fatiguing day, I felt disposed to doze, and I believe that I ultimately slept. When I awoke with a start, we were traveling at a high rate of speed. On the seat directly opposite to mine reclined my young traveling companion, apparently asleep the lamplight falling full upon his upturned face. He seemed to all appearance not very robust. I think his father had hinted as much to me on the platform before we started. The boy's sleep was a somewhat restless one, and he shifted his position uneasily, as ever and anon the oscillation of the carriage half aroused him. As only half awake myself, I sat drowsily watching him, I suddenly became aware that his father, who was looking over some papers by the aid of a reading lamp at the farther end of the compartment, seemed to wish, by a sign that he made, that I should join him. The thought struck me at the time that perhaps he desired some conversation with me while his son was not a listener. I accordingly shifted my traveling rugs and took a seat opposite to that of my old friend. The impression on my part that he did not wish the boy to overhear what he said was partly confirmed when my companion began the conversation in tones so low as to be barely audible above the rattle of the train. But I confess that I was somewhat unprepared for the substance of his communication, even when I did catch his meaning. At first what he said was almost unintelligible to me, but at length I contrived to gather, from what he told me, that some trouble, affliction, I think was the word he used, had lately overtaken him, and he seemed, though indirectly, to appeal to me for sympathy under his trial. The appeal, however, was entirely indirect, as no particulars were afforded, at least if they were, I failed to understand their meaning. Under these circumstances I was about to inquire, as delicately as I could, what the nature of his difficulty might be, when I chanced to notice that as he spoke his eyes would every now and then wander from looking in my face and turn, as it were unconsciously, in the direction of his boy, not apprehensively or as if he were afraid of him as a listener, but gently and tenderly, as if in deep solicitude on his account. This being the case, I forbore to press the father with questions which might be considered intrusive. The trouble to which he alluded was perhaps connected with the lad's future, perhaps with something else concerning him. Anyhow, the secret, whatever it was, seemed to lie in that, or in some equally delicate quarter, for Dr. Wygram did not give me any explicit details, rather avoided doing so, with a reticence quite unlike his customary frankness. But he had a favor to ask of me. It came to that in the end. "'You know,' he said appealingly, "'you are my oldest friend, almost my only friend now, for my wandering life does not gain me new ones, and I beg you most earnestly to aid me, to help me in this trouble here he paused as if about to make some disclosure, then, checking himself, to counsel me when I ask you at a future time. Of course my somewhat pardonable curiosity had no further excuse, but I murmured that I would be very glad if at any time I could be of service to him. I added that our old friendship justified such a claim on his part, and that for my own I would gladly meet it when necessary. I confess I thought that the reserve accompanying his request was somewhat singular. "'Ah, but promise, promise to me!' He repeated the word with such passionate emphasis as to startle me. "'Promise that if I write to you at any time and ask you to come to my help, you will do it, wherever I may be.' This last clause of his request was a tolerably comprehensive one as from the doctor's well-known migratory habits, the summons might possibly be indicted from Mongolia, or the farthest recesses of crime Tartary. But to pacify him, for I saw that my old friend was strangely perturbed, I said that I would do what he wished, at any time, if I could, which latter clause covered the aforesaid difficulty so far. He seemed relieved by my assurance. 
His manner grew calmer. "'I cannot tell you more just at present,' he said, this with a glance at the boy, "'except that I am in sore trouble, from which at another time, not now, the counsel of a friend may relieve me. It concerns one near and dear to me. Ah, then the secret did lie there, and you are the only one I could trust. Perhaps in time my trouble may be dissipated.' this with a hopeless, sickly smile, and then you will be glad I have not bored you with it. But if not, and if I seek fulfillment of your promise, remember. With which words he abruptly broke off the conversation. Shortly afterwards, my fellow travellers reached their destination. Dr. Wygram had, by this time, completely recovered his vivacity. When wishing me good-bye, a silent pressure of the hand, more prolonged than usual, alone betrayed any recollection on his part of our midnight conversation. I did not recover my own equanimity so rapidly. The interview came back upon me as I sat alone for the rest of the journey, somewhat too vividly for that. A nameless uneasiness possessed me. I wearied myself with possible explanations of Wygram's alleged troubles. Money difficulties were out of the question in the case of one so well off as he, so simple and unostentatious in his mode of life, and he would be the last man to gamble. His son, pooh, the birch was still the best cure for boyish peccadilloes, and he would get that on going back to school. Still, reason with myself as I might, Dr. Wygram's nameless trouble remained with me the boy's sleeping face in the lamplight, the father's urgent entreaty, remember. These did not pass away. After all, I would reproach myself for having promised to obey the summons of my friend whenever it might come. How awkward that might be! Why could not he, if so anxious for my counsel, arrange to come to me? Altogether, it was not until several days had elapsed that I shook off the disagreeable impression left by the journey. As for Dr. Wygram's possible summons, I looked for that, more or less confidently, for several months. Then my expectation of its coming began to fade. As a matter of fact, it did come, after all, but not for fifteen years. Then it came upon this wise— I had been from home for some days. On returning, a pile of letters awaited me. Sorting them over one by one, the last in the heap was addressed in an unmistakable handwriting. Wygram summons at last, I said to myself, as the mist of the years rolled away, and I was once more travelling northwards in the train. Once more my friend's voice in my ear, Remember! once more the lamplight on his son's sleeping face. Opening the letter, I read as follows. Low Tor Cottage, by Lascard, Cornwall, September 3, 1880. Dear F., remember promise given long ago. Pray come as soon as possible. Thine, Clarence Wygram. In the circumstances, what could I do but make arrangements as speedily as I could, to keep my promise. Within twenty-four hours I was on my way to Cornwall. CHAPTER Two. A gig awaited my arrival at the nearest railway station, and a short drive brought me to Low Tor Cottage. Dr. Wygram met me at the door. Considering the lapse of years since our last interview, I was, of course, prepared to find my friend looking much older but I was scarcely prepared to see him so utterly feeble-looking and broken, alike apparently with age and sorrow, as when he greeted me in the doorway. He bade me welcome in hurried, nervous tones. Evidently he labored under the influence of suppressed emotion. We entered the sitting-room. The dinner-table was set for two persons only. He apologized for his secluded quarters and the humble arrangements of his household. "'I have only been here for a month or two, he explained, since my return from the continent. A staid elderly maid-servant here entered the room. It was, of course, too early for any confidential talk between my host and myself. 
and as the servant waited upon us during dinner, anything but commonplaces were out of the question. I judged from what I saw, however, that Dr. Wygram was living alone. Perhaps it was better so. Our intercourse would be the more unrestrained. Somehow, I do not know how it happened, I was the first to break the ice, upon the question of the object of my visit, and this prematurely, in fact within half an hour of my arrival. Now, I had mentally cautioned myself on the way down against precipitate allusions to the purpose of my coming, yet, as it chanced, I stumbled upon the delicate topic unawares before the servant had left us to our wine. It was, then, on his son's account that Dr. Wygram sought my presence here, as much I gathered from his silence, sudden and pained, when I made the remark. Of course, after this, and until we were alone together, I turned the conversation into other channels, in what I fear must have seemed a very clumsy fashion. My host grew more and more absent and distrait. When at length we drew our chairs near the fire, for the autumn evenings were growing chilly, he had not opened his lips for some minutes. I was quite unprepared for what was to come. No sooner were we alone than, in his attempt to speak, he burst into tears. It was long before he regained his composure. At first all he could utter was a renewal of his thanks to me for coming to see him in his loneliness, his worse-than-lonely life, as he termed it. I could make nothing of all this, but I endeavored to assure him of my earnest desire to help him, if only he would frankly confide in me as his friend. It was pitiful to see how, even after this invitation, it pained him to make any avowal. He sank into a reverie for a few moments, then, quickly rising to his feet and laying a hand on my shoulder, said, I will show you my sorrow, my friend, rather than speak of it myself. What I show you will speak for itself, for all words are vain. So saying, he motioned me to follow him, and led the way from the room, carrying with him a small shaded lamp. When we entered an adjoining apartment, the shadows there were so dense, and the light we had with us was so feeble, that for some moments I could discern nothing. A dull fire smoldered in the grate, but shed no light on the interior of the room, which seemed furnished as a small parlor. There was a large sofa at the farther end, and someone lay upon it covered with rugs. Dr. Wygram held the light a little lower. The rays fell upon an upturned face, that of a boy apparently asleep. I started, for was it not the self-same face upon which the flickering light of a railway carriage lamp had fallen so many years before? The very same, in every lineament. Nothing was changed. I am not naturally quick in coming to a conclusion. Things dawn upon me now even more slowly than of old. I was startled for the moment, nothing more, though a creeping horror moved already towards my heart. I had not felt its actual touch. That is my sorrow, said the father, turning to me, without diverting the rays of the lamp from his son's face then, without another word, motioned me to follow him out. I did so. The shadows fell once more upon the sleeper, even as the shadows of the years had fallen till that moment upon my recollection of his features. On a sudden the full significance of what I had seen rushed upon me. "'Great God!' I cried. "'What is this, Wygram? Speak!' We were in the corridor now, and he did not return an answer. We re-entered the lighted room. My patience gave way. For heaven's sake, I said, Wygram, tell me, what is the meaning of this? How is your son, the boy sleeping yonder, the same, unchanged? The query died upon my lips, for he to whom I spoke was pale as ashes. I read the answer of my inarticulate question there and then in his face. By virtue of some nightmare spell, the boy I had seen so many years before, the boy, who by this time should have been a grown man, was slumbering, still a boy, 
in the room we had just quitted. They say that when, in dreams, anything manifestly absurd or inconsistent presents itself, the dreamer at once awakes. In the sitting-room of the cottage that night, seated beside my old friend, how often did I think myself dreaming, and long for the moment of waking to be precipitated by the seeming contradiction I had just witnessed. For some time neither of us spoke. Dr. Wygram sat motionless with the blank and, as it were, featureless expression on his countenance which I have so often seen sudden calamity impart. Yet his affliction, new and inexplicable to me as yet, must have become familiar enough to himself. After all, it must have been its first, its only revelation to another, which, as it were, reawakened himself to a sense of its utter bewilderment and hopelessness. And to me, of all men, he had turned for help, for counsel, in circumstances so astounding. What could I do? My own brain was in a whirl. The sense of wonderment once passed, a painful search for possible explanation succeeded. Explanation of what? That was the puzzling difficulty. A problem was before me, but from lack of all precedent, the conditions of effectual presentation were wanting. How, then, attempt the solution? It must have arisen, I suppose, from the mental confusion under which I laboured, that I can give no very lucid account of what immediately followed. I cannot tell at what period of the evening the silent current of our several thoughts flowed into a stream of conversation. But I reproduce here the substance of Dr. Wygram's narrative, in his own words, as far as possible, omitting some details not germane to the narrative. My son, commenced Dr. Wygram, inherited his mother's malady, that which in her case proved fatal, pulmonary consumption. The unmistakable symptoms developed themselves in him at an early age. All the so-called remedies had been tried without avail. Humanly speaking, my boy was doomed. My house was apparently to be left unto me desolate. At first I was in despair, a despair lightened to me at last, however, by a gleam of hope. You are aware that I have devoted my life to the study rather than the practice of medicine. Being untrammeled with regular avocations, I have been enabled to explore, more fully than many of my professional brethren, what may be called the bypaths of study, those less explored tracks which are open to the medical scientist who is, by training, a chemist as well. The practice of scientific medicine, among us in this country, at all events is in its infancy, although many, whose interest is to conceal the fact, will assure you to the contrary. If any proof were needed of my assertion, the lame and halting methods in use at the present day would suffice the insufferable greed for money, so shamelessly manifested, renders the modern practitioner only a better-class charlatan. Their failures are so gross, their expedients to conceal these failures so unblushing, that I have long recommended an adoption by the public of the Chinese system. The far-seen celestials only pay their medical adviser when they are perfectly well. When they fall sick, his pay stops till he can restore them to health. But there is a second and a higher path, known only to a few, and these enthusiasts, careless of the rewards of the crowd. It is but a dim and perilous way, at the best. It is easier to deride those who attempt to traverse it than to follow them. The herd of the profession eschew it for the most part. Present-day materialists will have nothing, except nothing, which cannot be seen, tasted, handled, brayed in a mortar, fitting fate for themselves as purblind fools. See how reluctantly, how incredulously, the results of even such a coarsely unmistakable remedy as electricity are received by the profession. Yet electrical energy in medicine is a clumsy weapon compared with others in the armory of transcendentalism. 
there are blades infinitely keener for the expert, viewless brands wielded by few, the peerless Excalibur itself, known to still fewer, for its point of a truth turneth every way to guard the path to the tree of life. Here he shuddered, but after a pause went on. These higher methods have their risks, their inseparable dangers. Remember that experiment must at last be made upon the living human subject. Demonstration upon a score of tortured puppies will not avail. Is it a wonder that the crude experimentalist, great at the torture trough, and brave in its cruelties, recoils when the higher issue is at stake? But, as I said, my boy was doomed, save, as I hoped, in the last resort of transcendentalism. That last resort I tried, but not until numberless trials in the laboratory had convinced me that my method must avail. I had discounted every possibility of failure. So long did I delay that the lamp of life had almost with him burned to the socket. But I was wary. I knew well that the step I was about to take was an irrevocable one, and my chief anxiety was to prevent a possible miscarriage of consequences. My plan, in short, promised to secure for one, already within sight of death's portal, a lease of life prolonged. By how many months or years I could not tell, that question lay in darkness but at least prolonged beyond what I could reasonably expect considering his condition. A growth of new vital force, which yet was not a growth, everything pointed the other way. Let me say a stock was to be grafted into the decaying and wasting organism, permanent in its character, constant, without flux or reflux. But, ah, that but which mars all that blooms and hopes, like all gifts added from without, unlike all properties resident within, it, the gift, had an imperfection, a strange, deadly, and irremediable fault. It grew not, progressed not, aged not, do not start, and this, its thrice-accursed property, was so malignantly, so devilishly potent, beyond hope of elimination or reduction, that it subdued unto itself whatsoever it touched or joined. Life preserved under its influence would be preserved, not in activity, but as it were in arrestment, in default of needed repair, or rather with a subtle supply and repair of its own so elusive as to evade detection. Thus, continued Dr. Wygram, thus with all my caution, I erred, erred as all do, misled by some devil's wile who work against the gods. Fool that I was, my own caution deceived me, and that lying legend of him who sought for immortality but forgot the advent of old age. But it is past now. Others would have slipped on that insuperable threshold where I fell, I exulted in the thought that my boy would drink of the water of life and so defy the killing years. But I forgot that he was not yet a man, knew not that I was condemning him to a life of immaturity. Hurry misled me at the last. Before I knew it, he was almost gone. Then I took the irrevocable step. It was well that I worked in secret. No eye but mine saw him as... Oh, wondrous change! He rose from his sick-bed with an assured gift of life in every limb and pulse, so sudden and startling that I dreaded the coming of life's angel almost as much as I had the advent of him of death. For a time, I say, I would almost unknowing have undone that which had been done. But that stage passed and I only watched and waited. Dr. Wygram paused. Was it fancy that as he did so, I thought I heard a light footstep in the room above us? The speaker did not seem to notice it, but went on. For a time I knew no fear, 
that I had erred I did not know as yet. For months he advanced in growth towards manhood. Then the spell began to work its hellish will. As he was then, as he is now, so will he ever be. A blight fell upon him. A chill mildew rained itself upon the issues of his life. A true death in life is his, for life hasteth to fruition and then falls. But this existence, with which I have dowered him, continues changeless, dateless, ageless, as the years of the everlasting. I tell thee, screamed the father, as he sprang to his feet in a frenzy of uncontrollable horror, I tell thee my boy will never die. Overmastered by the contagion of his excitement, I too had risen from my seat. As we faced each other in silence, a breathing murmur rose on the air, formless at first, then died away. Again a hushed murmur, then a crash of chords from an instrument in the room above. He of whom we spoke was plain Chopin's Marche Funèbre. End of section 16《Section 17 of The Doctor's Red Lamp》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by James Escarino. The Doctor's Red Lamp, compiled by Charles Wells Moulton. Dr. Wygram's Son, Part 2, by G. M. McCree. Chapter 3 I need not enter into the details of my stay at Lotor Cottage, even if I were able to reproduce them with correctness. My residence there was, to me, a prolonged nightmare, with all hope of an awakening denied me. Dr. Wygram had so completely surrendered himself to despair as to be incapable of making any effort. It would have been a positive relief to myself had I been able to have considered him insane, and the mystery before me a delusion springing from that cause. But that conclusion was shut out most effectually by my own personal testimony, of which he always eagerly availed himself, as to his son's identity and his practically unaltered condition after an interval of so many years. I had every opportunity of assuring myself on this point, Young Wygram, though shy and backward, preferring to mope in solitude, was our companion after a day or two. But he never seemed wholly at ease, would not join in any sustained conversation, and had an apathetic listlessness about him which was positively repellent. It was vain to try to arouse either father or son from the overwhelming depression into which both had apparently sunk. Some melancholy drives we took together in a pony phaeton through the solitudes of West Cornwall did not enliven us much. It is a haunted land at its best, with its rolling moorlands and its mystic dosmery pool, fabled as ebbing and flowing in its silent depths in sympathy with the tides of the distant sea. As day after day slipped away, I began to feel myself as partaking of my friend's hopelessness. Yet if I hinted the uselessness of continuing with him, he would become almost frantic. As he pathetically repeated to me, I was his only friend, the only one to whom he could confide his sorrows, so unsupportable when born alone. Gradually he persuaded me, on one point, against my better judgment. It was finally agreed between us that, ere I left, some step should be taken on his part to endeavor to obtain a reversal, or part reversal, rather, of the conditions under which his son labored. I use the periphrasis, as the plain words to me are unspeakably painful, by something of the same methods by which they had been compassed. The prospect to me was very distasteful, indeed revolting, nor did Dr. Wygram's labored explanations convey much information to my non-professional mind. It is useless to detail them here, they would be intelligible only to the expert. But I could not deny him what he asked. I fancy his wish was to secure some witness of his own moral innocency, should any untoward accident happen. 
I cannot blame him. Indeed, I think he would have been justified in taking almost any steps, short of taking his son's life, in the unparalleled circumstances of the case. And the time was short. That was another perplexity. The constant state of nervous apprehension which overcame Dr. Wygram whenever his residence in one place lasted any time pointed of itself to the necessity of making haste. Perhaps he magnified this difficulty, I cannot say, but there was something about their retired life which seemed likely to invite gossiping curiosity, in a country district more especially. That the neighbors had already questioned him as to the nature of his son's delicacy, he assured me over and over again. What could they mean? He has been watched, the father would say excitedly. We have already been here too long. They notice his unaltered appearance since our arrival. A growing lad, such as he appears, would have made some progress in the time, and they notice that he does not, nor ever will, he would add bitterly, unless my last efforts should prove successful. It was idle to try to reason him out of these fears, for all I knew they might be real. It was pitiful to think how long they had possessed him during many weary years. When I had met himself and his son fifteen years before, they were even then travelling as fugitives from place to place to avoid detection. Still more harrowing to think that in the father's case, from his rapidly aging look and growing feebleness, these wanderings must soon cease. Of his son's fate, in that overwhelming contingency, I could never trust myself to think. The thought of it often overcame Dr. Wygram himself. He told me once that on one occasion, when abroad, the terror of this self-same prospect so unmanned him that he had attempted to confide in a brother practitioner, an Englishman, resident, I think, in Milan. Like most countrymen of his craft abroad, said my poor friend bitterly, he proved to be utterly incredulous. I might have known it before exposing myself to his coarse ridicule. The line of my studies has been so utterly outside the old groove of pill and bolus, lancet and catheter, it is little wonder that the crowd will have none of its results. This professional brother only laughed in my face, rubbed his hands in glee, as at a good joke asking me if I would not part with my recipe for a consideration, seeing he had some half-dozen youngsters of his own whose growing powers added to the tailor's bill. English medical men are proverbially obtuse, but for the full development of their sheer obstinacy and mulishness, they should be transplanted to the soil which gave birth to transcendentalism. It was a breathless autumn evening when, in my presence, Dr. Wygram commenced his second experiment with his son. The dim scent of the shrubberies stole in through the open windows, over which the blinds were drawn. On a couch in the center of the room lay young Wygram in a deep slumber, superinduced by an opiate which his father had administered, to aid the further stages of the treatment. A brass chafing dish lay upon the floor, containing some smouldering embers. From a tripod upon the table hung a small retort of crimson glass, which glowed like a ruddy gem in the flickering light of the spirit lamp underneath. With arms stripped bare to the elbows, Dr. Wygram bent over his son, watching the depth of unconsciousness in which the latter was immersed. For nearly an hour my friend had not spoken a word. I did not wish to interrupt him, but I saw by his manner at length that the critical moment had arrived. He turned to me at last, and in a broken whisper told me that a few moments longer would decide his success or failure. "'We shall now, I trust,' he said, "'have insight granted us in regard to a hitherto hidden mystery.' I do not know whether he ever obtained the insight in question, but I know that it was never granted to me." for at that moment loud voices were heard in the corridor. The door was unceremoniously thrown open, and three men entered the room. Their leader, a puffy, red-faced individual, fixed me with his glittering eye from the moment of his coming into the room. "'That is the man,' he said to his subordinates, pointing at the same time to me as I stood irresolute. 
A sudden panic possessed me that instant. To escape by the door was impossible, as the men stood beside it, but the window behind me was handy. I turned, lifted the blind, and precipitately jumped into the garden a few feet below. I do not believe that I ever ran so fast in my life as I did on that occasion through the mazes of the shrubbery. My one frantic desire was to get away at all hazards from that dreadful dwelling, though from what I fled I could not have told. I only knew that horror, the accumulated horror, of the past weeks compressed into the moment possessed me to my very heels. A wretched dog prowling about the garden gave chase to me as I fled, under the impression that I was making off with some portable property belonging to the establishment. But I soon left him far behind, and I do not think that the men joined in the pursuit beyond the limits of the cottage, if indeed they followed me at all. In my terror I never looked behind, but ran through fields, hedges, and ditches, till I arrived, breathless and hatless, at the nearest railway station. The officials seemed somewhat surprised at the appearance I presented, but I got a ticket without question, and was soon seated in a railway carriage on my way to London. These memoranda, written after a long period of nervous prostration, must be published, if for my own exculpation alone. Shortly after their committal to paper, a longing curiosity impelled me to inquire as to the fate of my old friend. I had promised not to desert him, and that promise I had scarcely kept. At all hazards, then, I resolved to go to Cornwall once more, even if by doing so I should fall into the hands of the authorities, as I doubted not he had done. At all events, my own innocency was beyond question. On the Paddington platform, my apprehensions in this latter respect were redoubled. A young man, standing beside me, when I was taking out my ticket, certainly eyed me very narrowly. "'One of the minions of the law,' I said to myself. "'The affair has got wind after all.' As I was about to take my seat, he came forward, and asked if he had the pleasure of addressing Mr. F. of Blank Street. Resolved to brazen it out to the last, I admitted my identity. "'You are acquainted with Dr. Wygram, I think,' he continued interrogatively. "'I own that I was. Denial at this stage would have been useless.' "'I am his son,' he said smilingly. "'His son!' I gasped. "'Then, after all, Dr. Wygram's second experiment had succeeded, "'and he who was before me had been freed from the spell of his youth. "'Yes, there was no doubt of it. He was now a man.' "'Is it possible?' I repeated, gazing at him with astonishment. "'I think there is no doubt of it,' he replied coolly. "'You will be sorry to learn that my father is far from well,' he resumed. "'I have been from home for a long time, but I am just going down to see him in Cornwall.' "'Just going down to see him?' This was mystery upon mystery. "'My dear sir,' I said in despair, "'I am very sorry indeed to hear of your father's illness, "'but would you kindly answer me one question as distinctly as you can? "'If you are Dr. Wygram's son,' "'How is it that you do not remember me?' "'I do now most distinctly,' he replied. "'I remember travelling with you and my father many years ago, "'when I was going to school in the north. "'Heavens! Then all the years since then had been a blank to him. "'Have you no recollection,' I suggested, "'of having been with your father since then, a short time ago, in Cornwall?' "'Ah, that is my brother,' he quickly returned. "'Yes, he was with my father when he took ill.' been with him too long, in fact, for the good of either. My father, I am sorry to say, has for some time been quite unhinged mentally. I should think he has, was my inward comment, for I saw it all in a moment. There were two young Wygrams. Both of these I had seen when they were youngsters of the same age. Why had I not thought of this before? Is it not my special weakness that things dawn upon me very slowly? The rest, of course, was Dr. Wygram's delusion, ultimately necessitating his being placed under the care of his friends. "'My dear sir,' I replied, after a pause, and with some effusion of manner, "'I sincerely trust that your father's distressing illness may be but temporary. 
on his being able to receive the message, kindly present him with my warmest regards. Meanwhile, one question more before we part, for I am not going by this train. I... I have changed my mind. How many years, may I ask, may there be between your own age and that of your brother? About fourteen or fifteen, was the reply. Quite so. And when you were youngsters of about the same age, say, were you not considered very like one another? Remarkably so, he answered, laughingly, as like as two peas. G. M. McCree End of section 17